In this video, I want to go over the entire renovation process of a full bathroom uh, renovation. This bathroom in particular was where I, all st I started out with all construction. I bought this home when I was 21 years old. I had just started my own contracting business, unrelated to bathrooms. I actually was doing power washing and simple exterior finishes. I didn't get into the complications that it takes to actually do a bathroom too many, many, many years later. This is where it all started. This is where it all started with home ownership. It forced me to learn how to go about doing things, wiring, plumbing, roofing, siding, you name it. And this bathroom in particular, I've always despised. I never liked the, out, the layout of it. Um, this was built in 1910, so the home is really old. And a lot of the features that we have today, they didn't have back then. Most likely back in 1910, they just had a clawfoot tub with no shower head, just a tub, and that's all they had. Uh, so they had a window here, and we'll get into this. You'll see how there's an existing window back here that I, re I put back into place. But when I first bought the place, I didn't know what to do. So I just covered over the window and I got rid of it. But it made the outside of the house look terrible. And this is, it made it a really dark space. You can also see I have a lot of mold issues in this space. A lot of that has to do with my ventilation fan not working very well, but having a window would definitely help that out. You can air out the bathroom more often. Um, so uh, really what we're gonna do here, we're gonna completely change the layout and I wanna basically move all of my fixtures into a more uh, traditional fashion that's gonna make a lot more sense. We're gonna put the tub on the back wall and we're gonna open up this space for the window, so it's gonna look really great. So follow along, use the tabs below, use the YouTube resources or the, the video that you're watching. Speed it up if you wanna to get to something else. I also have timestamps in here as well. So this is gonna be a long form video and I'm gonna go through the entire process. So first step, always shut off the water to your to the bathroom. You don't want to be puncturing any water lines as you're demoing all this stuff out. Um, it's also not a bad idea to be able to know exactly where your outlets and everything are connected, just in case you get into the electrical. Um, typically, when you're doing the demo process, that's not super important, but it's still a good idea to know what your breakers are and, and where they are. In this particular situation, I've already disconnected everything because You'll see I had knob and tube wiring in this old bathroom and, and basically all the lighting circuits. So I have a temporary light up right now that I ran prior to doing this, mainly for the filming process. Um, but yeah, know where your electrical is, turn off the, the water. And normally where I like to start is just get some of this stuff out of my way so that I have some room for my tools and get anything out of there. So we're gonna go ahead and disconnect the toilet, which is usually a fairly simple process. This is somewhat of a newer tour that I installed a couple years ago. And I actually had a leak on why I, uh, it shouldn't be a problem, but you might want a grinder to cut off old rusty bolts. But in this particular situation, this is like a newer, newer piece, so not a big deal. prevent that uh, gases from coming up. Okay, so vanity, pretty simple. Just disconnect your trap. Now we're gonna be replacing all of this drain piping, so I'm really not concerned about anything that's existing, especially in the water lines because I'll be cutting those off and replacing them. So so I could already see one issue already is we don't have a vent for the the vanity. So that's probably why it was so slow draining. Uh, you always need some kind of air coming into it. Uh, 
Um, that was an illegal fitting the way I had that with the uh, S-trap for a vanity. Definitely not the way to go. Without air, you're not gonna allow the water to seep out easily. All right, so most of the time, tops are just siliconed on. So remove that. I just want to show you one thing. If you ever see this, this is definitely not something that you want to see an S trap for your vanity sink. It, 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 there's no vent at whatsoever on this. So if you have a slow draining vanity sink, it's because they put an S trap on there. This is nowhere close to being right. Okay, so we're gonna get rid of this tub surround. This is actually somewhat new and I mean, not new. I mean, it's probably less than 10 years old that I did this. Again, not very proud of the work that I did here. Um, this was, you know, one of the things about rentals is that you just, you're constantly never wanting to do anything to them. Once they're rented out, that's great. But, but even somebody like myself who can do everything on the project or on the house, I just never come over here to maintenance the house when it's rented out. Uh, it's just, you know, it's problematic trying to get the tenants um, to, to organize with them and then if they're living here, it's just I find it to be stressful So most of the time when somebody moves out, I just do a quick renovation So it looks new and clean and move somebody in there um, But I did this tub surround and I'm pretty sure I used the newer products I think I used the weedy tub surround kit back there But one of the things I'm really disappointed with is the grout I used um, this stuff called quartz lock. It's a pre-mixed grout and it didn't hold up very well. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that no one cleaned this bathroom. I, I doubt that anybody even cleaned this in the seven years that they were living here or how many, I can't remember how many years. But um, regardless, this is supposed to be a stain resistant grout that doesn't get stained. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, it's just turned into mold. I mean, you could probably maybe get a steam cleaning service to get it out of there. But right at this point, like if I were to try to salvage this, I'd be just regrouting the shower. I'd be scraping this all out and regrouting it because I don't think you'll ever get this back to a nice clean look. The other problem with this bathroom is just the fact that the humidity levels in here were just out, out of control. The vent fan didn't work very well. So a lot of these mold issues are all just from that. When I took a shower, nothing ever dried. So anyways, we're gonna get rid of this. I've never actually torn out newer backer board. I've never torn out uh, any foam backer boards. So we'll see how difficult that really is to remove. So, all right, so first thing we need to do is just remove this cover. And again, I'm replacing all the plumbing. So I really don't, I really don't care but necessarily what happens to this, just as long as I can get it apart. And I might even use a sawzall. All right, and then this was kind of one of my ideas to be able to keep this nice and open in this bathroom. Um, because if I put a wall here, there used to be an existing wall here, as you can see, and uh, that was that really enclosed the toilet space. That was a real problem. One thing I want to mention is that if you ever have a toilet space, you really need about 48 inches of space from the back of the toilet to the front. And even then it still feels really crammed. But having a wall right here in front of you really made this uncomfortable. The other thing that was an issue is that my toilet <laughs> was 11 and a half inches away from the wall. So when you sat on this thing, you're kind of crammed in there. Um, but anyways, this I thought was a decent idea, just putting a piece of glass and having a top rail on it. This is basically just a regular shower rod uh, with an anchor on this. So this kind of, it worked out well. I think it worked out well. But again, this layout really stinks and I really just want to get rid of it. All right, so I'll probably silicone the hell out of this. Let's see if we can pull this out of here. Oh, 
There we go. Donald Bieber using this. These things are horrible, by the way. They always leak. Nothing ever shuts off on them. I do not advise this. I mean, these things work for maybe the month that you first buy it, but then afterwards they always leak. So if you want to get something that has a separate diverter on it. But what we're going to do, again, everything's coming down. I'm just going to sawz all of this out, start pulling this wall apart. I don't know how, yeah, it looks like I did a decent job on putting that wall together. So, um, but at least try to get this back wall moving here first. That's kind of nice. It's definitely going to make this a lot brighter in here. <laughs> Boy, I really put this wall together. See the weedy board I have on there, the waterproof backer board. There we go. I guess that's the way it'll come off. Most of these foam backer boards, you got to just take it off towel by towel because it all bonded so well to that. So I guess these newer boards are not going to be a difficult thing to remove someday. I mean, it just breaks in half there. It's kind of nice, actually. Much easier than Hardy backer. We can go ahead and reuse that. That nice little paper. It's a pretty nice little paper. Please remove the drain assembly. This is an old cheapy. It's already rusting on the inside too. Yeah. Last of 20 years. Just you can't complain about that.
just a little bit of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of layers. That's a lot of crap. Wow. Hell, I gotta get this stuff out of here now. And then the next part is the ceiling, but I don't know if we'll get to that today or not. Let's see how long this takes to get rid of all this stuff. All right, so that's the end of day one. Still got the ceiling, we still got the floor. Definitely pace yourself with this. This was a mess, as you could tell, there was three or four layers to this whole thing and the plaster and lath, along with the blown insulation, definitely doesn't make it any fun. Um, so tomorrow, we'll do continue the demo so that we can see everything that we need to do and start with that plumbing and electric. All right, ceiling removal. Absolutely nothing fun about it. Uh, you know, it really is painful, especially these older homes. Most of the time there's blown in insulation above there. And if you have a ceiling like this, you had multiple layers. Somebody already put some drywall up over top of that plaster. Could have been me, I'm not sure. It's been a long time ago. Um, but yeah, basically just pulling this down, cleaning up the mess and getting it out of here. Okay, so electrical is a mess, as we've already kind of established. Um, my vent fan, all this existing wiring, take a look at this. This is all connected to old knob and tube wiring. So when you see old wiring like this, separate wires that are kind of covered in cloth, that's all knob and tube. So this is all dead because I removed it from the rest of the house that was connected to this. So now we just got to remove this old BX cable and just disconnect all this stuff. But that's really a bad sign when you see uh, all of that connected like that. You don't wanna leave anything like that. You wanna run new lines up for your bathroom. Okay, so for flooring, one of the best things you can have is like a 42 inch bar like this. Um, we're gonna try to pull up some of the tile first and then we're gonna rip up all the uh, flooring underneath of that. We really wanna expose all of the uh, joists so that we can get to our plumbing efficiently. So this is old, this is basically Noble liner. This is a uh, anti-fracture membrane. So I had, I guess I did that. I don't remember when I did that. But, so, you know, basically just piece by piece, just trying to scrape this up. Um, you know, I actually, I might end up just cutting my plywood underneath the here and trying to just pull a whole sheet up as well. That might be easier.
Okay, so now we can really see what's going on here, what we need to do. Um, we're gonna get rid of all this copper. That was kind of the get-go. We definitely didn't want to use that. These are old gas lines that used to be for gas lighting. Obviously don't need that anymore. We're gonna get rid of that. But one thing I did notice is that these joists are pretty well hacked. Um, basically for where the piping went to my vanity. And then for some reason right next to this toilet flange, I don't know exactly what went on there, but uh, you got basically half of it notched out. So there's only half of the joist left. These are only two by eights. Um, I don't feel comfortable with that. I'm gonna probably want a sister on this joist and probably this joist as well because it looks pretty well hacked over here. Um, everything else doesn't look too, too bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you might be overwhelmed by getting this far into demoing your bathroom, but it's gonna make it a lot easier, I'm telling you. You can make sure that things are level. You can make sure your plumbing, you know, it's gonna be a lot easier to route all this plumbing and you'll be able to, you know, quickly put everything back together. If you're trying to go over existing floors, patching things, it ends up just taking you a lot longer. And so you're just always better off just to start with a new foundation and everything will go a lot smoother. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and remove our, all our plumbing going up into the second floor here. So as you can see, somebody had actually um, put some new ABS here, but then connect it to the old cast iron. But we're gonna replace this entire thing because I wanna redesign the entire system. It's just gonna be easier. And now that everything's exposed, it won't be a big problem at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut the plastic pipe and try to remove this. That's got some weight to it. Okay, so the other thing I'm gonna do is take out this one stud. Okay, so we're gonna take this stud out. It's not really held to anything anyways. Okay, so we're gonna pull this out as well because we're gonna be rerouting it. And I never really did like this. I feel like this is not connected to anything. Just move, it always moved around too much, so I want to see exactly how this is connected. So let's get this and get this out of here. Yeah, that's really, it's not even attached to anything in here. That's the kind of the way I had a feeling it was done. Okay, so this is kind of what I've expected. It kind of really not put in there very well. So I'm gonna make sure that I put something in here so that this doesn't, Get any more debris in it. Okay, so we're gonna put some new three inch pipe. We don't need to go with four inch because we're only feeding one bathroom. So we're gonna connect into this old terracotta, but take a look down here. I had to double check things and turn, run some water, but there's a pipe inlet coming in here. This is the old storm drains that's no longer being used because I got it capped outside. So basically all I'm gonna do is slide this new pipe into my terracotta and then I'm gonna cement 
around this. Um, main reason is, is because this is going to turn into just a rat's nest of problems. I'd have to dig way down there and you're just basically connecting to terracotta that's just kind of mounted into that elbow down there. So um, this is somewhat of a, um, you know, it's a good connection because once I put the hydraulic cement around, it'll be in well tacked. Um, but you just want to make sure that it's well sealed inside of there. Okay, so we're going to prime and install. So basically what fits really well is this three inch cup link that's going to, I'll put on my pipe here. This sits pretty snugly inside of that uh, terracotta piping. Okay, so I know this is a little bit of an uncustomary attachment here, but what we're going to be basically doing is just this fits nice and snugly in there. And what we'll do is we'll put hydraulic cement all the way around here and cement this into that terracotta. A clean out on here. Okay, so what we're gonna use here is uh, some hydraulic cement to basically seal this pipe into the terracotta. Now, I wanna mention that maybe a lot of places uh, might not allow this or might not be meeting the code, but a lot of this old terracotta, that's the way every connection was made, was just basically hydraulic cement cemented into each other. So it's not gonna necessarily bond to the uh, plastic, but it's gonna keep it you know, kind of a good connection. And then when I put concrete all the way around here, it's kind of encapsulating it completely so that there's no movement. So this is kind of a quick fix scenario. So be careful, you know, I mean, you know, it might not meet code where you're required. You might have to dig this all the way down and get a proper fitting on there. But this is, uh, you know, these are some of the things that these old 1900 homes, um, this is really one of the fastest, easiest ways to go about doing this. Just. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that nothing's cracked and, and make sure that you've got a good seal around there. I did want to mention that there is better ways to connect a clay pipe, and one of those is using a fern coat. I demonstrate that in one of my other courses, the basement bathroom course. And basically what I use is a fern coat that adapts to clay to four inch PVC pipe. This is really the ultimate way to go, so I definitely implore you to go check out that video and how I went about doing that. But keep in mind, all of this plumbing advice that I'm giving you here is basically just kind of a demonstration of how I went about it. Uh, you really have to consult your local uh, municipality and licensed plumber to be able to make sure that you're installing plumbing to meet the code that is in your specific township. But I do want to recommend one course that I really highly recommend that you take if you're going to try to do this all yourself is from Hammerpedia. I have a links down below of his course, but he really highlights all types of um, basically dev demonstrations of the UPC and IPC code much better at uh, explaining all those differences and how to go about this so I really implore to do some more investigation on the plumbing work of this but uh, everything I've done in this particular bathroom is highlighted uh, by using his courses and the knowledge that I've learned from other contractors as well so hopefully this helps you out but definitely check out my other course and in Hammerpedia's as well Okay, so we're gonna just use a long sweep going up into our wall here. Make sure these lines line up with each other here. It'll be nice and straight. go 
to like 10 and a half. Yeah, I think that should work. Actually, it's not the way I wanted it. Oh well. It's not really the way I wanted to do it. How did you want to do it? Well, I wanted this fitting slipping into this hub, not the other way around. So what we're going to do here is we're going to bring this up for our vanity sink and we'll have another um, 90 coming over here for our tub. So we're going to bring everything downstream as far as our connections to our other fixtures. It's really the best way to do it so that everything has its own dry vent going through the roof. So I've just basically cut something about 90 inches. It doesn't really matter just as long as I have enough room to get another fitting for my tub and then obviously my uh, Tea, they come out for my for my toilet. So this is going to be for our vanity. Okay, then we also have to get our tub next. So we'll bring that top of this. Let me just get a... And then toilet is going to be up here. So we'll decipher that after we get this into place. Okay, so we got our stack up to our bathroom floor here. Now we're gonna run and install our toilet supply. So what I like to use for toilets are these closet bends. So this is a four inch um, fitting that goes down to three inch and it's a 90. So it works really great for toilets because I'm able to get just a standard um, closet flange and it slides right into it and I can glue that in after I do all of my tile and all of my waterproofing. So I really like that aspect of it. Um, and it, you're not reducing the size of the inner side of the, the pipe by doing this. It's, it's actually getting, it has a little bit of a bigger flow there. So it also has a kind of a nice extension up here too. So this can be extended up through the floor. I could seal around it. And then when I tile around it, I just can put that fitting right in. So it's pretty nice when it comes to that. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get 
this glued. I kind of have everything a little bit dry fitted here so that I can kind of quickly do this. Okay, so got that all primed. Now the, the trick here is trying to get this to all be glued in and this all at the right angle because basically I'm just bringing this straight over to, so let me just dry fit this again and get a board underneath of here. Hold this into place. Get that over. So this is 13 inches. Because we're going to basically have half inch drywall and then we're going to have tile as well. So we actually want to make this a little bit more than 12 inches. Typically, typically if you just had 12, um, regular drywall, half inch drywall, you can just go 12 inches off of the rough end framing and you'll have about a half inch gap behind your toilet. But in this scenario, we're gonna be putting tile as well. So I wanna give myself a little bit of room. So we'll make this about 13 inches to the center of my flange here. All right, so then now that we got that established, I think this needs to be lowered slightly. Okay, so then we wanna basically glue this at the same time. You don't have a whole lot of time when you put this stuff together. It's a little bit more than ABS glue, but still got about 30 seconds and it's gonna be kind of where it's at. Sure that's level. We're at 12 and three quarter, good enough for me. That'll be fine. Again, and then you just want to make sure that you're getting a good pitch, quarter inch per foot. Is about what you want to have. Looks like I have a little bit more than that. Okay, so that works out well. So then when you see here. Once I get my plywood on there, I'm gonna have probably about, probably about an inch of this sticking outside the floor and then I could just cut that flush once I get the tile in and then just basically anchor that to my floor. Our vent stack, or our, our waste stack, I should say, for our vanity. So we're about 20 inches. So I wanna just make sure that we get our quarter inch per foot slope here. So I'm just gonna mark the front of my studs so I know where I need to drill my holes. Bring this up, you know, we're five foot. So five foot is the maximum distance to my vent. And my vent is gonna be right here that we're gonna connect up into my three inch. So that works out great. Um, the, uh, I believe it's the uh, IPC allows you to go eight foot. So you could actually have used inch and a half in this scenario, but we're gonna go two inch just make sure that there's never any issues with the venting. And again, the main reason I'm doing this is because then I don't have to run my dry vent going up and then I don't have to bring it and tie it back in over here. I can just literally bring it from here over and it's a lot easier to do all of the plumbing work over here. So 
we, what we want to do here is a T two inch to inch and a half for our vent. So this is where our vent is going to basically end. And then, so let's measure down into the hub of our two inch down here. Make sure it's this thing plumb. I'll make sure that that fitting's sitting right. Okay. All right. So that's our vanity drain. And now we'll go ahead and get our tub in. So this guy. Um, my drain, so this is a six foot wall or basically a six foot five bathroom, actually a little bit longer than that, six foot four. So in order to encapsulate the tub, I'm gonna have to build out some walls on either side of this. I usually like to do it on both sides, kind of makes it look a little bit more uniform. So my drain location for my tub is nine inches from the center of my hole of my tub drain back. So that needs to have, you know, this, this, this joist here, we're going to be reinforcing because this joist is already pretty compromised over here. So I'm not really concerned about it. So, but basically you want to make sure that your tub drain is somewhere within the, in the right um, area so that uh, when I connect my P trap, what I normally like to do since I have all of this opened up underneath it here is set my tub, tub with the drain assembly and then connect the P-trap and everything else after I have the tub set in. So all I'm going to be doing right now is getting a T port and having my vents set up and then I'll be connecting my P-trap after the tub is in. But I obviously wanna just make sure that I'm somewhere within center. Um, basically we're gonna be need 16 inches off this back wall. That's exactly where that pipe is sitting. So I basically just need a, a straight sanitary T coming out this way and then I can pick up my uh, P trap to connect to it. Okay, so I made a mistake here. I used the wrong fitting for my tub spout coming in here. Had a little bit of a brain fart. I'm not sure exactly why. <laughs> why I put a combo T on here, um, but the real fitting that you want to be using is a regular sanitary T going into a vertical position like that, because a combo T is nothing much different than just using a Y with a 45 coupling. So. Here's the issue. When you have this longer sweep 90 coming into this T, the actual vent is right here at this intersection. And so if this was all filled up with water, the vent is down below the trap weir. When you have this out coming out with a trap, when this fills up, it still needs to be able to get air. So this is the area that needs to be exposed. On a sanitary T, even if this whole pipe was full of water, right at that crease, it's always gonna be able to get air. So this can trap air and make a slow drain. And this one is the correct fitting. So I'm not sure exactly how I screwed that up, but anyways, uh, some days are like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a, since this is already hard piped in, it makes it a little bit difficult to change out, but I'm gonna use a repair cup link, which is smooth all the way inside and then a standard cup link. So I'm gonna put the standard cup link down below and then on, on the vent side, I'm gonna slide this down with the glue. It's a little bit of a messy process, but it can, you can definitely achieve doing that. And then our repair coupling that doesn't have any stop in it. Okay, so then this guy can be just glued down. OK, 
Okay, take the repair pop link. So it's all kind of a one motion thing. You don't have a lot of time to mess around, but you're basically just slipping that repair coupling over there. So now we'll be venting properly. And I'm gonna put a little stub out on this because I want this to come out past. I'm gonna be putting a, a ledger board across here. So I might actually just bring that out a little bit more, just let it extend way out. Now we have a T. Now you can see I have this upside down because this is gonna be basically a drain from my vent. So you always wanna have your fittings the opposite direction so it can drain. So we'll put that on this side and we'll connect it into this drain. So then for this one, just to keep it all in line with another, we'll just, again, just bring this upside down and then connect our vent in this way. So I'll just get a random piece for that. It doesn't have to be anything specific. So let's get see what this is. 59. Joy's not there. That's probably best to jog it. So I'm gonna have to cut through here. So when you do these top plates and you're cutting stuff like this, you're gonna to have to get some reinforcement plates on the top. I don't have them today, but I'll grab some of them. They're basically like 30 or, or 24 inch spans. So you go about 12 inches on either side of the cut. So I'm gonna cut this and go up through the top. Ceiling joist, not really that big of a deal, especially when it's kind of already supported there but um yeah you want to kind of reinforce these top blocks so i'm going to do that and we'll jog that that vent over Now it's gonna be have to be good for now. I'll have to grab some more fittings to be able to get that through there. Okay, so before we put this vent together up here, I'm gonna test all of my plumbing. I'm gonna fill this vent stack all the way up to here. So I wanna put a couple plugs in my drain where I don't have um, anything connected. I don't have any fixtures in, so I gotta plug my ports here. So I'm gonna put an inch and a half in the inch and a half. I already have one here for my toilet. Okay, so ideally it would have been best to go to the roof and fill it up after I get this in. But it's like 30 feet up to the top of this roof and I'm not gonna do that. So this is good enough. This will at least be able to test all my drains, making sure it's all right. I only have a couple of fittings I gotta glue to get through the roof, so not a big deal. So I ran a hose up and I'm gonna fill this up. So we've got water here. So we're just gonna keep that there for a while. 
make sure it's not leaking, but that's gonna be our water level for, you know, probably the rest of the day here. Okay, so everything looks pretty good. Still got water level here. So that definitely makes me feel a lot more confident about our plumbing situation. So we'll let the water out and we'll finish this vent going up to through the roof here. Okay, so go ahead and release the water. It's a heck of a lot of pressure. You can hear that whoosh down in there. So it's a good way to clean out your outside pipe too and your trap. <laughs> so we're all good. Nothing's leaking around where we did a hydraulic cement. So we're in good shape. I did put a little bit of Teflon tape on this cap. Got a couple 90s. We'll bring this up. So this is definitely not the way you want to see a roof vent. You can see it's underneath the shingles. So the flange is underneath of it. Looks like somebody cut it off. And then you can see this rubber gasket's all kind of worn out from basically the old cast iron. So we're going to replace this. This is definitely a good cause of the leak. The other problem is my roof vent, same thing. Looks like the bottom of the flange is cut off. And then we're also going to eliminate that pipe hole there. So got our work cut out for us here. Okay, so most critical part of installing your flange. So this is a three inch, but you have to make sure it's three inch. You don't want to get anything that's a smaller size. So you want to make sure that when you put your flange over here, that this overlaps this bottom shingle. That's the most critical point to all of this because then when water hits around here, it goes over the flange and then down the roof. So this should be exposed here. So and all we're going to do is just nail this in place. And then these two nails here are going to have to be uh, covered in tar. Okay, I wanna explain a really important detail if you plan to change out your PEX for your water supplies in your basement. Some of this old copper is in pretty nasty shape, so there's a lot of good reason to go ahead and just replace it, but you have to pay attention to your electrical panel. Take off the box, pay attention to how it's grounded. If it, most of the time, in older homes, they used to ground everything to the main water supply. So pay attention to where that's at and make sure that you get your electrical panel grounded to the meter side of it. So I'll just show you real quickly how we go about doing that. It's a really quick, simple process. So ultimately it's a pretty simple installation. I use the number six gauge wire for this and they do have a knockout specifically on most panels to be able to run that ground wire. Just simply find a uh, empty bus or an em empty spot in your neutral ground bus and then staple this all the way around to where you can get to your meter. And uh, now this was a sandstone foundation, so it was kind of like Swiss cheese. It was really easy to use these little one-hole straps 
uh, and, and anchor this into place. And then you just want to use a half inch copper clamp to attach that ground wire to the actual meter. Uh, just be sure you uh, sand down that copper. You definitely want to get a good uh, connection to that piping. And then just know that some areas are might require you to jump the meter. So going from one from that side to the other side. So you might need a little short piece of copper to go over to that. But in this scenario, since I changed out everything to PEX, uh, it wasn't a big deal. And I actually was moving on to that. I, I changed this ground wire before I uh, changed out all the PEX. Okay, so now we're going to convert everything to PEX. Again, making sure that you have your ground wire connected because now that we're going to go to plastic, it's important to make sure that everything's well grounded. So we're just going to cut this off. This old valve kind of looks kind of ugly. So we're going to take this old valve off. We're going to cut it down somewhere below here. So I'm just going to use my auto cut tool here. Okay, so there's still water in here, so I'm going to take this out, take this off the meter. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and put a PEX adapter on here. This tool does really great. Just put this on the end of your impact. We'll sand this up nicely. Sand your fitting as well, so we're going to be using that PEX adapter here. I'm going to use some flux. So you just coat this fitting completely with the flux. Take any excess flux off of there. Okay, so then what I like to use are these Pro Crimp rings. So the Pro Crimps are kind of nice because you can just fit them on here and it keeps the right space. So you can see here, I have that 16th inch pec showing. So these make it really simple. So just slide that on to here, get a new shutoff valve. You want to use a no-go-go -go gauge. Make sure that this is fitting over all your fittings. Make sure they're all crimped well. Okay, so toilet for your vanity or for your uh, water supply, you wanna be basically eight inches from the center. So let's make sure what where center is here. So you got 52 and a quarter to the center, 52 and a quarter to center. So we wanna add eight inches. So we wanna be over eight and up eight. So let's get a piece of blocking here, 19 and a half and get a vertical board here so we can mount our 
uh, water supply. Okay, so we're gonna be doing something a little bit uncustomary here. And the main reason is, is because I really want my water supplies to be on the outside wall. I, or, well, I want them to be on the outside wall, but I want them protruding out of the wall because we're doing a uh, tiled wainscoting all the way around. And I really, really dislike having uh, pipes coming up through the floor. It makes it very difficult for any type of freestanding vanity. And a lot of times it just simply won't work because there's a lot of shelves now that are being put on the bottom of the vanities and you can't really put a pipe right through that. So we're gonna go on the outside wall. The biggest stipulation with that depends on where you live, but uh, we're up here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It gets pretty cold here in the winter. You wanna have at least an R15 behind your plumbing. So that's what we're gonna do. That's why I buffered out this inch and a half because I'll be able to get my R15 in the background here. So the insulation will be behind my piping. Now I might go ahead and even just add a little bit of pipe insulation around this as well and we should be good. But the important thing is, is that we're not really putting the plumbing to where we're gonna jeopardize the insulation behind it. Because if we would have just went with the regular two by four wall here, you wouldn't have had enough insulation behind there. Most likely this would freeze. So what I'm gonna do here is, is we already have our two by fours kind of put on here. I'm gonna be, you know, after I get the subfloor down, we're gonna go all the way um, on every single stud. But you can see here, I have a rim joist here that I need to notch to be able to get my plumbing through here. Because I, again, I don't wanna be notching or I don't wanna be coming up through the floor. So I'm just gonna simply notch this and then we're gonna be putting a new band board over top of this. So I'm only gonna be cutting maybe about, you know, a half inch, three quarters of an inch to be able to get this piping into that band board. We're gonna be using these quarter bands here, make this copper again. Copper makes it look a little, a little bit nicer inside the vanity as well. Uh, I'm more particular about seeing the exposed copper when we have it for the water supply inside the vanity. You're not gonna see it, but this is still a nice way to be able to get your angle stops on here. So let's just go ahead and put a T here. port here for our vanity about 20 inches off the rough end framing. So we'll just go bring this maybe about 18 inches for our water supplies. You can be above or below, it doesn't really matter, but as long as they kind of look at the same here. So we'll go something like this. And I'm just gonna use this to kind of hold this in place. eight inches from the center over, about that, and then eight inches off the floor. So this will, now we're gonna be doing a tiled Wayne's conning, so it's not gonna really matter, but if you had base trim or something like that, you definitely wanna keep it up eight inches, just in case you had a nice, you know, wide base trim. You don't, I always hated that when the, the toilet supply is coming through the baseboard or you have to notch around it. So keep it up high enough so that's not a problem. Okay, so then this is gonna to go to the shower. We're gonna be building a, a wall for it. So for right now, we'll just cap it. So I'm just put a shark bite cap on it so we can reuse it. So that'll be for the shower. We'll let that just kind of lie there until we're ready to build that wall. Okay. 
Same thing with the shower. I'm just going to cap this for now. Okay, so it's time to finally get a floor underneath of here. And we have some serious uh, issues with our structure here. Uh, we're gonna have to sister on new joists because this is um, completely severed. And we wanna make sure you have good reinforcement underneath of our tub. So the first thing you wanna do before you even get started with tr trying to get the lumber up here is to see how level your existing floor is. So I got a six foot level. I definitely recommend getting something fairly long like this so that you can really get evaluate the levelness of your bathroom. Now, you know, when it comes to rough in framing, is really anything within a quarter inch is pretty good. Um, you know, you can be as precise as you want and the more precise you are, the better and easier it is gonna be for you to finish everything off in the space. But in my mind, um, sometimes, I mean, I, I like to try to get to perfection, but if I'm within a quarter inch, it's, it's good enough. You can, you can you know, work things out later on. In this particular bathroom, I'm gonna be doing some floor heating. So I'm gonna be doing some floor leveler. So I'll have an opportunity to make everything 100% level if I don't get it to this point right now. But there's a couple of things with these old bathrooms that you can't always get everything to 100% level with the framing. And I'll show you in a bit what, what I mean by that. But looking at this, this looks pretty dang good. I, it's amazing how these old homes, I mean, this has been here for over 120 years now, almost 120 years, 1910, um, 112 years, okay? So still all pretty level. So this is really, this is nice this way. So always check a couple of your studs. So we're gonna go this way, take a look, going from the, across all the joists. And it looks like we're dipping down a little bit here in this corner. So we got about, looks about three eighths of an inch on this back end. So this must be, I'm guessing that, yeah, this, this existing old rim joist looks like it's sagged down on this corner. So when we put our ledger, I, I, I kind of already created a ledger here because basically since I furred out my wall, uh, we didn't have any surface for the flooring anymore. And I furred this out because I wanted to make sure that I have my vanity supplies on the outside wall so that it works really well with my freestanding uh, vanity. And then I always like the toilet supplies on the wall. I don't really like them coming through the floor. So I got this ledger. I kind of notched it out a little bit already. But the first thing I'm going to do is get this ledger completely level and making sure that I, I span across here. Because since I'm lower down here, I want to make sure I get that board up to the right height. Now looking at this edge, so coming back on this back portion, uh, sorry the live stream, you're not gonna be able to hear this, but, uh, or see this, I should say, uh, coming outside of the floor area, we're kind of pitched down a little bit towards the doorway. And these are one of these areas that's very difficult to level out um, because you're gonna end up with a higher height in the bathroom. And if you have an existing joist on the outside of the floor, it's kind of hard to raise that because you don't want to have a hump. But the way I did this here is I basically tore out uh, the area underneath of the door frame. So I'm going to just bring that three quarter inch, even though it's slightly unlevel at the door entrance, I'll be able to make that up with the floor leveler and get that 100% level. To me, it's just going to be, we're only talking a quarter inch here in six foot. So it's not like it's a tremendous amount of slope. Uh, and it's just going to be better because then we don't have to deal with any type of higher transition at the framing section of, of where the outside of the floor is. So all in all, I'm pretty impressed. It's pretty nice to see that the, the levelness of this old bathroom has kind of held up over all these years. So the first thing I want to do is just get, so let me just cut a piece so that I have something to nail into. Level with this back area. That'll make it easier for my side ledger there. Looks pretty good.
Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, so our ledger is nice and level now. So this is basically what we're gonna reference when we stick our new joists on here. So pay attention to where your water supplies are. You don't wanna be nailing those. Okay, so for this joist, we're gonna sister on this side. Main reason is, is because when I have my tub, basically we figured out we need about 18 inches for where my port of my um, trap assembly comes out of my tub. So I don't wanna sister this side, plus I already put all my pecs on this side. So we're gonna sister it on this side. And what's interesting is the way these old homes were structured is basically they have balloon framing from all the way up from the top stud all the way down to the basement, just one long stud. And the only thing that they actually have is a little ledger board, a three quarter inch, like usually like a one by six or a one by eight. And that's what holds up this side of the house. Um, you know, traditional framing now, you basically build a wall, put floor joists down, up, and then you build the wall on top of the floor joists. But back in the day, it was all just one long 20, you know, 24 foot long two by four that goes all the way up to the top of the ceiling. So I'm just re referencing that because all we have for support is basically this old one by six that's nailed to this existing stud bay. Over here, we have a wall here and actually it's, it's a kind of a double wall, but this wall here is directly above our main beam down below. So that's a supporting wall. And there's other joists, I can't see any here, but there's other joists in the space where it's sistered over top of this. So this is a load bearing wall, and that's what you wanna find when you're installing you know, a new joist from one side to the other. So as long as I can get above this existing um, wall here, we're gonna have support on either side of this bathroom. So I'm gonna clear this out, some of this, uh, these blockers out because I want to sister the new joist on. Now, most likely these old joists are a little bit thicker than the new nominal lumber. Actually, no, it's not, seven and a half. That's kind of surprising. So it is about the same size as nominal realm lumber, but we still might have to shim it. We're gonna to have to shim it up a little bit in order to get it to the levelness because we are raising this up a little bit on this side. So let me grab my joist here. Okay, so we just sistered out. I still got some nails down here. Okay, so that looks good. So technically now, I mean, I'm sistering onto this new stud, but this is the new support. So really this existing old joist here is just pretty much keeping me referenced with the parallel of the room. So, you know, if you were repairing some kind of a joist, this is adding a whole new joist on. If you were repairing something, you would wanna get some kind of structural screws, maybe some carriage bolts that you bring everything together. But since I'm putting a whole new structural member here, this old joist really doesn't mean anything anymore. So it's just literally, I'm just gonna be nailing it together just for the sake of holding it into place. Um, now I do need some shims. Okay, so we're gonna get some shims because I need to raise that left or this right side up. So we're pretty much, yeah, it's almost, almost three eighths of an inch. So we'll get that underneath of our Support rim joist here, looks good. Okay, so now we can go ahead and just nail this on the place. Let me double check this side here. Yeah, it should be good, that's good. We've got ductwork on this side of the bathroom or against the wall here, so I can't exactly put that over the ductwork. And one problem I see on this side 
is that my stud is right here. You can't cut that out because that's that's the actual frame um, framing of the bathroom. I think what I'm going to do is basically just add a blocker on here. I mean, this is this is for structural means um, because it's basically this U notch here that I'm, I'm I really don't like. Basically, they cut half of it out. So, and the rest of these, it's just within within reason. You only got an inch and a half cut off of that. Right now, I mean, everything is on 16 inch center, um, but we're gonna have to bring this over a little bit just to support this. So that's what I'm gonna do because I can't cut out this joist or this uh, balloon framing stud and I can't get the, the framing on this side because we got a duct work on the other side. So um, it'll be close enough, it'll, it'll at least have Good support in between here so let me get a two by six on the side of this I mean, this is basically just spacing for the most part next piece of framing here make this work keep this all level over here That looks pretty good. So we'll have to get some glue. Okay, so we're gonna use some eight penny nails for this. So, and the ones that you really wanna use are the ones with the ring shank. This will really hold down this plywood well. So the ring shank, eight penny nails. Uh, this just gives a lot more uh, grab into the joist but we don't need these big framing nails anymore. And basically plywood is just like every eight inches. And some of you might be asking like, why am I using OSB? And I tell you what, it's really made a world of difference. I always, I was always skeptical of OSB um, before, but if it ever gets wet, not that you should be having any major issues here in the bathroom. Um, but it really does hold up pretty well. Uh, regular CDX plywood, that can delaminate very easily, especially when it gets wet. And I've recently just build, built a garage and um, a second story on my home, and it got saturated with water. We had some of these really big downpours, and I was, I was really concerned about the subfloor, thinking I just completely ruined it. If it would have been traditional CDX plywood, I would have had to replace it all because it would have probably all have delaminated and, and, and fell apart. But the OSB held up really, really strong. Just needed a light sanding and then I can go over top of it. So I don't know, I'm a big fan of OSB. I know a lot of people have questions about it, but I think it's engineered to be actually fairly strong and, and long lasting. So that's why I use it and it's cheaper. So you can't beat that. But a real game changer is this constructive adhesive and a foam gun. This is so awesome, so nice, and so much easier to get the glue on these joists rather than using a big gun. Um, I love it. So definitely something if you do a lot of this. This, I mean, and if you do regular foam insulation all the time, you can just put that regular canister on here and, and go ahead and use it. But this construction adhesive is really, really pretty awesome. So you want to glue your subfloor. You definitely want to prevent any uh, creaks or cracks. So you go ahead and put this on the joist and this stuff is some sticky stuff so try not to get this on your on yourself All right, so this is a common area where there's some, some problems sometimes. And that is getting some blocking underneath where your door frame is. So I'm gonna get a couple blocks over here.
Okay, so I did lose audio completely on this here. But as you can see, I'm just continuing with my subflooring, making sure that I have everything nice and glued, and then uh, just placing everything in the place. So really simple once you get all the structure all ready to go all the way around your room. Now, when you're putting two pieces of tongue and groove plywood together, uh, it can be sometimes a little bit difficult to put together. So if you put a block on one side and kind of pound it into place, uh, that's usually a kind of a strategy that works well. Uh, a lot of times you can just, you know, use your feet and kind of push it towards each other. But you do want to make that fairly tight so that everything's completely uh, solid between here. And I did mention I was going to eat my words on the that uh, spray foam adhesive. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear, see here shortly, you know, it just, I don't know what happened. I must have dropped the tool on it, but boy, it made in a really, really big mess. Uh, what a disaster. I'm just so happy that this was a flip home. Uh, it was my own home that I was redoing and all the carpet was getting replaced. Everything was being redone. If this would have been a client home, it would have been an absolute nightmare. So I thought it was a good idea. It is easier to use. Um, but I found out even later that it's just something that always gets gunked up and it's, it's problematic. So basically just nailing the rest of the plywood and uh, now we have a great foundation for a new bathroom. All right, so electrical. Uh, it's really easy when you get all the walls removed like this because obviously you can run all the new wires and it's really important to investigate your existing electrical, especially if you have an older home and you've had many renovations done, usually uh, a lot of the stuff wasn't brought up the code and or uh, just was really sloppily done. In this particular bathroom, we had some old knob and tube and that was really dangerous to add new devices to, uh, especially if you're doing something like a, a new outlet or something like that. Uh, hair dryers suck out a lot of amperage and you don't wanna be using your old uh, wiring for that. So we're gonna go through uh, step by step on what you wanna do typically or what I typically do in, in a bathroom for a setup, so let's get started. Okay, so the common setup for electrical in a bathroom for me is the way I basically do it on every job, is I get a three switch box because I like to have my fan on a separate circuit. Usually there's a light above the vanity or on the side sconces of the vanity, so we have a separate switch for that. And I always put a recessed light above a tub or a shower and then that be on its separate switch as well. So a three switch box, gang box, is usually ideal for that. This particular situation, I have a fairly narrow uh, you know, um, depth in my wall because of the way the old structure was. Now we're gonna have to add on a little bit of thickness here because my jam's sticking out, but this little tiny three gang box is only about three inches deep, and that's gonna work fine because right now we have an inch and three quarter, we're gonna add another half inch plus the a uh, half inch drywall will be about three and a quarter inches. So normally I like to have the bigger volume cubic inch boxes that have a little bit more depth. It makes it easier if you wanna do a, a timer switch or if you wanted a, uh, a dimmer switch, those things kind of take up a lot of volume and it's kind of tough to fit in this box. But in this particular situation, we're just doing straight switches so it's not gonna be a problem. All right, so then we're gonna be running this up, typically you usually go off the floor about 52 inches to the bottom of your box. You know, a lot of times I reference what the rest of the house is, so it's all the same. Uh, but typically it is between 50, 52 inches for a switch box. Now you wanna pay attention to not being too close to your trim. We're gonna be getting a four inch trim on here. So we don't want the, the switch box being too crowded. In this situation, it looks like as long as I just go straight up against my two by four here, I'll have about a, an inch and a half space between that and my cover. So just be aware of your uh, circumstances in your own bathroom. The other thing is I'm gonna be doing a tiled wainscoting. So I wanna pay attention to that. I do not want this outlet being chopped off or, or having, you know, I mean, I, either it's gonna be in the tile work or it's gonna be out of the tile work. I think it's better just to be higher and be above the tile work rather being in it, but that's all again, just press perfect no, personal preference and then basically how high your wainscoting is going to be. My uh, particular uh, wainscoting is going to be about 48 inches, so that 52 inches is going to give me plenty of space between the switch cover and that tile work. Okay, so I got to cut out my stud here a little bit. All 
All right, and then I need to put some plywood over top of this so that when we get our half inch drywall, we're even with our jam. So I'm gonna put some half inch strips on here and then, and then install the box. Grab it. You have these little tabs on here. Just wanna make sure that they stick outside of the finished wall that you're installing. Just because you gotta make sure that this stays level. Otherwise, you can't really adjust your switches in this direction. Okay, so for power supply to this, just a 15 amp line, 14.2 is all that you need. So we're gonna run this all the way down to our panel. And then this is gonna be our power supply to the switches. And I also have uh, another switch from my attic for my lighting circuit. You can add the lighting circuits. You know, if you had an existing lighting circuit that was not knob and tube, you can certainly use that. But I definitely advise getting a new 20 amp line for your GFI and um, if you're doing in-floor heating. So when you take this out of the box, I would roll this out so that you're not twisting your wire. So just get enough to get all the way down to your location by just rolling this out. And then this will keep it kind of straight when you're running it. So this particular situation, I'm gonna be running it down through here. I have an open ceiling down below so I can just route this through the floor joist. So let me get it. So we have a nice little pathway. And all of this stuff will staple and probably zip tie together here. But for right now, we're gonna keep running our wires. There's a nice easy chase way to get down to the basement. Staple these so that they don't get pinched in the drywall or anything. left we'll just keep this out for now I have a joist right against the edge there that's gonna be kind of difficult to run a wire through there um, because I have to drill up and then try to fish it down so I'm gonna go underneath the floor and bring my lighting circuit up we're gonna be doing most likely two side sconces so I'm gonna bring my power lead or my um, yeah power lead to the, the light fixtures underneath the floor and over. So we're gonna mark this vanity light. And this is power. So I'm just make, make sure I know that's power. Okay, so this guy is just gonna get tucked in front of the insulation so that when we figure out exactly where we want that light fixture, we can grab this wire and put it in place. So I'm just gonna loosely put a staple here. I put the insulation in, I'll hold this out and then I'll be able to grab it. Most likely it's gonna be somewhere around five foot or maybe six foot, but you'll be able to grab this wire. We wanna bring one over for the other side of the light. now all right so we need a light for above our tub so this is the old BX cable that they have attached to the knob and tube and as you can see I have open splices here this stuff is really nasty 
in some ways, this stuff is even worse than knob and tube. If you see this stuff, that's you don't have knob and tube and this is routed everywhere, I'd replace this as well. This is really, a lot of times the sheathing can wear out around the edges here. And then when you're adding new light fixtures or something to this, you can get a spark. You know, this is just a dangerous type of wire. This stuff is probably, you know, 60 years old as well. So definitely get rid of that. But obviously open splices like this is definitely not good. You can even see, you know, they just have a cloth tape around it. Just ugly, ugly stuff. Um, so definitely try to be safe and take this stuff out of here. This used to just fish all the lights throughout the house. Probably done in the, probably done in the tw 30s, probably 20s. So lasts a long time. It's just we have, we have higher demands on our electric, and you don't want to be connecting old or new devices to this, basically. Sorry. Sorry. So when you're drilling holes into this ceiling joist, try to be in the center. Um, you know, just try to keep it so when you're putting your screws in for your drywall that you're not going to pinch that wire. Plus, I'm actually going to fur this down a little bit with some uh, one by material. So when I nail this, I want to make sure I don't nail my wires. So I'm going to go up a little bit higher here. But you have to be aware, like, there's a floor above here too. So if people are nailing down in, you really want to be, you know, two inches away from the edge so that they don't puncture your, your new wires. So we, I like to center these in the shower area. So about three foot, somewhere within this stud bay. And then we're gonna be about 16 inches to the center. So I just have to route this wire up again. We're gonna be drilling a hole and then grabbing this wire. So this is gonna stay kind of loose up here. This will be under the insulation as well. I'll cut a hole and be able to grab this wire. So this is all going to be on the same circuit. So let's route this and we'll just keep this loose until we get our vent fan in. But uh, this is a little odd here. I'm going to basically notch this out a little bit and put a metal plate on it. I mean, obviously this is a weird scenario where you have the, the uh, studs are flat. So I want to just notch out a little bit more of this and then just put in a, a nail plate to hold it together. You just want to make sure that this is loose. You don't want to end pinching anything. All right, and then we'll bring this down. Needs to be powered as well. I always just mark it with a magic marker. Okay. Okay, so these two get wired together. This is my vanity light. This is my fan and this is my uh, light fixture. So I take about an inch off the sheathing. Okay, so what I like to use are these Wago clips. These things are awesome. So you just, they're just like little levers. You just lift them up, stick the wire in, nope, sorry, wrong side. Stick the wire inside, and then you just wanna make sure that your copper is seen through the back side of the Wago clip. But that holds it in nice, and it's really easy. I mean, it's like, you know, you can't, even if you screw up, you can just lift that lever up and uh, take it out of there. So really kind of a nice little system here. Go put it in this side, there you go. <laughs> so, then they come in all different sizes. So this is a five lever, because what we need to do here 
is put all of the neutrals together. So all the white wires need to come together. Okay, again, just make sure that all those copper lines are sticking up above. Pull on your wires, make sure that you're all connected well. And then, so the power leads are connected here. So all of this, we're gonna have to get basically three separate power supplies to each one of these. We're gonna do that after we get everything else hooked up. Um, but let's go ahead and just put all our grounds together here. Connect all these and then use a Wago clip that will go to each ground to, to each switch. I'm going to ground each switch, but we're going to just basically tie these all together first. And then let's just get this tucked back in the back of the box. Okay, so we're going to put this on here for our ground because we're going to have to connect all that eventually. for now. Okay, GFI outlet. I really highly recommend these type of boxes, these adjustable boxes. This will make it really easy, especially if you're doing a tiled wains cutting or any type of wains cutting. You could adjust this to fit to the, where your wall meets. Now, as far as location goes, I don't personally like them directly behind the vanity area. I like them out kind of on the outside so that when you have your wires connected, they kind of droop down you know, below the vanity. Typically, you usually are about 42 inches off the floor for the bottom of your box. The only thing you want to pay attention to is what you're doing. Um, I'm having a towel wainscoting that's coming up 48 inches. So we're going to be about there and I'm going to have a little border. So we're going to have bull nose a little border and I really don't want this outlet in that border. So I want to keep this down a little bit further. This is also where it's nice not being in right directly behind the vanity. It's nice to have it to be able to have the flexibility and make it a little bit lower and it won't inter, you know, interprotrude with the uh, actual countertop. So we're going to be actually installing a uh, 30 inch vanity. So our vanity is basically going to be ending at the edge of this two by four. So just paying attention to that, you know, I, the countertop is not going to overhang that far, so I'm not worried about it. I'm going to just keep this down just to be safe because I don't know how wide of a border I'm going to be doing it. But if it's four inches, I want to make sure that I have plenty of room. So I'm going to actually bring this down. So in this instance, we're going to be like 36 inches to the bottom of that box. So this would be a problem if you were trying to, you know, if you had a countertop coming all the way over. 36 inches is way too low. Typically that's where your countertop sits, but since this is outside of that vanity area, it's not gonna be a big deal. I'll be kind of basically in line with that countertop for the most part. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this box. Now this is designed to go over reg like a regular two by four. So it has these little nailing flange pieces on here. I have to cut these off now because I'm putting them on a flat uh, two by four like this. So just cut that off. I also don't want to be too, too close to the wall either because we're obviously going to have a towel wains cutting up coming here and I don't want to have it directly in the corner. So we're about four inches away from the wall, which will work out great. We'll basically have about two and a half inches of space between the edge of the wall. Um, but yeah, these are great. So you can just basically bring these out as much as you need to make them work. All right, so then for your GFI, you definitely want to be using a 20 amp wire, so 12 to yellow cable. So we're going to run this straight down to the basement. This will be completely dedicated. That's what you want to have for a GFI. When you're using hair dryers and things, uh, you definitely need it to be dedicated.
Okay, so we're gonna be installing uh, a heated flooring system. So the best way to go about this is that you wanna run all your cold splices for your um, basically heated flooring system through conduit. So the easiest way to have enough room for everything is to use a four by four box like this. This is a metal and then use a mud ring over top of this. So this will give us our single gang box for our uh, thermostat and then it'll, we'll bring the conduit down and out to the bottom of the floor. It's really the simplest way to go. Um, now I'm gonna make this the same height as my other switch box because I wanna be above my Tao Wayne's cotting with this thermostat and I think it'll look better and more uniform if it's in line with one another. So let me just go off the top of my box here. So that's where we wanna have our top. So let me just make sure that that sits right there. Yeah, that should work. Okay, so that should work. Bringing this out to about here. So we'll knock out one of these holes here. Make this straight to our straight to our floor. It's about 45 and a half. Just use some PVC glue. run this down to the basement as well. All right, so it doesn't get any easier than this. It's like directly to the panel. This never happens. Usually you're rerouting things all the way over. Um, so basically you can use two wires per Romex connector. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do on this one. Um, actually, I'm thinking I'm gonna bring this over onto this side because we already have all these breakers on this side and I wanna run, um, you know, make this kind of even, I guess you could say. So. Looking at this, yeah, it looks like we can put one in each one of these. So let me just get some of this excess off of here. So this is the, the heated flooring. So I'm just gonna use the same Romex connector as this other 20 amp wire. Okay, so let's just make sure we don't get confused. So this is our heat. Let's go ahead and do our heat first. Now, the biggest thing about working in this box is just staying from the back of the panel here. So anywhere the, the breakers are connected, if you touch that and touch a ground or touch the side of the box, you're gonna get shocked. All of these areas here, this is the neutral bars and ground buses, totally safe to touch, not gonna hurt you. So just keep your fingers out of the back of the box and you can always shut off the main breaker and turn all of this off if you don't feel comfortable working on it. But really working on an electrical panel is really not that, um, you know, it's not that, you know, I shouldn't say it's, you know, you have to be cautious, but it's really not that difficult to do live. You just have to be aware of where your hands are and pay attention to what you're doing. All right, so I'll get the sheathing off of here. And this is gonna be a 120 volt system here. So basically you can just find 
two spots for your ground and neutral. Something like that. So all you're doing is looking for an empty spot on your bus. Two empty buses, you can't use just the same bus, you gotta have separate ones. Okay, and then we're gonna be connecting this to a 15 amp circuit. Main reason is, is the uh, power supply for, yeah, 15 amp for the heat isn't gonna go over this. So we're just gonna use a 15 amp breaker okay we're going to keep that off for now because we don't want to have that on all right so then we'll go ahead and do our gfi okay so we're going to use a 20 amp breaker on this for our gfi now you could always put a a 15 amp GFI on a 20 amp circuit, you just can't do the opposite. You can't have a 15 amp line and put and put a 20 amp GFI outlet on there. But we're going to be doing a, a 15 amp GFI up there. So we're going to keep this off as well because I don't want to do that until I get that in there. And now we're lighting circuit. So always pull on your wires, make sure that they're in. That's the biggest problem with any of this stuff is if you didn't have this well tightened. But very simple. Now we got our new power supplies and we're gonna be safe in our bathroom. All right, so a vent fan is probably one of the most important things to upgrade when you're doing a new bathroom um, or any type of bathroom renovation. It's the number one reason why there's mildew and mold in an existing bathroom. And it's something that I really highly recommend anybody doing when they're doing that. So uh, one of my favorite fans, and I seem to install this, I probably installed a hundred of these at this point, is these Panasonic vent fans. I really like them. Um, they're really quiet, they work efficiently, and then you can also adjust the cubic feet per minute of air coming out of it. So if you wanna be a little bit more efficient, you can lower that standard on that. Um, but you know, really, it's just a, it's a really foolproof system. And I usually like just getting just the vent fans um, without the light and then have a light separate to uh, the fan. So we'll get this, go ahead and get this installed. Um, now there's a couple of different ways you can go about venting. It's really important to get this out of your home, get that humid air out. You don't wanna be having this just going into your attic space. You can cause mildew and mold in your attic space as well, which is really not a good um, combination, especially if you're in a newer home, you know, everything's really airtight. And if you have humidity uh, put into a space like that, it can really turn into a moldy mess. So you wanna get it out of your house. There's really three options for you. One, which is probably the best, and that's what we've done in this situation, is put a roof vent. So it goes directly straight up and out of the roof area. That's usually the most efficient way to get the air out. Secondly, you can do a outside gable vent. So basically like a dryer vent style that would go outside of the side of your house. That's probably the second um, best option, but sometimes it doesn't really work with where your bathroom's located. It could be very far distance to get it there. So um, that's not always an option for a lot of people. And then the third option, 
uh, which is re really makes it easy, especially if you're not get demoing everything down to the studs like this, is using a soffit vent, because that's usually typically easy. Usually your bathroom is on an outside wall somewhere, has a window, and you can easily run a soffit vent um, over the wall and, and through that soffit area. So those are your three options, but I would highly recommend the roof route, but you have to be cognitive of how old your roof is and then obviously leaking problems can be an issue. So let's open this up. Now this is a really great fan for retrofit, uh, mainly because of this device here. So this is just a, a bracket that can span in between almost two feet. This is awesome for retrofits because basically this is your cutout for your fan. You basically just cut this out and then put this bracket in the wall. Be sure to check out my video on replacing a vent fan with an existing ceiling. These are really simple to use, but since this is new construction, essentially, we're not gonna need that bracket and we're not gonna need uh, the cutout because we're gonna be putting the drywall up after we get this vent fan in. So this is the nice large um, vent. So again, just having it all nothing but vent, I think is the best way to get all this air out of here quickly and then the actual vent fan itself. So this basically can be modified to go down the three inch if you need a three inch port, but it comes with the four inch and that's what I typically use. So now as far as, um, and one important thing is don't forget to do this, take off the flap on here or, or the tape off the flap so that this is able to be easily moved. But this is a really nice, creates a lot of volume coming out of there. Now this does adjust, which one model is this? This one's 80 to 110. So you can adjust the speed of this from, oh, I'm sorry, it's 110 to 150. So this is the, the bigger model that I got here. This is actually a fairly large bathroom. It's six foot by um, almost 12 feet. Actually, I'm gonna have to see what the, what is this actually? I can't even remember. Oh, so this is basically six by 10. So that's a fairly large bathroom, 60 square feet. Rule of thumb is usually one cubic foot per minute per square foot. So this is gonna definitely basically double that. I'm a big fan of that. I think more air that you can get out, the humidity you can get out of here, the better. So this is gonna be able to range from that uh, 110 to 150. So you're gonna have plenty of volume coming out of here. Um, so the way I'm gonna install this is uh, really pretty much just anchoring this to the existing joist. Uh, I am gonna be furring this down, so I'm gonna add a, a, a furring strip onto this. But pay attention to what model you get because this box is actually fairly deep. This is a uh, seven and a half inch deep box. I only have ceiling joists that are five and a half. So if I were trying, if I had this floor like over here, I wouldn't be able to put that vent fan in over here without furring down the entire ceiling. So pay attention to your existing, there's different models. You wanna make sure that you're, if you have a tight space like this, that you get the smaller box, um, you know. But right now I'm just gonna be basically sticking this right at the edge of my floor. This is gonna keep me outside of my shower area. Uh, you could go directly over the shower area. There's no problem with that. I just like to have my light. I have a recessed light that I like to put above my showers. So I want that centered on the shower. So this will be right outside of the shower area. So we've got 32 inches for the tub and that's basically uh, right to the edge of my fan here. Main reason was is because I did not realize that my joists are gonna be so shallow and that you know I wasn't gonna get this moved over. But regardless, usually within two feet of your shower is, is a good bet for getting that humidity out of there. Okay, then I'm going to put a block right here. So just to show you real quick why this is so nice on the retrofit, if you don't watch that video, it's basically they have just one little screw here anchoring this vent duct. So you just take this off and this will allow you to slide off. Nope, I'm gonna I'm gonna unplug the fan first. So this, in a retrofit area, you stick this up, connect your ductwork and your electrical, and then the box just slides right up. So this is what makes it so nice and easy for a retrofit style, but we're not gonna need to do any of that with this system here. 
go ahead and prep this now before we stick it into the ceiling. I like using these push-in fittings. Okay, so easiest way to make this connection is just to use these Wago clips. So these just levers just come out and you can just stick the wire into the Wago clip, push the lever. The only thing you want to pay attention to is that it's holding it and that you can actually see the braided line in there. These are makes a really nice connection, really simple and kind of foolproof. You know, wire nuts can really easily fall off these stranded lines. So this is really making a nice connection. Pull on and make sure that they're good. I can't tell you how many times a wire nut has not grabbed the stranded line. So this is really makes a lot nicer connection and it really makes it nice and neat. You can just tuck this in nicely. Just because. Okay, so one of the best ways you can vent your vent fan is through a roof vent. I had to put a new pipe flange up for my flange going up for my piping. So at the same time, I'm gonna go ahead and replace the existing vent and put in a roof vent for a ventilation fan. So these things are pretty small. Um, really nothing different than putting it in like a regular pipe cover. It's just a matter of getting on the roof and putting it together. So. This basically just has a little opening here and a flap, okay? So then this basically just connects right into this. Okay, so it's got a little bit of a grate on here. So we just gotta stick this in, making sure that this flap goes over top of the shingles. Most important thing here is making sure this is overlapping the shingle. So you can see how I don't have any shingle here. We're gonna have to go another row before we can put that over top of it. So let's go another row. Okay, so the most important thing here, is just making sure that this overlaps this shingle like that. Now we can go ahead and nail this in place. Okay, so when you're going into a vent fan in a, a um, attic space like this, you wanna get one with the insulation that wraps around the flex duct, and that'll make sure that you don't get any condensation from this. So I'm gonna go ahead and hook this up to my vent here first. So we got a worm drive clamp. Okay, pull on that, make sure that's in good shape. And now we got good flex. So this is perfect because it's only like four foot to the roof line. And as you can see, I have it all insulated. So now there shouldn't be any condensation. Um, biggest problem is usually when the, the summer happens or actually it doesn't really matter. Whenever there's a lot of cold outside or a lot of hot, you can create humidity within this and you can sweat on the corrugated pipe. Now I would recommend only going about six feet, eight feet at the most with a corrugated pipe, just because of the resistance of it. If you go any further than eight foot, you want to use a solid pipe and then, you know, that'll, re that'll reduce the refriction or the friction of the air going out. Oh, 
All right, so ceilings, same thing as the floor. I want to get a nice straight edge on here and make sure that things are level. Uh, these old homes are notorious for being uneven and unlevel. So double check everything. So I'm fine over there, but it looks like back here, um, it's not terrible, but you can see right here, I almost got three quarters of an inch between my uh, side rim joist and where I need to be. So I'm just gonna fur it down. Uh, let me just use a two by four. So we were pretty good over here. So we'll just keep this flush. And then we'll just drop this two by four down to where we need it. Stay right there. Okay, so we're gonna have a basically a wall that we're gonna frame in the tub. So we need to get a couple studs here. So 12 inches going across here. And we need something here. So really eight, eight and 12. All right, so we're gonna do this drywall ceiling and I'm just by myself. So, um, you know, when you do stuff by yourself, you have to kind of set things up so that you're not set up for failure, basically. Uh, what I'm gonna do is put a ledger board up against the wall so that I can have a catcher on the one side of my drywall. And what really helps out, I mean, this is definitely by no means a necessary thing, but getting one of these collatigated, I think that's how you call it, collatigated. I'm not really sure, but these uh, strips of screws that are already on a magazine like this really makes it easy because I could just screw them into place really quickly. Now for ceilings, I would recommend inch and five eighths inch screws and also glue the ceiling as well. This is 16 inches on center, so we're in pretty good shape. If you're on 24s, I definitely would glue it. Um, you wanna get as much strength as you can. Um, I know a lot of trusses and stuff are two foot on center, so if you do that, definitely glue it. Now, if you don't wanna get into the expense of a drywall gun like this, uh, just getting a dimple bit for the end of your uh, regular drill would suffice. You know, and really, if you're only doing seven or eight sheets, you know, a dimple bit's probably the best way to go. Um, so we're gonna do half inch drywall all the way around. Um, I'm gonna get the moisture resistant, so that's why it's gonna be purple. Um, I do think that's a good idea for a bathroom setting. And uh, we basically have everything shimmed out, all level, all ready to go. So all we have to do is glue it, and we're going to rotoscope out our 
vent fan. But first, let me go ahead and put my board on the wall here. This is gonna catch the one side of the drywall. And I'm just gonna leave it down like about an inch and a half or so. Just, you know, I don't wanna have to fight getting that piece of that board in there. So hold, I keep it down. Okay, so we're gonna put some glue on the joist. And all the way around my vent fan too. See that? It's a 36, 36. Okay, so now where these sheets beat, but I like to use this little tool. You can basically just screw this into place. It kind of gives you a little bit of a lippage so that you can easily get your other board up. All right, so one of my favorite lights that I like to put above my showers and my tub surrounds are these halo four inch lights. Really makes it easy. I just run the wire up loose, cut the hole, and then install this. And what's really great about these is that they're flat, they're IC rated, meaning that you can have insulation above them. And uh, they're dimmable. I mean, well, they're dimmable and they're selectable as far as the light color. So it goes from 2700K the 5,000 K. So whatever your flavor is, you should be able to find out in this. I think they're pretty inexpensive, real easy to install, and it can, and it can be done after I hang the drywall. So I just use a hole saw, usually use about a four and an eighth to make these fit well, and then uh, we'll go ahead and show you how to put it in. So so I wanna make this center. So we had 75 opening, so 37 and a half is gonna be our center here somewhere right around here. And then our tub is 32, so we'll just make it a 16. So this will be our center. And what's nice about these halo lights are so thin that, say, see my studs are here and here. If I was if I was two inches away from the edge, I could, I could still get that light fixture in there. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, it's a little tough when it's directly above it because you need to get the box up inside the ceiling but you know, you can even be over about two inches or so and still be able to get that light fixture in the center. 
if you can't do that with a regular can light, it's about impossible. So it's pretty nice. So as you can see, it just has these little flaps that hold it up into place. Pretty simple stuff. And then this is your selector valve. So if, depending on what light flavor you want, I usually keep it up pretty high just because for- uh, I like it on the warmest setting. I know you do, but for the lighting for the camera, it's better on the higher end. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the, it makes it too dim. It makes it too yellow. Like that's 3,700K right there. So yeah, no, 2,700K is what we're gonna keep it on when we when we go sell the place, but we'll get it at 4,000K because the camera, you know, you'll see, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And these are nice because they already have the push-in fittings that you connect it to. So it really makes it nice and easy. Put this on our ground. Okay, I need to just take that box. That's all there is to it. Okay, so with these old homes, it takes a lot of effort to be able to get everything in line with one another. As I mentioned in early tutorials, basically uh, a lot of the old framing doesn't really align itself very well to one another. And that was because they were using plaster and lath. So the plaster they were able to basically apply enough to make a smooth surface and not have to really be concerned about it. But with drywall, uh, with any type of tile work, you want to have your walls as flat as possible. So make sure that you shim everything out to meet. Now in this particular situation, I'm putting these two by fours flat ways on this outside wall, primarily to enclose the area, but also to provide enough insulation behind the water pipes. And then on this wall for the door frame, I need to actually shim this out a little bit more using some half inch plywood so that I can have my drywall meet up with the jam casing on the door evenly make sure you pay attention to that you don't want to have a big gap between your trim and your actual wall so shim every anything out accordingly but we really did need this as we'll state in my next uh, tutorial here we really did need to bring in the walls for the tub so they can meet our tile layout and then uh, yeah we're basically just moving right on to setting some of the drywall uh, once you have everything nice and aligned and flat it really makes this an easy process All right, sometimes when you get into things, you realize there might be a problem with your tile work. This is kind of the stage that you really want to address and pay attention to maybe what your layout's going to be then try to make it look the best that you can. So if you can prepare during the framing stage for things that you might have an issue with with your tile layout, this is the time to do it. So what I mean by that is that we're going to be using six by six tiles and they have a bull nose that is a full six inch tile and what i was intending on doing since we're going to be narrowing in this area i wanted to just have bull nose pieces going all the way up so all the shower wall tile is going to be all the way up and the bull nose would be just 
creating that bump out and then the wainscoting would just be where you want it to be. So the problem is, is that it's six inches and when I was measuring what my finished wall was here, so I got my drywall on this left wall to there is six foot two. So once I frame this in, I'm basically framing in seven inches on either side. That's gonna leave me a sliver. That's gonna look really bad. It's definitely not what I'm looking for. So what I'm gonna do is just buffer out this wall another inch and a half, maybe even an inch, uh, two inches. I might add some half inch um, plywood onto here. But what it's gonna do is it's gonna offset my toilet uh, into a bad position. Not bad, but just I'm gonna have to go with a 10 inch rough in. That's most likely what I'm gonna do. So um, luckily there's options, easy options like that. But once I get this wall completely flush to where I want it, then I'll address this toilet flange. I still have the ceiling open up below. So if I had to, I could try to move this toilet out a little bit to make that work. But they do have options I could go with a 10 inch. But furring this out is gonna be the best option. I really don't want to cut those tiles in half and have a, a basically a grout joint going up to, right up through the middle. We're also doing a half pattern on the, the tiles. So I just don't think it's gonna look good trying to get another grout joint on this front wall. So I'd rather make sure that I have enough room um, than to have to deal with that. Okay, so blocking for light fixtures. Usually side lights are about five foot, something like that. So we're gonna put some blocking here. Okay, so we need to frame this wall in. We shim this out so that we can get a total of six foot from drywall to finished drywall. So now we just need a frame in for our tub and we want 60 inches. So a two by six works perfectly for that. So we're gonna frame two walls. Now I would recommend coming out, since this is gonna be like an outside corner, coming out about an inch and a half past your tub and then you're gonna have drywall. So you'll overall, you'll be about two inches. Now, if you weren't toweling the front face of this, you would work out perfectly because bull nose is usually two inches wide and you would just bring the bull nose straight down alongside the tub. But we're gonna be doing an outside corner. So the bull nose is going on the front, uh, but just, you know, a good rule of thumb is just going an inch and a half for your framing past the edge of your tub. And I'll give you enough room to put waterproofing and stuff down alongside the tub. So we have a 32 inch tub. I'm gonna make this 33 and a half. So I wanna make sure that I stay square with my wall. Uh, so even before you frame these walls, just make sure that your wall is straight and that everything is in line with one another. This would be the time to fix that if there was any issues there. So I'm just gonna use my level here, use my square 
because I don't really have anything back here for reference. And I'm just gonna make sure that it stays square with my wall. And this is gonna be tied up against the wall. Off our back wall, 16 is the center of where our faucet is. And I want to put a small niche on the side. So I want to give myself enough room here so that I have room for my faucet. So I'm going to put another stud here. We'll probably just make our niche like 10 inches wide. So what we'll be doing is I'm going to leave the stud here. And then when we figure out where the placement is, we'll cut this stud. And that'll be like a recessed niche going in here. So. So we're just going to make it 10 inches and that'll give us about six inches of room on either side of that faucet, which is about what I need. So I'm going to put another stud here and then another one here because you want to be having your backer board have 16 inches on center. So I'm going to show you how to install an American Standard Studio Tub. This is one of my favorite acrylic tubs. One of the biggest reasons is there are so many different options and designs that can fit your home. And a lot of them are deep soakers like this one. This is 19 inches deep, so an actual adult can take a bath in this thing. And it's really easy to install. So I'm going to show you step by step of how to go about doing this. Kind of already dry fitted it. Um, now you're going to have to multiple you know multiple times it's going to take to install this thing so this is actually a kind of a treat because we have uh basically my rough in framing as you can see i had to build in each side of the wall this was a six foot wide bathroom so we needed to frame this in so basically i have six inches on this side six inches on that side this kind of really makes it easy because it's really easy to move the tub in and out when you have existing ply or um, drywall or plaster it could be a lot more difficult to get out. Uh, I would advise if you're trying to install this in, in an area where uh, you're trying to keep the outside wall, at least cut out two inches of drywall outside of the um, framing area, because that'll make it easier to actually get this thing tilted into place. But having it in like an alcove situation like this, it's, it's really, it is um, pretty easy. The other thing, is that we're gonna have access down below to hook up the P-trap. If you're a DIYer and you've never done this before, having access is really key. Um, if you're, you know, it's really difficult to do this uh, and, and try to get this set up when you, when you don't have the accessibility to actually hook up the P-trap. But we'll show you a little bit later on how to go about doing that. And, uh, but the first thing is, is just setting this into place 
and getting making sure that it sits level okay so pay attention to your subfloor what you're going to be doing now if you're a little bit on level i mean actually even if you're a lot of on level you can adjust this to to work uh, with your situation because we're going to be using a mortar bed underneath of this so you can add as much mortar as you need to level this out now obviously it'd be a lot easier if you're pretty close to level to begin with but knowing that putting your level on the floor and making sure that things are level is really going to help guide you through on on installing this it's going to let you know what you have to do to address it now floor leveler is also a great idea if you have the time to, to set that up putting floor level or dying making everything 100 percent flat is just going to make this so much easier um, in my situation i am a little bit off <laughs> i did put some new framing down but i am uh, slightly off i'm a little bit high on this side from uh, the left side here which uh you know hey it's it's not too bad when it's a tub and you have a little bit of drainage that way but we're going to have this we're going to set this uh completely level so that it's easier for our towel work and everything else. Now, if you're doing a surround on top of this, like a, an acrylic surround, you're really gonna want this tub to be level. It really gets very difficult to install any of those tub surrounds. If you're even a quarter inch out, it makes it very difficult. But um, tile, there's definitely some wiggle room there. In some ways, tiling a tub surround can make it a little bit easier for unlevelness and unevenness. So, all right, so we're, we're basically level here. And what I'm going to do is just mark my studs here. So this is going to ba basically allow me to uh, measure down. So for, because you want to put a ledger board all the way around. So we also want to check this way, make sure that this is level. Yeah, so. Okay. And then just to let you know, I basically framed this in and I left myself an eighth inch on either side. So there is a little bit of a gap that just makes it a little bit easier to install. So if you make the, the, your rough and opening 60 and a quarter inches, it usually works out pretty well because ultimately my backer board is just going to be sitting right on top of this tub lip. So it, um, you know, having that eighth inch gap on either side makes it a lot easier to be able to, uh, get this tub in place. All right. So we got our, 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 uh, or, you know what, also we want to mark our floor too. So let's just mark our trap in here. Don't be afraid to walk up here and do it. It's not a bad idea to walk up and, and mark this. Now we already know the dimensions of what we need to cut out, but at least we have some good reference of where that drain is. So just to show you the bottom of this tub, you can see it has a couple of plywood ledgers here at the bottom so we're going to be putting mortar all within this cavity area it has a pretty durable fiberglass base uh, so that's really nice and what i really like is that the actual flange is all bonded to this whole mechanism here a lot of these tubs these acrylic tubs this kind of just flaps around and it's not a really good um, you know some of those manufacturers i don't know what they it's, it's, you know, you're better off to have it all basically fiberglass reinforced like this than having your tub flange flap around. So I really like the construction of that. Everything's fairly, you know, a thick construction. So before, so we're gonna basically set up our ledger board first. Okay, so we got basically, now one thing about ledger boards is that, you know, the bottom of these tubs are never 100% even all the way through. So um, just try to estimate the best you can. And you're probably gonna have to adjust that ledger board to fit. So we've got about an inch and a half uh, that we basically, the thickness of this flange. So that's what we're gonna use as reference to bring our ledger board on that wall. Okay, you definitely wanna use screws for this just because you're gonna wanna adjust this. So let's mark this down an inch and a half. So I got just two screws in there. I'm gonna dry fit the tub again. Now I do have some shims here because this, like I said, we're a little bit low on this side. So I'm gonna use that. Okay, so we're right up to the line. And you just wanna feel down around that flange 
and see how that feels. Um, now we, we should be pretty level with the Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, probably go up a little bit more here. Yeah. So we'll raise that ledger just slightly. This is a process, so you're going to have to take this out a couple of times. That'll work. Okay, so then we also want to get some ledgers on the side here. So this definitely still has to be raised up, but that'll be all right. We'll get that with the, the side pieces here from here. So marking the edge of my tub here, let's mark this and we'll mark this. Yeah, so we've got 30 inches. All right, so for this, we wanna put a ledger board on the back and this side. So we're gonna come out 30 inches. So we're gonna end our board right here. So. This is the part that I change a little bit because I always like to put my overflow in uh, before I set the tub. And if you bring this ledger board all the way across, it's really kind of problematic. So I'm just gonna get some two pieces. I'll make one 10 inches. Actually, we'll just make them both 10 inches and then it will have enough space so that, that um, you know, the overflow from my tub doesn't interfere with it. Okay, so that leaves us a room for our overflow, which is about 16 inches. So plenty of space there, and we still got the support of this. So now for this guy, for our drain, basically need to be 12 and three quarter. And then our center is um, basically 16. So we wanna give ourselves like, you know, about four and a half inches on either side. So like a nine inch hole. So we're gonna basically cut this right here out for a drain. So we might as well do that now so that when we dry fit it again, we can make sure that that's gonna work. That might need notched out, but we'll have to see once we dry fit it. So I had a feeling it was gonna be we should be 18 inches or um, oh, what was that? Nine inches. So this probably won't interfere. We'll see it once we uh, actually go to set in the or the tub again. So we do have a little bit of a gap here. About just a half inch here. That is level. I, you know, I didn't check the subfloor this way, but looking at my drain. So it looks like we have plenty of room here. We almost got two inches here down to that. So I think we're going to be fine. The only thing I wanted to double check was my floor. Because now that now we're 100% level all the way around. Those ledgers really make it easy. So now all you have to do is just apply some uh, mortar to support the base and you'll be good to go so it's really that easy so let me uh let me just double check my subfloor on there because this is all tight now but i am kind of raised up here half inch not a big deal because i'm honestly by the time i've done floor leveling my um my heated flooring system that's going to work out just fine but let me just double check that Yeah, we are showing on levelness. Here, come over here. So you can see here, 
I am about a half inch off. So to make this level, that is about right. So it's sitting back here, not up here. Not a big deal. I'll just more, put in enough mortar underneath of there to work just fine. So you can overcome unleveling this pretty easily. All right, so we're gonna install the drain assembly before we set this in place. So if you're doing this by yourself, this really helps out because then you're not trying to reach around the tub and connect the drain assembly or the drain assembly while you're doing this. So, um, and then if you're if you don't have access, you almost in some ways need to install the drain assembly before setting it in place. But it's definitely a, a good advantage to be able to do this. So we're gonna go ahead and add this drain assembly. Now, when you purchase a tub like this, always go with the recommended. Um, you know, the recommended drain assembly for it. This one is the American Standard Drain Assembly. So it could fit various different size tubs, so we're gonna have to cut some of this down. But they all kind of virtually work the same in a lot of ways. So we'll just uh, go ahead and connect this. So it's got the tail piece. There's a threaded part for that. In fact, we'll just leave this out. That actually doesn't really need to be in there right now. All right, so we got, I always use clear silicone for this. So just 100% silicone. Okay, so drain assembly. A rubber gasket for the bottom of your tub. And then Got the drain assembly piece. So this is a pop-up drain. So it just pops up. I find them to be the easiest uh, to install because you're not having any type of mechanism that you have to connect to this. So this is our T. Okay, so apply a generous bead of silicone on the actual bottom of the drain. This is gonna give us some good insurance. We got a rubber gasket. So then I also put the silicone on the bottom of the tail piece. Again, this is just extra insurance. It's not probably necessary with the rubber gasket, but then on the actual drain assembly, put another nice quarter inch bead of silicone around the actual drain piece. Okay, then we'll just put a bead here on our tub and we'll be able to clean off any excess silicone, so be generous with it. Okay, then this is our tail piece. So you really wanna see that silicone kind of oozing out around that. I don't know if you can even see any of it, huh? Okay, so we got a rubber gasket on there. And now we'll just thread this on. And I have this little tool here, this rigid tool, allow me to connect the string. Now the one thing about this, you don't want to you don't want to over tighten it to where you're getting that rubber gasket to squeeze out or anything, because it's it's real easy to squeeze that gasket out from underneath of there, but then just smear the rest of that silicone and that should be a good connection. Okay, so keep in mind, if you need to get this tail piece over one way or the other, it's not like this has to be a completely perpendicular with the tub. It's not a big, a big deal if you twist your drain side to side in order to get your pipe to connect to it. Now we have access down below, so we'll be able to adjust it to what we need with the actual P-trap. But if you had some movement and you needed to move it this way, there's no problem having this slanted. The only problem you're gonna have is trying to connect your overflow. And you can always get a couple 45 degree bends to do that. So if you're in a jam, you know, you can tilt this to the, to the left or right and get this to connect. It's more important to get the drain connection and then you can connect your overflow later on. Now, you're not gonna have all the components to refinangle that. You're gonna have to buy some you know, new fittings to 
connect it at an offset, but it is an option. All right, so then these are just <clears throat> basically slip fittings. So we've got our locking nut and then our slip fitting. Always have the, it's just, just like a regular P-trap, so the beveled tapered edge always goes towards the fitting. So yeah, you put the nut on first and then your uh, fitting. Okay, so then we're also gonna have to dry fit this because now this is really long because it, they, they have it for multiple different sizes. So inside this package is the overflow assembly. And here you'll find, this is the actual cover, but then the rubber gasket that you wanna be installing on this overflow. Okay, so hold on to those screws afterwards. But this guy basically goes on around this gasket. And then when I go to set this, this, is, uh, this other rubber gasket goes on the inside. Okay, so overflows are just as important as the actual drain assembly itself, because obviously if you overflow the tub, you know, you need to make sure that it's gonna drain. So don't skimp out on the overflow. You know, you have to really test everything when you fill this up. So we'll just mark this so that we're in the middle of this fitting so that we're not struggling to get it together. So we're gonna have to cut this little bit amount off. Let's use the old fashioned saws all here. So same thing here, I would apply silicone on the back of the tub here so that this can have a nice solid connection. We wanna get our slip nut on this overflow and our locking flange here. set okay so I have flows nice and connected now it's all oozing out around the back here. That's good because, you know, again, the overflow is just as important as the real drain. And we'll just tighten this. And these just get hand tightened. Okay, so that's connected. Good cloth to wipe off the excess silicone. Okay, just to, probably not a bad idea just to make sure that this overflow and everything's gonna go in all right before I mix the mortar. Let's go ahead and just drive hit this again, make sure that we can get this in okay. Yeah, this is slightly holding that up. All right, so that is slightly holding that up on our, yep. I'm gonna go downstairs and mark that. Yep. All right, so this is notching out a little bit. I gotta notch this a little bit. Nothing wrong with notching an inch or so off of your joist just to get that plumbing to work here. You just don't wanna go more than one third of the span of the um, actual structure. So it's, um, you know, it's all within reason. So we're gonna cut notch a little bit of this out. All right, so for reinforcing this tub, we're gonna use a little bit of 
mortar mix. This is just a regular mason mix. You can really use any type of mortar mix. I just refrain from using anything with an aggregate because you want to make this so that you can actually set the tub in and don't fight any of the you know stones that might be in it. So just a standard mortar mix is all you need. So we're going to mix this full bag because we are trying to level this out a little bit. So having a little bit of stiffness to it, like a mortar, uh, like a brick mortar, I'd say, is uh, probably pretty good. So go ahead and mix this. Okay, so to protect the plywood, now, I mean, this is uh, kind of a gray area. It, it's not really um, a really big deal to just set the mortar directly onto the plywood. But if you want to protect it, it wouldn't be bad just to use a little trash bag and then put that down so then the mortar doesn't bond to the actual concrete. So I'm just going to set this down because we're really not, I mean, we're setting it and we're reinforcing the tub. We're not actually like setting like a mud bed for a shower or anything. This is just literally for support. So you can just use, you know, just a regular garbage bag like this and then just staple that in place. You can apply the mortar over top of it. So we kind of want to keep this in the center. Something like that. So that's where the main support right here is. So this is what you want to basically fill in. So this bucket mortar mixer is really helpful for mixing concrete, mortar, anything like that. A regular mixing paddle just always makes it too loose. So this is definitely worth its weight in gold here. I use it for all types of concrete mixes allows you to get things a little bit thicker so you can set them easily. Okay, so this is just one additional little tip to be able to set your, your tub and eliminate any squeaking. And that is to just use a little bit of silicone right on top of your ledger board. This kind of helps secure everything together, holds everything together, and then really kind of prevents any of that squeaking if, if anything was rubbing between the flange and this board. So just Coat that with a generous amount of silicone. Okay, so then hopefully this is the final installation here. I'm gonna hurt to step on it at this point because I'm trying to get it embedded into the cement. Okay, so that should work out good. So we wanna pre-drill some holes on here. Okay, so there's two ways to go about mounting this. And one would be to get some fender washers. So you put the screw up above it and then the fender washer would pinch the side of the tub or you could just simply drill through this and add a screw either way is acceptable it's just whether you want to puncture the side of your flange or not and then obviously don't be tensioning it too much or you'll end up
Okay, so we're gonna make the connection. This is really the ultimate way to go, is having some kind of hole and access underneath your tub if you don't have the back access to the tub. Even if, um, you know, I really do highly recommend being able to get underneath this trap. It makes it so much easier to connect it and then to ensure that there isn't any leaks. So this is the little tail piece that came with the drain. So I would just advise putting a little bit of silicone on this. This is kind of notorious thing to go to leak on you is where this threads into this existing pipe. There's a couple different fittings that you can use onto here. Obviously this is a, a male thread here that you can use, but we're just gonna use this existing tail piece <clears throat> for this. And that silicone just is gonna help make sure that those threads don't leak. You could use Teflon tape or even, you know, pipe sealant as well. All right, let me grab my All right, so then it's just a matter of finding what's gonna work. So what we have here is just a regular solvent weld P-trap. So this is gonna get glued in. And then I'm gonna have a little short piece of uh, PVC here. Now this is just a slip fitting inch and a half that will slide onto here. So let's just take a look at what this will look like. So you usually wanna put your P-trap on this way and just see what this is gonna do. So it looks like I need to take, that's actually gonna fit pretty well. I actually didn't even, didn't even plan that one as far as the distance, that worked out pretty well. So I need to cut this down a little bit, this riser pipe, so that I have enough room to connect this. So just looking at this, yeah, we're pretty much gonna be, I could pretty much go fitting the fitting here and work out fine. So that's what I'm gonna do. So we'll just get it like a, what is that? It's a two and a half inch piece. Not really, about an inch. We'll go with like a two inch piece. So we'll do that. We got plenty of glue on everything. And so we're going to kind of do this simultaneously. for a couple seconds. Make sure your things are tight. That's all there is to it. So as you can see, a lot, lot easier when you have full access below, because now you really, you know, it's really kind of foolproof and you can really make sure that you're getting a great connection to everything. So we're good to go on that. We'll be hooking up the faucet next and then testing everything, make sure that the overflow is leak free and then obviously uh, the main drain to the top. Okay, so we're gonna install a shower faucet. I get a lot of questions about how to get a tub and shower faucet with a handheld. Um, a lot of the apparatuses that hook to a regular shower head aren't ideal. They're usually kind of dangle down in front of you. That they're all made of plastic and they kind of fall apart over time. So I'm gonna show you a valve system that's really awesome that comes with everything, the rain shower head, handheld, and then we also have the tub port as well. So this is a great way to be able to get all these functions in your new bathroom. And then it has a lever that will be able to just divert everything to each portion of it. But uh, gold is back, so we're gonna be installing a gold uh, flavored looking trim system as well. So this is made by um, Some Rain. So this is uh, basically an Amazon faucet that you can purchase. Uh, if you go to my store, you can find all the information of the, the list that I, of the items that I use along with the tools that I used to install this. 
but for right now all of this trim is going to be set later on uh, for right now we're just doing we're in the rough in stage obviously I don't have anything finished here but this is the rough in valve so this is a really simple installation because all it is is half inch male adapters that you thread into each port so basically there's it's dedicated for a mixing port for your handheld mixing port for your shower head and then this will be your um, tub spout coming down hot and cold so very very simple it's all contained in one single box and what's really great about this is that i'm going to be able to waterproof very nicely around this box so that you're not only you're not relying on the escutcheon plate that you're, you're actually everything's going to be waterproof up to this box so the first thing you have to do is establish the depth of your wall so most of the time uh, most tile is between a quarter inch and three eighths of an inch thick and then you have your thin set later which your thin set will vary depending on the size of tile that you install and the method and any unevenness that you might have so there's a variance on the actual box so it's not like you have to know your thin set layer or know everything uh, completely just try to reach for the middle of your box here so there's a couple of grooves on the side of the box if you stay in the middle of that you're going to be good but i'm going to account for one inch with my backer board and tile i'm going to be doing six by six tile they're only a quarter inch thick and that doesn't really have a huge thin set layer usually about an eighth of an inch or so but i'm going to give myself an inch just to give myself a little bit extra room so the blocking that you want to install for this is you know typically a two by six works out great we're going to center this off my back wall because I want to center it above my drain. And really the height of this can be whatever you really want. It, there really isn't a, a right or wrong, but we are going to be putting a recessed niche probably somewhere within this vicinity. So I'm going to probably hold my valve down a little bit lower, especially if you're taking a tub, you want to be able to grab that without having to stand up. So we're going to make this approximately uh, 16 to 18 inches. We'll make, go make it a little bit higher. I don't have it nailed yet. So we'll go, yeah, we'll go 17 inches. So like I said, it could be whatever you want. If you're doing a walk up, walk in shower, you might want to make this around 48 inches, but this is going to work well here. Now, looking at the, the depth of this, you're trying to aim for the middle of this with your complete finished wall. So basically one inch of tile and backer board, putting that in the center. Basically, you're gonna be two inches back from the face of your uh, rough in framing. So if you had a two by four wall, you could just stick that piece of uh, wood blocking right up against the back of the wall and you'll be at the right depth. I have a two by six wall, so I have to make sure that I'm back far enough. So let's just make sure this is two inches on either side here. That's two inches. Like I said, if you had a regular two by four wall, it even makes it easier because all you do is stick it right to the back of the wall and you're in good shape. We're gonna prep our valve first. So let's just take a look at where we're at with this back wall to center. So this has an up indicator. You wanna make sure that this is sitting up. So 16, so we got plenty of room. We can just make, basically put in our male fittings around here and be able to angle everything up for our packs. So let me go ahead and prep these. So if you were in a pinch, you could use a fitting like this with a male adapter with a 90. This will get you tighter to the wall, you know, if you were, if you were tight in any way. But we don't need this. We're gonna be able to just use regular straight half inch male adapters. So you wanna prep these before you insert them it's important to use some Teflon tape. You want to keep your Teflon tape pretty flat and you want to go counterclockwise with, or clockwise with, I'm sorry, clockwise with the rotation. Because basically when you thread this in clockwise, you want it to go with the actual thread. I like to use a little bit of pipe sealant. Just put that over top of the Teflon tape about three to four revolutions on the Teflon tape. And then you can just thread this in. Clockwise with rotation. 
four to five revolutions of a Teflon tape. A little bit of the pipe sealant. So what's nice about this is that you don't have to solder anything. This is all gonna be done with PEX. So unless you're adapting from your existing copper, uh, which we ran all brand new PEX up to this bathroom. So everything is PEX. So there's really no soldering needed for any of this, which just kind of, you know, makes it easier and definitely faster, no question about it. But yeah, if you don't put this pipe sealant, especially on these type of valves, you can have some problems. So the sealant is actually a pretty important part of this. Um, I get, a, you see a lot of the comments in the reviews of this of where they couldn't get the, the fittings to not leak. So, you know, the Teflon tape and this sealant is important. So this is a one rare instance where I can use this for my tub spout as well because of the diverter being within here. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, it's not one of those pull up type of tub spouts. This is basically going to be all used from the diverter. So there's no worries about, you know, any type of backflow. Okay, so now that I got them all together, now I can go ahead and tighten them up. Okay. Okay, so just go ahead and wipe off any of this excess pipe sealant. It can get kind of messy with that stuff. So I'm just going to clean that off. Okay. So then this is going here. So we just want to basically put some nineties on this for, you know, the connection to our water supply and then the connection to our handheld. So the type of PEX I like to use is the PEX B. I like using these crimp rings. So these little crimp rings have these little sleeves on them. What's great about these is that when you slide these on, if you were to pull this cap off, it's basically holding this at the right location for crimping. Otherwise, you're constantly trying to keep this at the right place when you're crimping, and you really just wanna have a 16th inch reveal around that. So that's what these Pro Crimps do. Really easy to use, um, just speeds up the process. These little tubing cutters help you get some nice square cuts too. Basically you gotta crimp on either one and then make sure you're on the cold supply for the cold. And I like to use my rigid crimpers to try to stay square with the fitting. That's all it is, it's just a pinch. And then just to double check things, there's a no go go gauge. So if this, the go side fits over there, then you crimped it properly. So it's always good to check that. And then let's just make sure I didn't, I should have probably checked that before I did this, but we want to be 16. So yeah, I have enough room there. I'm good to go. All right, so a port for our handheld. Yeah, I'm gonna go over here. We'll just let that extend up. That's not a problem. We'll just do that. So the, unfortunately the output of this is only on the right side, which it does work out a lot of times when you have your tub drain on the left. <clears throat> a lot of times people like to have their hand held in that corner over here. But uh, in this instance, I'm having a recessed niche. So I'm putting the hand held on this side. This two by six is just a little too short for this. I'm gonna grab another block. That's a little bit easier. Now I got blocking all the way across there. Okay, 
basically a drop ear elbow, a half inch male fitting or female fitting. So we'll get that on here. Okay, so now for blocking for this, I usually go about 84 inches. All right, well, off the bottom of the tub, we'll go 82. Um, you know, because we, it's a rain shower head and you know, people are getting taller these days. So we'll get a block up here. And this one for the, the blocking for, this is a standard shower uh, arm. So, you know, if you're even in the wall, if you like a lot of times I'll just bring these for the shower port, even with my rough end framing. So having this port at the end of my port, even with it, and then I've, that'll bring this in about an inch into the wall. So you have all the variants in the world here, because even if I was like three inches in, I could still grab that port. You just don't want to be too far out or you won't be able to have the discussion plate cover these threads. So, so just keep that in mind when you're putting this together. So this, I'll leave about an inch into the wall. Okay, so you can see this is about even with the edge of my studs. And again, if you were a little bit further in, not a big deal on this particular shower head, but some of them do require you to be pretty accurate with the distance, but this one is not that case. So pay attention to the model that you have. You might have the same scenario, but what, what I'm gonna be doing on the handheld is probably what you might have to do with the shower port. This hangs down. I don't want this dragging on the tub. I just don't think it looks good. So we'll bring this up, maybe about here. 32 inches off the tub deck for our port. I also want this to be inside the tub as well. So, so this is gonna work. So this all connects together. This is actually a little bit unusual. I don't really usually see the same connector holding it. Usually you have a separate arm for this, but in this instance, it's all one. So. As long as I can, uh, I think that'll look great just fine, just right there. You have to pay attention to the, the specific model you have. And this one here, you're only gonna get this guy. Best thing to do is just to dry fit your dry, drop your elbow and just, you know, make it fairly snug. You don't wanna tighten it where you can't get it off. My recommendation is to get a three, keep this back of my drop your elbow three quarters of an inch behind my rough end framing because then once I'm done with my tile, I'll be able to be even with that tile. Now, if it's too far back, you'll be able to, you could, you could cut the tile to allow this entire port to go further into the wall. And then they also make extensions that you can bring onto this. But this is the only part of this whole system that is really cumbersome because it has to be pretty accurate. If you're not at the right distance, then you're not gonna be able to thread this in properly. So. Uh, I wish they had a better, you know, a, a adjustability of the depth, but they really don't. And it really is on, on the scenario of your specific finished wall. So half inch is about all this is going to stick out of here. So you want to just a, a, a adjust that to make that fit. But in my instance, I'm just going to keep my blocking three quarters of an inch back from the front of my framing and I'll be in good shape. I'm going to use this as a reference for my three quarter inch thickness. And I'm just going to put that blocking three quarter inch below behind my rough end framing. And we're going to keep this about three inches off the floor or off the dub tub deck, I should say. So three inches is where we're going to stick this. Or wherever, wherever really actually honestly looks good. Let me take a look at this. Maybe it'll be a little bit higher just because of the way this nozzle comes down. Four and a half, what do you think? Yeah. All right, so five and a half inches. There's a, quite a variance there. So looking at this, I wanna bring this out. This is probably gonna be close to the same. One inch, so that's about right. So we've got a half inch our blocking's a half inch behind our rough end framing on this one. Okay, 
Okay, so to get water in here during the process, we're just gonna put like a hose bib on here so that we can test everything. And we got, I got some little caps that I kind of reuse for most of my jobs here. Half inch caps, you can see I have thin set all over them from all the jobs. Okay, so it's really important to fill up your tub to test this overflow. Let this drain like a normal drain and check to make sure that there isn't any leaks. The overflow, like I said, is just as important as the main drain. If it overflows, you wanna make sure that it's, uh, it's not gonna be leaking. Um, so yeah, we'll go downstairs, make sure that everything's good. Okay, so we're draining it out. We had the overflow running, just checking everything, making sure that there isn't any water visible anywhere and that everything is not leaking. That's basically what you're looking for. So filling up that tub, making sure that overflow is good, really, good insurance to make sure that you, um, you know, you're gonna have a sound installation. All right, so when it comes to membranes, there's really, uh, there's a bunch of different systems out there. I mean, every manufacturer can sell it. You got Laticrete, you got Schluter, which is probably the big dog on it. Um, the Guru system, which is what I'm gonna be installing today. And many, many other types of forms of this. And they all pretty much set the same way. You're basically thin setting them into place. Biggest thing is it's just waterproofing that shower surround behind the tile. That's what's gonna keep your shower lasting a very long time is eliminating any of that water that comes behind the tile and the grout, which it will. It'll definitely eventually get behind there. That's why you need the waterproof. I'm gonna show you a bunch of tips on making sure that you install your membrane properly. Okay, so we're gonna be just above the tub flange. So this drywall is resting on top of the tub flange. And that's really the easiest way to go, especially with drywall. You don't want to be furring anything out and allowing this to go over the tub deck. You really want to have a waterproofing between the flange and the actual drywall. So set your drywall above the tub flange. So what we're gonna do is use Schluter's all set. So I don't know if that's a, uh, a curse to Guru or not, but I really, <laughs> Schluter all set, in my experience, because I've, do, I've done a lot of Schluter showers and I've found that their thin set really does seem to have a really great mixture and bond for their fleece, for membranes. So I really do like using that on all my membranes. I just buy a bag of all, a Schluter all set because it does seem to be superior in a lot of ways. Um, biggest thing about the thin set though, you know, modified thin set over drywall. Biggest thing about it is making sure that you mix this to a wet ratio. So pay attention to the actual bag of the product you're buying, mix it to the wettest ratio. All right, so we're gonna go four quarts, do a half bag. I really don't think I'll need more than that. Hopefully I don't. 
but we can always mix up more later. I just know that one, a full bag is definitely going to be too much. Okay, so I'm going to use the cola mixer. If you guys are towel contractors out there, I highly recommend this mixer. It's really amazing. It really works well. I mean, you might not think there's much of a difference between mixers, but once you use one of these, it really, it is amazing how much better it can actually do the job. So we're gonna have to mix this approximately three minutes. So if you guys are watching this later on, speed through this because it's a little bit boring here. Okay, so we're gonna let that slack for about two minutes or five minutes and mix it up for another two minutes. So what we're gonna be using is an eighth by eighth inch square notch trowel. This is actually the Schluter Curdy trowel is what this is. Very small amount, it doesn't really take a lot of thin set. So that's why half a bag is probably gonna do this. So you can see how droopy it is. This is not really, I would not tile with that. So this is definitely watered down and that's what you want. You want it to be the thinnest ratio that the manufacturer allows so that, that you have a good bond with this. So, all right, so we're gonna probably cut a little bit of this out because I don't need this extending all the way up. This is primarily just to wrap around the corner. What I'm gonna do is pull this back a little bit. And so this is the sealant that it comes with. This is a adhesive, basically a waterproof adhesive. And let me just cut out the excess here. And then anything that you get actually get on the tub, you can get it off later. It's just, in some ways it's gonna be a little bit easier to do that later. All right, so we'll do the same thing on this side. Embed this right into that sealant. I'm not wrap our membrane. So then if you had any excess membrane, you can always cut that out and remove any of that excess. But I'm gonna leave that the way that it is. And when I go to the tile, and if I see any of this membrane sticking outside of the tile, I'll just cut it off. Just keep this as flat as you can so that you don't have any issues with your tile. All right, so first step is to wet down the drywall. And this is basically essentially keep that thin set from uh, zapping the moisture out of it. So just take the flat side of your trowel embed the thin set into the substrate and then I'm going to do directional troweling and then over the existing membrane as well and we're going to wipe it wipe any of the thin set off of the actual tub flange so as you can notice my tile or my substrate is even with my tub flange it all depends on what tub you're actually installing some of them are going to be indented more the Kohler tub kind of lines right up with it but the board is sitting above the tub flange and then we're going to be bringing that membrane down over top of it so we're going to adhere to the tub flange we're going to adhere with the sealant so we don't want to have any thin set there so you want to move remove any thin set from that area and let's go ahead and do this back area okay so this is the guru sealant I'm just gonna apply a big bead here right along the edge of my tub so bonding of the fleece so we're gonna wrap this around that corner and we're just gonna try to maintain visual of our laser here. It'll help kind of guide us. Okay, so biggest thing here is trying to get this in this corner as tight as possible. Okay, 
it. So we're going to get this nice and tight with our bottom here. Try to eliminate any of the air bubbles. So before I start moving along here, I want to just tuck this into this corner with my, with my knife. check this so not bad I just have my outside corner yeah see that I like that see that looks pretty good right there see all that that's all kind of coming out like that this does not look like enough to me so I want to get more thin set on this area and again it's not gonna hurt to pull this stuff off of here so there that's good coverage there it really is primarily right in this area for some reason. So maybe it's skinned over a little bit. doesn't really matter, but it's not gonna hurt to pull this off. Yeah, much, much better. That's what you wanna see. Now, I, again, I do have this corner I had a feeling that was gonna be a problem right here. So we'll get more thin set all the way along this corner and then we'll get more on this outside flange. I try to make the drywall as square as possible so that I can eliminate an issue there. Let me cut this. All right, so now we got this one. Let's check that. That's not bad. Again, I'm a little, a little shy here at the bottom. So I'm gonna get a little bit more there. That all looks good. You know, you can see nothing but white. That's acceptable, but I really prefer to have a little bit more on there. I'm, I'm, I do the same thing on Ditra too, you know. It's definitely worth the effort to check that coverage. So just chase these air bubbles out of here. I definitely have enough thin set now. You see that kind of oozing out of there. Moving on. Let's get this membrane. Out past. Like I said, the valve seal is gonna cover a lot of this, so I don't have to be super tight around the pipe. Around this valve seal, trying to cut this out so I can get a little bit closer to the actual box. All right, so you got that set. There's no doubt. That doing membranes is absolutely a messy endeavor. And, uh, you know, this is one thing that I dislike about the membrane application is applying all this thin set. And I think a lot of, a lot of people would dislike that. So, you know, it's, it's a great way to go, but it's also just kind of a messy process ultimately. And I know I'm not making it look any less messy because I'm always a mess doing this stuff. Uh, but it's just kind of the nature of the, you're applying this much thin set onto something and you got all these features that go around. You're trying to keep it flat. Definitely trying to get everywhere. I'm trying to get this as tight as possible. All right, not bad, not bad. So push that into there. You're gonna see it ooze out of that bottom.
Here they do sell a valve trim, but obviously that's not gonna work here. Uh, works great for most other valves like Delta or Moen. But I'm gonna, since I kind of miscut here, it's very flexible. I mean, you miscut, not a big deal. Just have to add a, another little chunk. Two inch overlap as we go for Schluter or the Guru system. Basically same concept, just overlap it by two inches over your, your miscut or whatever. Now it does bump it out. I mean, there's nothing you're gonna be able to do about that, but you'll be able to overcome that with your towel work. So this is like a really important area if you ask me. It's right around your pipe for your tub spout. It's like a notorious spot to have a problem. So I would definitely seal this area because then, because most tub spouts don't have any type of excussion plate on it that actually seals it. So you're relying on your pipe to be sealed. Same thing with the port for a handheld. I'd say it's probably the number two priority is to get a pipe seal around here. The, the, uh, the shower head, I don't really find it to be as important because like what water is really gonna get above that and behind it. Whereas the shower port, this handheld, is definitely gonna be pen having water penetration on it. So definitely get a pipe seal around this. Schluter Guru. Both about the same mill thickness, I'd have to say. I'd have to actually look on the box to see if it is. Definitely feels the same. This is a little bit more um, rigid, I guess you could say. It feels like it has a, a more of a film on it. And this is more fleecy. So this is a little bit more flexible. But both are pretty, pretty dang comparable. I mean, if you could, if a fleecy was a word, this is a little bit more fleecy than a schluter. But let's just do a quick test, see which one you're actually gonna get more coverage on. Let's stick on the, the schluter. Let's just bed both of these on here. So make sure you trowel it to make sure it's well bonded. You know, I have to say it is easier. It doesn't seem like this has as many wrinkles to it because of the kind of the thicker consistency of this. It's kind of like you don't get the air bubbles. I was having a lot of air bubbles underneath the, the Guru. So this does seem to be easier to get flat, but that could be just the guy who's doing it. <laughs> but regardless, let's just take a look. So first let's just do Guru because that's what I'm doing here. All right, so that's pretty good coverage. Everything's white. I like that suctioning off there. You know, I, I would go with this all day long. I feel pretty comfortable with that. So that seems like a lot of thin set. And let's just pull out Schluter. So you can same, see the same consistency here. So look, this is what I kind of thought the Guru system, to me, this looks like a more uniform coverage because of all the fleece that's on this. You can, it feels like it's, you know, adhering better. Like I would feel like if this was wallpaper or something, that this would be the one that sits better than this one. This is acceptable coverage. I mean, I am getting coverage here. It's just, it's not as, kind of suctioned on here. So you can take that what it is. I'm not saying that either one is better than the other. 
to me, it just seems like you're getting a little bit better coverage with the Guru system, but uh, you know, either one are, are really great systems. So I'm not trying to say anything bad about either one, but you know, like I said, this one is a little bit, it's like, it's like flimsier in a way when it has thin set on it, where this is still like rigid. So this one kind of crinkles up a little bit more easily and you can get air bubbles under there. So air bubbles means that you're not getting a good bond. So I don't know, I think, uh, you know, you could be the judge of that. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think. I don't really have as many things to go around. I don't have the tub to worry about. But just so you know that if you were to do this on a floor, you know, if you were to use this membrane on a floor, they would actually want you to use the sealant in between the layers. But on a wall, it's not as important because you don't really have any gravity or any hydraulic pressure pushing up the joint. So just know that if you did this on a floor, you would want the actual sealant to be on there. Much easier when you don't have the tub to have to deal with here, that's for sure. pipe seal for the shower head. Now, again, this is something that, that you might consider overkill, you know, and honestly, exactly how is water going to get that high? I don't know, but you know, they encapsulate the whole system. You might as well use it. That covers up my ugly cut anyways. That's one benefit of this type of box. Now that's completely waterproof around there. And you're not really relying on the uh, excursion plate, which is something you want to do on these type of valves. This is, uh, this is one of those Amazon valves. And those excursion plates do not do all that well with sealing to the tile. So you almost have to make sure that you have waterproofing like this around here so that it, it's, it's waterproof, so you don't have to worry about water getting in and around that discussion plate. All right, so I'm gonna install a heated flooring system that is really affordable and I think you'll really love. This is gonna be something that you can save a little bit of money on uh, when you're doing your bathroom remodel because a lot of these systems are pretty much basically the same, that just the, the cost variance can be wildly different. And if you're gonna think about doing a wow factor for your bathroom, if you wanted to you know, get that really nice vanity or get that uh, rain shower head, I really think putting heated flooring in is definitely something you don't want to miss out on. Um, I would definitely go for this first because you're putting this underneath the tile and you can't do it later. You could always upgrade the vanity, get a, those light, nicer light fixtures that you might like, but having the heated flooring in your tile is going to be, you know, the time is now when you get started. So I'm going to show you a bunch of tips on how to do this. It's really easy and uh, yeah, you're going to save a lot of money doing this yourself. Okay, so first thing you do is you need a multimeter, okay? And you wanna put this on the 200 ohm reading. You can see that, okay. So put it on that setting, cause that will give you the readings that you need to look on there. So 
on the roll before you even take it off. Don't even take the cellophane off of it. There's always a white tag on this thing, okay? And what it's gonna give you is a couple indications as far as the resistance range. It'll give you a range. So this one, and this all depends on the size of roll that you have, uh, so they, they vary. But this one says between 22 and 48 ohms. So that's what I'm looking for, for my reading on my multimeter, is between 22 and 48 for this specific deal. And each coil is gonna have its own little white tag for you. So basically, you have that on that 200K, and you just test each line. So there's a red, or a, I'm sorry, there's a black and a white, and it doesn't really matter which one you put it on, you just have to have one on each side. And then you wanna test and see what this is. So we got 34, 34 point, yeah, 34 basically. And we had to be in between 22 and 48. So that's within the range that uh, is acceptable. So we're good to go. Now you're gonna wanna test this multiple times throughout the process. So once right on the roll, once when I get it fished up and I have the, the, the line run, and then once after the tile installation or after the floor leveler. Uh, just to double check things because again, you wanna do this, um, you wanna do all these tests before you start tiling so that if there's an issue, you have a little bit more easy time removing that. So the second thing is, is that you're just basically gonna test. Now there's two different ways that you can just keep it on that 200 uh, ohm reading there. Just put one on a lead, one on the ground and you should st it should stay saying open line. So if, if you see a reading there, then there's gonna be some kind of cut. So you do that on the black and then on the white. So same aspect. And if you don't get nothing, then you're good. And the other way you can do that is just put it on this buzzard sound. So when I touch this, you can hear that sound. So you can just put this on the ground and one of your leads. If you heard the buzzard, then there's something wrong. But if you don't hear a buzzard, you're good to go. And the last thing that you want to test is the actual uh, floor sensor. So this is going to come in a separate package. This has to be run with your cables. So let me get the end here. This is super long too. You don't really need this long. We'll cut more of this off when we bring it up through the wall. testing this let's just double check so we should be between 8 and 12 and we're at 11 so that means that our uh, court our uh, floor heating sensor is in good shape as well so all right I want to prep this for floor leveler because what, like I said we're gonna be floor leveling over top of this so best way to go about that is just to use some spray foam so spray foam you always, like when you're doing floor leveler, you wanna obviously keep it from going underneath the wall and down into your space below, but also you wanna have a perimeter gap all the way around it. So you need to uh, allow for expansion and contraction of the floor leveler itself. Typically you just need about an eighth of an inch. Uh, the spray foam is gonna end up giving you a little bit more of that, but spray foam really does work out well. Uh, and that's why I'm gonna spray it now so that it has enough time to harden up. So then once I do my priming, I can actually get to the floor leveler. So I'm just gonna go all around the perimeter of the room. Okay, and we're gonna go straight across this doorway because we don't want it going out into our carpet area. Use a spare piece of 14 2 so I can grab these wires and fish them up the conduit. Now we'll go ahead and wrap, take our wire out and run these cold splices up the wall.
And then we're gonna take our floor sensor wire up along with this. And you wanna keep this label on here because that's gonna be for reference for anybody in case something went wrong. It's also allows you to test things and remember what those readings had to be. sensor because I don't need that much on there. We'll hook this up a little bit later here. So you just want to make sure that it's only the cold splice going into the wall. You don't want to be bringing the, any of the heated cable up through there. Let me just make sure I got... Okay, so then they just come with these little guides here to be able to clip them into place. So one nice little deal that comes with this kit is this little tester. So you can put these on your wires. It's basically called a loud mouth. And I think I need batteries. Of course it doesn't come with batteries, does it? Triple A's. All right, so we'll put these this on here. This is gonna keep ensure that I don't nickel wire while I'm installing this. It'll give me an indication if something went wrong. It is a really nice little feature for sure. So basically on this little, it's called a loud mouth. Uh, basically it'll just be a beeping sound if I ever cut that wire. So basically I just put line one and line two and then the, the ground in here. And if I do any damage to it, this thing's gonna signal to me that it went bad. You can use this for other flooring systems later on, you know. This is just a nice little bonus to this system. Okay, just turn it on and the alarm will go off if there's never an issue, so. All right, so as far as running the cables, pretty simple rolls. It's pretty much two inches away from all walls. You don't want to go underneath of your cabinets. I mean, this is going to be a freestanding cabinet, so you'd be okay with that. But if you have a cabinet that goes all the way down to the floor, you don't want to put the heat underneath of there. And you don't want to be too close to your actual toilet either. Um, obviously for the wax ring, if you use a wax ring. But really, it's just two inches away from everything. So two inches away from the wall, from the tub, from the vanity. So pretty simple. So let's measure out where we're going to be here. So our vanity is probably gonna come out about 22 inches. Okay, so we'll just make this 24. So we don't wanna bring our, our, our wires past that. And then we wanna be two inches away from here. So really the heated flooring space that we have here is basically seven by four, 28. I got a 30 square foot roll, I'll, that'll be enough. So. Let me just go ahead and um, run this here. So we'll just mark this to keep it from going past this. Or that's really where we're gonna put our, our guides. Okay, so now we'll just screw our strips into here. I'm just using inch and a quarter galvanized screws. These are just placeholders, so it's not a real bad idea just to run these through the middle as well. It'll help hold them into place. So if you want to just run a strip down 
you can do that as well. So make sure this cold splice stays out of the way here. And then we're just gonna bring these wires in between. So two inches away. And this is really simple. Just gonna loop it around. Every third stud will give you about three inches. So spacing is, yeah, three inches. So I might, I might put a little bit of hot glue on that cold splice. But then, yeah, you're just pretty much looping this around every third stud. And this is all going to be right where the walking area of the bathroom is. And that's, to me, that's all that really matters. I mean, you can, you could fill in these areas around the toilet and stuff if you really wanted to, but no one's really going to walk over there. So why waste your money? And again, you, you really want to have, um, you don't want to have a lot of extra wire left over. You can't cut this stuff and it's kind of hard to hide if you don't, like there's really no place to take it if you can't go underneath the vanity. Having too much wire is always the, usually the issue. Because if you wanted to space this out a little bit further, you could too. It's just not going to be evenly warm. Yeah, but 250 bucks for this is a really phenomenal deal. I did run a dedicated circuit for this. All heated flooring systems should have a dedicated circuit, so that could be the difficult part for your installation. You know, running a wire all the way down to your main breaker panel sometimes can be difficult, so. Uh, basement bathrooms really Kind of a must-have if you ask me it's always cold on a basement floor but like once you have heat underneath your feet on a tile floor it's like you really don't want to go back So I do have a little bit of wire left here. Glad I only got the 30 square foot rule. Floor sensor. So make sure we pull any excess up out of there. We just want to basically put this in between one of these wires. So something like this. Just want to kind of have it evenly spaced so that it's not being getting a misreading. Just overlook your whole spacing. Looks pretty good. Okay.
Okay, so then we'll go ahead and prime our floor for the floor leveler, but that really gets our heated flooring system in, so it's not too bad. Still got a green light on here. We don't hear any buzzard, so we're good to go on that. And let's go ahead and prime this floor because it's gonna take about a half an hour for that to dry. And then we can floor level over it and be ready to tile for tomorrow. Okay, so for primer, for the self leveler, I'm gonna use Ardex 51. P51. Okay, so mix that up a little bit and then be generous with it and just brush this all in to your substrate. Primer is important for that floor level or the bond correctly, so don't be stingy with it. And it's going to take, you know, a good half hour for this to dry before you can floor level it, so depends on your humidity level, really. All right, so that's all primed. We'll set that for about a half hour uh, or until it, you know, basically the way I test this is you have to put a little bit of water on it. And if your water isn't all cloudy, then you're good. Um, but usually half hour, 45 minutes. You really don't typically want to put a fan on it. You just want to let it dry naturally um, and you can do it. And you can basically have up to 48 hours before you, you have to floor leveler. Anything after that, you're gonna to have to reapply a new thing of primer. Okay, so first off, you really wanna get a nice long level or any type of level in a straight edge and evaluate the, the, the levelness of your floor. And if you wanna address levelness, you're gonna to have to put some screws or some kind of indicator to the height that you wanna pull it. So I got a six foot level here and it looks like, I mean, just going on the heated flooring, I mean, obviously I have the heated flooring here, but um, yeah, basically it looks like I have just a little bit to raise over here. So I'm just gonna put a screw and get this to level. So this is basically, so if you didn't have heated flooring, you would just wanna put another indicator over here. So like another screw, because you're gonna wanna have at least one eighth thickness on your entire floor. So if your high spot is over here near the toilet area, you wanna make it this an eighth inch thick and then bring this over to level. So I'll just put a screw here anyways, but I could pretty much just go right over top of that heated flooring wire. So then that'll basically be the marker. I'll fill that floor leveler up to that screw height and make sure that it's level. Uh, same thing here, let's go crossways this way. That actually looks pretty level, but we want to be we want to basically go off of this low point here now. So let's just make sure that, that looks good here, and it actually does. So I really don't have to put an indicator here because I'm basically just going an eighth inch over this entire floor area. Um, but yeah, basically aligning screws, and you can put as many as you need in here. Not you know it's not a big deal. Um, it just a, it's basically just something so that you can indicate what's level or not. So. So evaluate this, make sure that this is level before you get started, and if not, put some screws underneath of it to get it level. So anything that you mix that's 50 pounds in a regular five gallon bucket can be real problematic. So the easiest way to go is obviously to buy a six gallon bucket, but if you don't have that, you can just easily just cut this bucket and then you won't have any over spillage when you're trying to mix it. So I'm just gonna cut the bottom of this bucket off. And then now my bucket's taller and I'm not gonna get over spillage. Okay, so then there's, are we still on? All right, so then there's really two different ways about spreading the uh, floor leveler. One is a gauge rake. So this is an adjustable gauge here that I can 
fluctuate the thickness of what I want it to be. So this uh, will would be great on a floor that I don't have floor heating. This isn't gonna work very well here because it's just gonna drag against my wires. I'm gonna have a hard time with it. Second is just a big flat trial. You don't necessarily have to go out and buy these tools. You can just use a large trowel of some sort just to smooth it out. So you're not really, I mean, this isn't very expensive, but you don't have to run out and get this if you don't want to go that expense. You could even use a two foot level and just kind of uh, basically push it around. All this is really doing is agitating it so you can get this to the level and the thickness that you want it to be. But these are nice, putting it on a painter pool will allow me to grab it and drag it to the places that I need it. Getting the right amount of water is key. And like I said, you want to be mixing the full bag so that you're not, so you're making sure that you get the right consistency. So six quarts. Okay, so that's six. A good mixer is really awesome. If any of you guys are contractors, this cola mixer really is awesome. It really makes a difference. Um, I highly recommend it, but it isn't a, it is a kind of an expensive uh, mixer, but it does a great job. So this is a nice smooth consistency here. I'm just basically push this towards the tub. And really what I'm looking for here is really just to cover these wires nicely. over here so it's probably about three eighths of an inch thick over here because there's my screw right here so that's my indicator of level yeah just agitate it a little bit and so it'll flatten out it just doesn't go to level okay so and the other thing that we had on the whole time here was that little sensor for our floor heat so we don't hear any buzzard, so we didn't cut anything, so we're good to go there. But yeah, self-leveler, really easy to install. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have a nice flat surface for our towel now. All right, a couple of drywall tips. This is gonna be a real easy one, small bathroom. We're doing a towel wainscoting, so there's no need to mud underneath of where the towel's gonna go. First thing though, this is a nice little tool here. This is, uh, it can hold your paper tape. So you just slide that in and it, hold, it has a nice little uh, hook on it that can connect to your belt. So it makes it nice to be able to uh, connect this and be able to slide your tape out. So if you're doing a lot of taping, this would be a, a, a good tool to to deal with because it keeps your hands free. You don't have to touch the paper. You just stick it on your boat, belt loop and you can pull it out. So pretty nice. Um, definitely just like the small things that make it easier. Uh, but a couple of tips here. One, when you get your first bucket, when you get your bucket of mud out, you want to add a little bit of water to it. You want to thin it down a little bit and you want to mix it. This is going to help get the air bubbles out of it and give it a little bit of a nicer, smooth texture. So I usually do about two sponge worths of water. And then you want to use a mixing paddle for this and then just mix this up. For taping, you can use your, either a six inch knife or a four inch knife or the combination of the both, really up to you. Uh, you're really not applying too much mud. 
you're just trying to get enough ta tape or enough mud underneath the tape to make sure you're embedding it. So you wanna do your flats first and then do your corners. Now this particular situation, I'm gonna be down about 48 inches. This is actually a pretty tall room. It's like eight foot six. So my uh, seams are a little bit higher than normal. A lot of times, um, I mean, you still end up having to finish this most of the time if you're doing a wainscoting at 48 inches because you still have this bevel here that you're gonna have to mud in so that it looks right. But uh, yeah, do your flats first and then do your corners and just make sure that you have plenty of mud underneath of that tape. That's the biggest key at the, at the taping portion of this is making sure you have enough mud to prevent any of the paper from lifting. So this is just a matter of getting a nice coat. This is purple board. This is a moisture resistant. This is kind of like a similar to the green board. It's just purple. So as long as you don't see any of the purple, you should be good. I'm going to do this same at the same time here. So then you're just basically taking it all off completely. So this is kind of this is kind of your practice area is on the on the first coat. Get you used to these trials. And then just try to keep this as flat as you can. Get all those flats done first. Okay, so I'm just doing this like little pitter pattern type of deal just to get the mud on the ceiling. Just smoothing it out. And if you start from the center, work your out way out, that'll make it easier to keep it from punching up on you. So about a corner amount of mud and just glide that on the corner. Completely coating that corner. And again, don't worry about how much you're really putting on there because you're basically gonna be scraping it all out. You just don't wanna see any of the purple. And just kind of push it into that corner. Take the glide on one side, just push that in tightly into the corner, and remove all the excess. I usually like to do the ceiling first, it feels like a little bit easier sometimes. You don't really have to tape where the tile is. And honestly, I prefer not to because I'd rather have the thin set bond directly to the drywall than rather onto drywall mud. But if you already had it 
you know, if you went all the way, that's not a big deal. I mean, you can still towel over it. I just prefer to have my thin set bond directly to the drywall. So we're just gonna do down to my Wayne's cutting, a couple inches down below it. So I make sure I don't have any problems. Do our nails. What I like to do is just get a pan full of mud and slide over it if my screws are sunk. Definitely check this before you do this. Make sure that the screws are totally sucked in. Okay, so just take a mud and just go over both screws at the same time. This kind of creates a better motion to be able to fill that in. And just do that on all the screws. Actually, you don't really have to worry about the ones below here because that's going to be where the wains cotting is. So I'm just doing the upper screws and the ceiling. And those are going to get covered by my trim from my window and all of this will be covered by my tile work. If I just get that screw there. Okay, so I'll be having tile work coming up along here, but I still wanna just mud this corner here because this is gonna be, um, it's gonna be tiled over, but I might have a little bit of extra space and I wanna just make sure that this corner looks good. I'm not worried about where the tile is because the tile is gonna meet tile to tile there. I just wanna do the upper corners here. And I'm not even worried about the ceiling either. It's just, I have a feeling the way my tile work is, I'm gonna need a little bit of volume here in the corner. And you might see into that corner. So I'm gonna just tape it, ensure that that's finished. All right, so second coat. Uh, really, I just like to do a light sanding with a sanding sponge, just kind of get the crunchies off of it. And then you want to use two types of blades for your flat seams. So a 12 inch and a 16 inch usually does the best. And then we're going to do one side of the corners. So let's get into it. Um, so I'm going to do a little real light sanding, not taking much off, just kind of making sure that there's nothing going to interfere when I go to mud it. jump up. I'm going to wear some stilts. Definitely not a necessity, but definitely kind of helpful rather than having to get on a ladder to move around. Okay, so just lightly sand this corner. So I'm going to take care of our corners first here. So again, just take a half trowel mud. And I like to do my ceiling first. You could do either side, but we're just going to do one side of the corner, let it dry. And in our third coat, we'll do take care of the, the wall side. So just apply that. Have a fairly firm hand when you're removing the excess. Just don't be putting, I actually put a little bit more pressure on the outside of my trowel and let the inside kind of float. So that'll allow you to keep that corner nice and straight. If you have any crunchies here or any little overspray, don't worry about it. 
you know, if you try to go this way to remove that, you can put, possibly hit that corner and cause a problem. Tomorrow, it'll just sand right out. So just try to be, you know, the longer your strokes and the, just kind of like painting in a sense, the longer your strokes, the better it is as far as getting a nice line. So even like that little bit there, don't worry about it. And then just put the pressure on the outside of your blade and just pull across. And then like anything like right this little crease here, you can just sand it off tomorrow. You want to do one side of the corner on your walls as well. And we're just going to do this side because again, I think I'm going to need to buffer this corner out a little bit to get my towel work to work right. So I'm just going to mud this side of the wall. I'm going to go over your screws again. So kind of the same pattern with the gliding over both screws. These are 12 inch. So I, I cut the corners off here so that I can glide this mud and I don't get a bunch of stuff falling off. So then you just float this My 16 inch, just glide over the whole thing. Applying a fair amount of pressure. Yeah, there's stuff in my mud. All right, I'm just gonna leave that alone. There's a little couple streaks there, but I can touch it up with my third coat. Get a trowel full, cut the corners so you're not having it fall off of the ceiling. Sixteen inch. Put a fair amount of pressure on there. Just wipe it off. Got a couple of things in my mud, but I'm gonna leave it alone. Because the more I play around with it, the harder it'll be to make it nice. But I must have something, some kind of chunks in here. Okay, so that take care of the second coat. Tomorrow we can address some of these little uh, scratches we have in the main seams and then do our uh, other side of the corner. Okay, so quick tip, just when you're done with your mud, make sure you scrape it off and then be sure to wipe the inside of your bucket so that none of this joint compound dries and then get stuff in your mud. Especially when you're getting on the third coat, <laughs> you do not want anything in your mud or you're just going to have to go back over anything that streaks. So make sure you clean the inside and make sure you put on the lid. Okay, so third coat, we're gonna use my sanding block. We're gonna sand everything down and then just move on to that third coat. So really a sanding sponge is all really all you need. Um, and just try to be careful with it. You don't wanna be exposing the tape. You just wanna basically sand off anything that has a rough edge on it. And it really shouldn't be all that much, hopefully, if you used a 12 inch, a 14 inch knife on these main seams. And the corners is where these little beveled uh, Sponges really help out a lot.
Okay, so third coat. There's really nothing more than coating that other side now. So I'll just go ahead and get our half trial mud. Go right along the side. Trying to put more pressure on the bottom part of your trowel than the actual corner. attention to that corner. Yep, got something in my mud here. That's why you don't worry about too much about the streaks and stuff because it's real easy to cover up the next day. Rather than stress yourself out trying to get the perfect seam, you can just go over it the next day on the third coat. Not gonna waste any time. And you know, why frustrate yourself if you're not getting the perfect lines that you want? You know, mudding is one of those things where some days are good, some days it just fights you so you know you have to know your strengths and know when to just move on with the project because maybe mudding isn't isn't your thing that day and you can move on the next day to, to make up for it but uh yeah touching this stuff up not a difficult thing to do and that's why it's one thing i always recommend when people you know are doing bathrooms they got everything down to the, the studs because you really want to check out all that plumbing, electrical. You want to modify things to make sure that you can custom make it to the, your, your custom bathroom. It makes everything a lot easier if you get your plumbing in the right location. If you are you know reroute that outlet for your vanity and you put it in the place that you want it, all of that customization is going to be well worth it. And really to take all these walls down is really not that big of a deal. Um, you know, we got basically six sheets of drywall in here and uh, to finish it, you know, it just takes a little bit of time But you know, even if you have never done this before It's just going to take a bunch of different coats to get it to the finish that you want, but it's all um, You know, it's all able to be achieved by you know, anybody who's never even touched this stuff before uh, And it's just because it's you know, it's just a matter of applying the mud sanding it down and then getting it to that finish that you wanted to you that you wanted at okay so same thing on the flat seams third coat is just a matter of just kind of taking all the mud off of it just touching up some spaces that you might have not been able to get good the day before that's why it's not worth fighting um, you know if you're not getting good lines or you got something in your mud you know just kind of move on with the project because it's not that hard to come here the next day and just add a little bit more mud over those imperfections. You know, I mean, obviously, perfection is something to achieve, uh, but it takes time to get there. And, you know, with stuff like this, every day, you can just add a little bit more, make it perfect. So you might not be able to get there where you can just do it, you know, the first time and everything's great, but, you know, over time, you'll learn those skills and uh you know basically just don't stress the small stuff get uh move on with the rest of your project don't feel defeated just because you can't you know just because you had a bad day with the mud you know mud is one of those things where you know you have your good days and bad days and uh it's really a, it requires a steady hand so you know something like around this outlet real kind of a pain in the neck it's going to take me probably another coat to get this the way i want it to look just because you know, I don't have a lot of room here to work with. So sanding drywall, not a big deal. Covering up your mistakes, not a big deal either. So 
So when it comes to waterproofing, there's a lot of different systems out there. This is probably one of the most popular. You've probably seen me install hundreds of feet of this here online on how to go about installing Ditra. It's a great product and I really find it to be best for larger tiles. So 12 by 24s, plank tile, anything with that larger size because in order to waterproof this, you need to have a band that goes over the seams. Most of these products are only about three foot wide. So you're gonna have a seam somewhere within the bathroom that you're gonna to have to address to make it waterproof. And that seam is problematic for smaller tiles like this. Any little bit of a deviation in hump is gonna allow this to kind of raise up. And these things are not very easy to float thin set under. If you kind of make it a little bit thicker, you're gonna be fighting the thin set that's gonna come out of the joints. So they're really imperative to have a flat floor with the mosaics. So that's why I didn't go with membrane or Ditra. Great products, just not great in this situation. So the best alternative next was actually just do a liquid membrane because this way I can roll the entire area. There's no seams and it's gonna be, you know, basically kind of like a bathtub. It's gonna be completely waterproof. And we're gonna be using some of this mesh to go up against the corners of the room so that all of these areas around the bathroom are 100% waterproof. And I always recommend having a bag of feather finish on hand to be able to fill in areas, especially like against the tub or around your toilet supply. Another option, you know, you might not know about, because feather finish doesn't need to be primed and you can immediately use this, but it can only go up to a half inch thickness. So if you had a thicker floor, you might want to go with something like this, which is the Ardex AM100. It's a pretty specific brand of stuff, but it's basically a rapid setting mud bed mix and it can go up to an inch and a quarter. So I always have these on hand as a contractor, just in case I need to fill something in really quickly so that I can move on with the waterproofing system. So once you have all these things established, ready to go, then you can move on to the actual waterproofing system. All right, so the supplies that you need this, pretty simple, not much different than painting really. A, a paintbrush to go around the edges, half inch roller, half inch, so that you can make sure that you get a, a copious amount of this on the floor. Um, this is not 100% necessary, but this is a film gauge to double check the thickness that you're actually putting it down. But I actually just, you know, my Ditra or my uh, Curdy trowel is basically eighth inch. This kind of gives me a reference of it, but really, you just really want to make a nice, really thick coat of it. We'll demonstrate that shortly. But you want to mix up the product before you get started. So this is actually something I've been using on many different jobs. I always have a bucket of this on hand, but it's a pretty thick consistency. Uh, so just, it's like a pudding basically. So just mix this up a little bit, make sure that there isn't any surface uh, water on top, I guess you could say. So then this is the mesh. This is what we're gonna be embedding around the corners. And I'm actually gonna do this first because you really should have multiple coats in the corners. Um, so this is just a, a, a thin fabric that basically just gets embedded with the actual liquid membrane. So the other thing you wanna do is get all the dust off the floor, vacuum things up, wipe everything down with a damp sponge. You know, actually, let me just get the vacuum because it is bad enough in here that I don't, should have yeah. vacuumed in here earlier. Okay, so let's get some fabric. Let's go along the edge. All right, so really, this isn't really much different than painting, but you just want to get a nice thick consistency of this on the floor and then embed that deal. So now these walls are going to be tiled as well, but I really, really like the idea of having this waterproof behind the vanity and behind where the toilet is just, I don't know. It gives me peace of mind knowing that there's no way that any overflow or accident could get down this to the floor below. So whether you're any type of system you're using, I like to do this just to be able to have that insurance, I guess you could say. I'm not wearing gloves, but I should be because this stuff is kind of nasty to 
get off your hands, but I don't know what I did with my gloves, so. But yeah, just uh, try to keep this flat. And just embed another coat over top of it. Pretty simple. But this is great. I mean, this is a great system forever. Concrete. Um, you know, the only thing they're not going to really recommend you still do is go directly on top of plywood because it's not going to be uh, suitable for the expansion contraction of that. You still have to kind of isolate it. So whether that's cement board or the floor leveler. So, but going over concrete, this is a great way to do it. I'm thankful I did this in my own bathroom, my kid's bathroom, because it's amazing how much water is left over after a bath. And it's like, it just gives you peace of mind knowing that <laughs> it's not gonna get below it and rotten out the subfloor. Okay, all right, so this is a very nice area to make sure that you have good waterproofing. So we're gonna make sure that we put some mesh here. There's all too many times I see a lot of rotten wood right at these intersections. Okay, so what we'll do is just basically put a decent amount right next to this tub. And uh, what we'll end up doing after this stuff dries is just basically caulking the tub to the waterproofing. And that'll be sufficient for this area. So the first coat really needs to have a or all the coats really need to be pretty thick. And this stuff does uniformly dry pretty well, so don't be afraid to get a decent amount on here. But this is definitely a critical area right along the tub. And like I said, we'll caulk this after this waterproofing with a urethane caulk. And then another great area that I think makes a lot of sense is right around the toilet area. So just caulking or, or just basically applying a thick layer around here because then once I tile everything, I can basically just cut the rest of the pipe. And now everything's 100% waterproof around the toilet. You don't have to worry about anything getting down through this. Okay, so the main floor, pretty easy. Just get a fair amount on the floor and we're going to just roll it with the the uh half inch nap roller and i would say it's not really rolling it's kind of pushing it <laughs> as far as the thickness goes so you want to definitely get enough on here to basically push this around working it into the substrate and then you can use one of these film gauges you need between 15 and 22 so anywhere within here, you want to be able to scrape this and be able to see that filled with the um, sealant. So the other way, if you don't have this, is really just to, you know, just try to, just this is an eighth inch by eighth inch trowel, and you can see how I have it scraped up and it's kind of filling those woods. So, so a film um, gauge, works or you can just use your trowel to gauge it but really it all comes down to just making sure that you have a really nice thick consistency on the floor because um, you really need to have 15 at least 15 or 22 mils per coat to be within their requirements and that's just going to give you a durable surface
Okay, so about an hour or two later, it'll be dry to the touch and you'll see this olive green. So we'll put a second coat over everything and then we'll be set at the right mill thickness to go ahead and do our tile. So that does take about two hours almost to completely dry. And then this is gonna take another couple of hours to dry. So you'll typically you aren't able to do this all in the same day as far as tiling goes. So that's one drawback to this system is that you're not able to get everything done in one day and set the tile. Okay, so window trim. We're just gonna do a Craftsman style window with a window sill, really simple. So first thing you wanna do is just get your side jams. So these are considered extension jams up against your window and mark where you want the, the trim is gonna be. So, you know, hopefully try to keep the same reveal everywhere and then just have a, like a quarter inch reveal or so and just mark the wall of where that's gonna be. So something like that. And then with those marks, we're gonna extend our sill a half inch because it usually looks the nicest when you have half inch coming outside of either side of the trim. So basically we have 34 inches. We'll just make it 35 and we'll have a half inch on either side. Okay, so then we wanna measure back to our window. So you get six and three quarter, six and a half. So we are not exactly even all the way. Can't really do nothing about that. Just have to make that adjustment cut. Okay, so one note. So I cut out my sides here. One note, I did notch this out so I can slide the tile beside the edges here. Now I did overcut it, but not a big deal because my trim is gonna cover over top of it, but definitely notch that out so that you can get your tile behind there nicely. And then let's just make sure that this sits level. So we do have a little bit of shimming to do here. Okay, so what we're gonna use is some quick dry on here. So basically caulk everything up against the window. All right, so it's time for the fun part of the project that's actually installing the tile. So if you did the prep work prior to this, it's gonna make this installation a lot easier. Today we're gonna to be installing some mosaic floor tile. And I wanna give you a bunch of tips on how to set this, the methods on how you wanna do it, and some of the tools that help make this a lot easier for you. So let's get started. So the type of thin set I highly recommend for any beginner or any tile installer is Ardex X5. Main reason is, is because of the pot life that we're gonna have in the bucket gives us plenty of time to make all the accurate cuts. Especially when you're installing mosaics, you need a little bit more time uh, with setting everything, cutting things, and getting things set up. So X5, really, really highly recommend it. We're gonna mix them up and get ready to set the tile. So it's always important to measure your water first. Uh, the ratio is between six and seven quarts per bag and I'm gonna go right in the middle, around six and a half quarts. All 
All right, so the most important aspect for setting any mosaic tile is making sure your floor is nice and flat. So uh, as you can see, I have a six foot level here, no space at all, everything's 100% flat. And that's really what really makes this a nice, easy installation. So anytime that there's any type of deviation in that subfloor, it's gonna make this, you're gonna be able to see it immediately. And it's really hard to build up mosaics. You really can't add more thin set underneath of them. I mean, you can, but then you're gonna have problems with it coming up through the joints and making it a lot harder for you. So if you can use some self leveler, uh, I definitely think that's the way to go. It makes it a lot easier. So a couple other tools that we're gonna to be using here. So one is, well, this is my scraper. This is a linoleum knife. It doesn't seem like a tile tool, but it really helps you know, remove any of the thin set out of the joints, it allows you to move things around a little bit. Probably use this on, you know, hundreds of square feet of tile. So it's the way, the way it looks. Another one is gonna be some tile nippers. This is just gonna help cut some accurately around the toilet flange and make any cuts. Um, this is not 100% necessary, but it's definitely helpful. And I like definitely like to use it. Um, now, as far as trowels go, you would go with something just about as thick as the tile. Um, so this is a quarter inch uh, U-notch trial. This is typically what most tile setters would set with. This is probably what I've used for most of my career uh, for mosaics, is using a quarter by quarter. Uh, another thing is just a grout float. This is just a tampon in place. And then we're gonna be using some grinders uh, with a good tile blade. So what my, I like using is these Montelit CGX blades. This is just to do some of the excess cutting and we're going to get into it but what i like to do is i have a grinder here with a dustless um, it basically extracts dust up from here um, but i like to do all my cuts dry main reason is is because when you if you try to run this through a wet saw it just kind of it can make this backing really weak and kind of fall off and then when you go to set the tile in place it you know if it comes off the mesh it's a real pain in the neck. It's just a lot of placing each one individually. So I like to dry cut it. I don't like to get my mosaics wet because it just creates more problems and harder. And plus, you don't want any of your tile to be wet before you set it in the thin set. It needs to be dry so that you can actually get a good bond to the back of the tile. Uh, but each type of mosaic is gonna be a little bit different with how the backing is. The biggest thing about these though, in all these mosaics, is that you will need to pay attention if you can actually see the tile. So on the back of this, this is like a netting. You can see the actual physical tile. That's a good thing because now you can have good coverage of thins that actually bonding the tile. If you see any type of mosaic that is completely coated in, in the mesh and you can't even see any of the tile, I'd be cautious of that because you're just relying on the glue on the mosaic to actually bond to the thin set. And in recent years, or you know, in the past couple of decades that I've been doing this, if you see that completely shellacked with it, a lot of times the tile will end up coming loose, especially in wet areas like shower floors. I haven't had too many issues on major outside floor areas because you're not usually getting enough water to penetrate it to be a problem, but I definitely have problems inside of a shower. If you can't see the tile and you're not getting bond to the tile, you know, you're gonna be subjected to possibly having that towel come loose at some point. So, you know, before you purchase your towel, definitely pay attention to that. It's really important to be able to bond thin set to the actual tile. Since it is a mosaic, I mean, when it comes to referencing, you know, forget about what's necessarily square. Um, it really is gonna be the visual reference points that you need to go with. Um, I mean, these are pretty small. Now, obviously, any, you know, if anything's extremely out of square, you're gonna be able to see that one way or the other. But I would just pay attention to the visual areas. So we're gonna have a vanity here. We're gonna have a toilet here. Um, the biggest visible area you're walking in is gonna be right at this tub. So if you make this tile even with the tub, making sure that everything lines up, we're basically gonna be cutting these diamonds straight down the middle and starting from that angle and working our way this way. If our walls are out of square, you know, that's what it is. But if you have this uneven right against the tub, it's gonna to, it's gonna look really bad and that's what everybody's gonna be kind of focused on. So I would recommend just starting out where the tub is, that's gonna be your square mark and work your way from there. So let's go ahead and still get a, 
a center point. I think it's important to find the center so you can try to even it out on the other side. So we got basically 58 and three quarter, so 29 and three eighths with our center. So let's just, just take a look at this for reference of what center might be. So we'll make the center of those diamonds right on the center. And we're just gonna hand lay these out. A lot of times it's just easier just to, to lay them out to, to take a look at, see what they're, it's gonna look like. Um, but ultimately I'm just trying to obviously eliminate slivers. We're gonna have a tiled wainscoting on the sides. So, you know, you're gonna have some room for error as far as overcoming the sides of the tile. But I always do like to set my floor tile first. I just want to try to eliminate any real small slivers and I don't want to be having to have a small diamond in that edge. So we're going to probably want to try to make our tiles so that they basically come in the middle of our octagons because that can overcome a better look. So we have almost like, you know, an inch of room. So if we stay right in the middle of that, so let's just go ahead and try to stay in the middle. Yeah, so that's probably gonna be better off because then I have a little bit to play around with here on here. So we're gonna go right on the edge of here from our center, but really just laying this out is gonna give you the best reference of it. So just, uh, you know, that could take you a little bit of time to lay it out. All right, so again, I would ra rather prefer cutting all this stuff dry versus using a wet saw. Main reason is because I, I want to be able to set the towel immediately and not have to let it dry and I don't want to compromise that uh, mesh on the back. So we're going to go ahead and cut these diamonds. Now I mean pay attention to your actual mosaic. If you have some additional uh, netting coming outside of your tile then you want to reference this but right now the way that all of these are laid it doesn't really matter which way you go. It's just a matter of um, because there isn't any extra netting on either side. So I can pretty much, when I bring my extra tile across, I can go either direction. So it really makes no difference. I'm just going to align my, I'm going to cut my dots so that they're up against the tub so that I have a visual reference and making sure that they look, look all nice. So let's go ahead and cut a bunch of these tiles with that. I'm going to put my mask on. So now we've got all these nice and straight up against the tub. Now we can go ahead and set that first row. And once we set that first row, the rest of it, you just pretty much follow that pattern. It's really, you know, just like any wall, wall and installation as well. If you get that first row level, everything works out pretty well. So um, this is going to be just fine. I uh, might have to do a little bit of fine tuning when I go to set it into place, but uh, yeah, just making sure that you have that first row straight and everything cut up against the tub, we should be in good shape. Okay, so we got our first row established. We'll just pull them aside in the same order that we put them in so that we don't get confused. Okay, so you always wanna Take a damp sponge and wipe down your surface. And this just gets the dust off of it and makes it glide easier. So we're gonna be using that quarter by quarter since we already tested it and we're getting good coverage. So the first part is to use the backside of the trowel 
and work it into the substrate. This is going to get you better trial lines and the more consistent your trial lines is, the better that you're going to get coverage on this tile. So work it into the substrate and then um, directional trial. Okay, so pay attention to the excess thin set in any areas because you don't want to have to fight getting it out of the joint. All right, so we'll go ahead and set our dial into place. And before I tamp it, I'm just going to set them all into place first. Make sure these stay flat. I'm just going to use a straight edge. Make sure that my tiles are all in a line because that will make a difference. It'll kind of grow on you in some fashions and be problematic. So if you get this first row straight, then you can just basically eye it up for the rest of the time. I'd rather have a little bit of a bigger joint up against the tub because I'm going to be caulking that joint anyways. So, you know, the tub joint as uniform as I want it to be, having a little bit of a gap is not a big deal. But being straight is gonna make the rest of this installation much easier. So there we go. So that's not too bad. Okay, so now you've got it in, in place. Now you can just lightly take a grout float and embed it into place. Okay, so this is where having so many horseshoe spacers are kind of nice in case you don't have the spacing, especially on these little diamonds. They sometimes don't stay where you exactly want them to be. Use your linoleum knife, scrape out any joints, and get these the way you want them to be. Oh, I got one more diamond in the corner there too. Okay, so moving on. Basically rinse and repeat. Only it's gonna be a little bit easier now that we've got all this move main cuts out of the way. Okay, so if we're around the toilet flange, let's go ahead and try to set this and basically pull out all the tiles that are going to interfere. And then we'll cut them in piece by piece after we get the tiles in. So these don't have to be really super accurate since I'm going to be putting a toilet flange around here that has plenty of room. So I'm just gonna use these tile nippers. These tabby spacers, they're like little wedges. They could be a little bit more accurate with trying to push some of these diamonds to where you need them.
sorry. All right, next row. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is put a metal transition right at our jam here. So we're gonna cut this down to 32 inches. Okay, so this is not intended the way that Schluter is meant to be used, but I have it inside of this channel. So there's just a little bit of a bump here, but I'll be just uh, grouting that. So it's really not that much of a lip, but really kind of works well for this. This will go right up to my carpet when they, when they install a carpet, but you just want to make sure that you embed this well. So that meets nicely up with my carpet. I'm not doing any type of wood transition or any exposed screw fastener type. This is just a Schluter edge right to the edge. We're gonna be doing six by six tiles on this back wall, a very simple pattern. Um, you know, I feel a lot of ways uh, these standard tiles, these colored tiles really bring a lot of nice flavor and design to the bathroom. And it doesn't have to be completely sophisticated to get a nice clean look. To it, So these tiles are really um, going to be somewhat user friendly because there isn't a lot of uh, time into the layout, but you do want to spend that time on the layout portion to make sure that everything is going to try to align to where you need it to be throughout the project. So the first thing 
you want to do okay so in this bathroom we're doing the tile in the back obviously in this whole tile area but we're also doing a wainscoting all the way around the room so the first thing you need to establish is where's the low point in the bathroom because if you're going to do six by sixes going all around all around the room you want it to be aligned within the tub surround as well or it's going to look really off or, or off so you want to make sure that you find the low spot of your bathroom so that when you start out with a full tile that you're not going to have any type of sliver at the bottom you can always cut this down to fit if you don't if you, if you have base trim you, you would also do the same thing. If you had base trim, you wanna make sure you find the low point and then just scribe cut the base trim to fit the unlevelness. Uh, so let's first use a laser. Laser is usually the fastest and easiest way to do that. So we'll just put this on the horizontal position and let's just measure around to the floor area. So here we have 34 and 3 eighths. And then on this side of the room, 34 and a half. So looking at this corner, 34 and a quarter. So that's a little bit higher than those others. And then I'm pretty sure this is the low spot, but just measure this, 34 and seven eighths. So this is the low point. I kind of figured that was gonna be the case just because we were lining up with our existing floor out here and I already had kind of assumed that this was gonna be a low point. So this side of the wall is where you wanna have the full tile and establish your level line so that we know what we want for the tub surround. So we're gonna start with a full tile here. So let's give ourselves a little bit of space underneath it there as well. You always wanna have a little bit of a gap at the floor. So we're just gonna use our little horseshoe shim to establish that. Okay. So this is gonna be that's going to be where our start point is. Okay, so that, this will be where we'll be setting our tile for the perimeter of the bottom. And you can also just double check this too, make sure it's going to be below six inches. So you've got six inches there, five and a half there, so it's a half inch. And then looking over here, five and five eighths. So as you can tell, there's a half inch difference there. Let's just double check this side, make sure that we're gonna be below six and we're five and seven eighths. So this point is what we wanna reference to come up our tub wall. So put a mark here. So that's, <laughs> that's right on that line, which is pretty awesome because I think that will essentially be right at the tub deck. So we're gonna basically be starting out with a full tile all the way around that perimeter. So that's gonna be pretty awesome. Uh, it doesn't always work out that way, but let's just go ahead and put a space under here. Cause we wanna have space at the tub deck. Let's just take a look here. So we've got a little bit of a, more of a gap here than I want. So what I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna lower this down a little bit because we're basically, you know, I mean, everything is within a quarter inch or within reason. So we can always lower this bottom row here a quarter inch so that we can get this, this row down lower. I don't wanna have anything more than like a 16th inch gap here between my tub. I mean, eighth inch at most, anything more than that, I'm gonna, it's gonna be kind of problematic and you're gonna have a really big fat grout joint um, that you'll be caulking in that corner. So I'd rather keep it minimal to the tub because that's definitely going to be a visual reference that people are going to see. If you have a big gap, it's going to, you know, just be a lot of silicone. And plus we're using 16th inch spacers throughout. So you really don't want to have it more than that or it'll look off. So let's lower this slightly. And what that'll do is lower my entire wall going around, which won't be a big deal. But the reason I'm starting on this back wall too is because when you're looking at the tub surround, you can kind of hide the grout joints to where this wall comes up to it. And it's, it's harder to establish, you know, see that grout joint and it'll hide that better. You're gonna be caulking the corners anyways, but it's always a good idea to try to hide the grout joint from your visual reference at any angle that you come into the shower. So that's why we're working on the back wall first 
and then we're going to be doing the side walls coming around. Now we also are going to have some wide bull nose that are going to come around here. So it's really just going to be one piece of bull nose that comes on these outside edges and then our Wayne's cladding will butt up to that. So this is kind of its own entity, but you want to have all your grout joints for your Wayne's cladding to be in a line going all the way around. So let's just go ahead and lower this because we have the ability to do that and just lower that first row on the Wayne's cladding. I'd prefer to cut this down and get this to where we want it. The other thing we want to do is measure what we have here. So we've got six, and then we are a little bit higher on this back edge, six and three quarter, or five and three quarter. So we're a quarter inch higher on this side, which we can scribe cut that bottom row. So the same thing is with a tub surround, you wanna find your low point. And if you're gonna start with a full tile, start at that low point so that you can scribe cut and make sure that you have you know, a, an accurate uh, joint between the tub and that you're keeping everything level. Now, I do get a lot of questions about whether to use a ledger board at this point, putting a board right here and working my way up with the tile. Definitely a way to do to go about it. But in my mind, it's just going to be quicker to be able to install the tile referencing the laser because I don't have to go back and fill in those areas. It's always a little bit more complicated when you have a fixed point to have to keep even and then also scribe cut to the base. So if I could scribe cut all my tile and just make sure that I follow my laser, it makes it a lot more uh, quick, efficient installation. But ledger boards are definitely a great idea. If you don't have a laser, you know, a ledger board would be the best way to go so that you can put a level on there, work your way up and fill those tiles in. But once you have a laser, you really won't go back. You'll start out this way and it'll go a lot quicker. Okay, so the next part of the layout, now that we established where our height is, we want to evaluate really kind of what, you know, this, this all goes into the ceiling as well. So um, you might have to adjust this row dependent on what it looks like at the top. So we're basically starting out with a full towel on our low side. So let's just kind of reference our measurement to the ceiling and see where we're going to be. So there are six inch tiles exactly. You're going to add on basically a 16th of each row. So 72, so you have 78, and then basically a four inch piece above that. So we've got 82 inches to the top. Now this is a little bit of a higher ceiling than a normal ceiling. You know, the whole height of this ceiling from the floor is actually eight foot four. Most of you would probably have an eight foot ceiling or maybe even a little less than that. Um, but it all is referenced to what you have, and we have 82 inches, so that's gonna work out great. We should roughly be having about a three and a half to four inch piece at the ceiling. Uh, anything with these tiles, I would say, anything less than two inches is gonna look pretty forced. Now, we're, we are just simply doing the six by sixes all the way up. There's not gonna be any type of border, but if you did have a border, that's where you can add and fudge things a little bit by adding another row or doing something to make sure that that ceiling looks right. But in this case, it's gonna work out great. We're gonna basically have a four inch piece at the top, a lot of additional fudge room in case things kind of grow higher than uh, what we expect. So a lot of ways to uh, have an exit plan if you get too small up there, but in this case, it'll be pretty, pretty straight streamlined here. Um, one other feature we're planning on doing is putting in a recessed niche. I did not cut that out, obviously. We're gonna do that after we set the tile, it's roughly somewhere within this region, we're gonna have it, but we wanna have it all coming up to, so that the grout joint meets the top of the niche. So this would be the best, most accurate way to do it is to cut it in after you get your tiling started. Okay, so the last uh, part of your layout, since we're gonna be putting the niches in later, that kind of eliminates any issues there with trying to make sure that you have the right height to the niche. It really makes it easier because you don't have to stress about having any type of sliver towards the niche. You can make that niche where you want it with your tile layout. Uh, the second part of the pattern, or the third part of the pattern, is just establishing the center. Usually on a tub, you know, a normal tub, 59 inches would be your overall opening. So that's 29 and a half. And 
with six by sixes or anything like that, like um, three by, you know, subway tower, or six by sixes, these just start from the center. You'll end up with like a five to five pattern. So just mark this across, make sure that you're not getting anything less than two inches. And here we are, we will have five inches. So it'll be five, two, five, two. And that also will work out well because when we go into our niche, we're gonna actually be cutting out the board uh, so that these wall tile will go into the niche. And so at the two inch level, we're gonna have basically a three to four inch deep niche, which will work out well with that layout. That you really can't control all that much as far as the depth going in there. I mean, most of the time you're not gonna be able to, um, you don't wanna change basically your, your side pieces. You want it to be equal on other sides, having, you know, what if you have a five inch piece here, have a five inch piece here. You don't want to offset that or it's going to look kind of odd. Um, and then we'll work on our layout as we come out the walls after we get the back wall set. So order operation, setting your wall, back wall first, the side walls to your shower, and then going into the wings conning around the bathroom. Okay, so a couple of tools that make this easy um, for you for installing this. Even though these are six by sixes and we made sure that our walls were flat prior to installing the backer board in the membrane, it's still really nice to use some kind of a leveling system. So these are called uh, Tucson leveling clips. And what's great about them is that they're, it's just a one part system. So you just basically put these together. You'll see me doing this over and over again, but basically, you just pinch the wall tile together. One thing I've found is that when you have direct down light like this, especially on the back wall, you, you'll see any type of unevenness really, really easily. It'll create shadows on that back wall. And believe me, I've had, this is from experience here. That's why I really am a big fan of a leveling system, even with small tiles like this, because it just is insurance to make sure that your wall is flat. If you try to do this without it, you can certainly get a flat wall, but you're more subjective to having issues or having some kind of lippage. And these down lights do not, are not forgiving when it comes to that. You'll see the shadow and you'll immediately see the uh, unevenness on the tile. It's just all about the angle of the light hitting it and it really makes a big difference. So we're gonna be using these Tucson leveling clips. As uh, redundant as it seems on such small tiles, it just really helps out and makes it a lot easier. Uh, we're also going to be using basically a combination uh, quarter by quarter inch trial. It's not actually square notch trial. As you can see, it has some different edges to it. This is going to provide uh, the ability for those ridges to collapse and get good coverage on the back of your tiles. We're also going to be back buttering. Back buttering your tiles are really important and make sure that you get the full coverage on it. But we're going to test this when we actually start setting the tile to make sure that we're getting the right coverage. You really can't just uh, blanketly say this is the trial that you used for this because it really depends on the substrate that you're going over and making sure that you're getting the right coverage. So you always have to test your tile. And if I'm not getting it, I'm gonna move up to the next trial size so that I can get that coverage. But back watering will ensure that. Margin trial, this is just gonna help uh, feather out some of that thin set. So when I put my leveling clips in, I'm not squeezing thin set in between those joints and causing more clean up than it needs to be. Uh, I do have a couple sets of grinders here. One has a blade that will grind down tiles. So if uh, I'm having problems like in the corners or this overlap, I can ground on, grind down the back of the tiles, get them nice and even. It's also great for scribe cutting, just getting some additional extra, uh, you know, more fine tuning your cuts. I also have another grinder that I will have a good blade on, a good diamond blade. This helps for scribe cutting and doing those additional cuts. And then what I'll probably mostly be using is this one that I have a apparatus for taking the dust out of the room. So when I use this, it automatically turns on the dust extractor. And then this I'll be doing. So a lot of the cuts in the corners, uh, that's one nice thing, starting out tiling on this back wall, you're not gonna have to be super accurate with your cuts because you're gonna have this wall 
that will over over cover the, any of those cuts in the corner so it kind of gives you like on your first wall a little bit uh, getting used to using the tools and if you're not accurate it's not a big deal just as long as the tiles overlap uh, that back wall rubber gloves you want to use that with the thin set and then obviously we already have our laser set so those are the main things along with spacers because we're going to be using some 16th inch space lines now these six by sixes do have these little notch bump outs and you could butt them directly to each other but you're going to get less than a 16th inch grout joint and i really kind of want to see the color uh, in those grout joints and ultimately i just feel like it looks a little bit better um, than because i feel like in some ways just having a really small grout joint like that kind of looks commercial kind of looks like um, you know something you would see in a commercial setting so we're going to put the 16th inch grout joints in here so that we can give us ours a little bit more room we're also going to be offsetting these so they're going to be more like a brick pattern rather than a straight pattern that's all personal preference there um, but yeah so other than that we'll get started on here and start tiling this back wall So on this first row, I just have a little bit that I have to cut on the back here. So I'm just going to scribe cut those. I'm not going to use my wet saw and I'm not, I'm not because even the wet saw, I mean, we're only taking like a blade's width off. So it's just going to be easier to scribe cut it. As you can see, I have a kind of a little bit of a bench here so that I can work off of uh, to cut these tiles, just a piece of plywood. Um, as you also can tell, as I protected my tub, I put some ram board around here. That'll kind of keep you from scratching the inside of the tub. I'm notorious for doing that and something that I'm trying to improve on. So first step is, so first off, you can look at this thin set. You can see how nice and thick this is. It's like almost doesn't even want to fall off the trial. This is the real big difference between using this and something that you get at the home store or something that you get for 15 bucks a bag. Um, the non-sag quality of this is just going to make it a lot easier to install. So first thing you want to do is get it on the wall. So even, even looking at that, you know, I mean, it's pretty non-sag quality to it. If you got some stuff from the big box stores and mixed it, I guarantee it'll be sliding down the wall by now. So it really is worth the extra money and the time to go get this stuff. Um, but the first thing you want to do is just use the back side of the trowel, burn the thin set into the substrate, basically using the flat side and moving it into position, and then do your directional troweling. And what this does is it kind of primes the surface and gets this embedded into this membrane, and then it'll allow you to make some nice ridge lines with your thin set. directional troweling so I would say on this first row just to get enough thin set to get on this first row because we're gonna be scribe cutting we're gonna be cutting things and you don't want this stuff to sit on the wall for more than 10 minutes so if you're taking longer than that you're gonna to have to scrape some of this off and reapply because you don't want to have this uh, skimming over but the first thing let's first just test a piece of this tile make sure that we're going to get the coverage that we want so just like we were doing that we're going to back butter and then we're going to trowel it and then we're going to back butter the actual tile so that's basically how the operation we're going to be installing it on so Let's just see what this looks like. I forgot to mention one other tool that's really nice to use is a linoleum knife. As you can see, it has a nice little sharp corner here. It allows you to move tiles around, scrape out those grout joints. But so we got our tile set. Now let's just take a look at what kind of coverage we're getting. Look at that. You can see all of it suctioning off of here. There isn't any bald spots. This trout is going to definitely work well for these six by sixes. Uh, so, you know, all depends on whether you're getting this. If you're seeing a lot of lines and seeing a lot of bald spots, move up to the next trowel size. But this quarter by quarter premium notch trowel basically has these little ridges on it, really helps collapse them pretty nicely. So, all right, so let me make sure we're right here to the center. 
And then the most important thing is just paying attention to that laser and making sure you're seeing the tip of that hit my laser. If you stay with that laser, it'll make everything a lot easier. Just want to make sure I'm in the center, 29 and a half, 29 and a half, we're good. Got our little clip system here. But yeah, you just want to see the top of that laser right on there. And the main reason you want a, a gap between the tub here is so that when you caulk it, that caulking joint's gonna last a long time. If you don't have a gap here at the, at the base and you just set your towel directly down on to the tub deck, for one, an acrylic tub will actually expand and contract and you need a little bit of space there so you don't have any forcing of the tub against that. Now most of the time you're gonna fill up the tub and it's actually gonna can uh, press down and you're going to end up expanding that joint but if you have a joint here it allows the silicone to get into that joint and then make a really good solid connection if you just have the towel butted straight down to the tub deck you're just going to smear the two surfaces and then once you fill up that tub it's just going to crack that joint really quickly so if you have a gap like a 16th eighth at most it'll make that silicone joint last much longer and it's like less maintenance over time clip All right, so we'll go ahead and make a bunch of fives and a bunch of twos. All right, so a wet saw is not 100% necessary. You don't have to go out and rent one or spend, you know, $1,000 on a wet saw. But what it does do, it makes you a lot more efficient because I can cut multiple towels at once and be a little bit more accurate in a lot of senses. You can definitely use a slide cutter to do all of this, but it does make it faster and a little bit easier to do multiple cuts on this. So I'm just going to measure over my five inches and cut a bunch. Okay. So if you get this first road set nicely, Make the rest of this easy. Just pay, just pay attention to your vertical seams. Everything's in line. You can see that laser all the way across there. Okay, so leveling clips for this. It might seem a little, a little bit too much for smaller tiles like this. But I'm telling you, these things make a big difference. These are called Tucson leveling clips and they don't require anything else other than just your fingers to pinch them together. Now these are six by sixes. So most people would think that's kind of ridiculous to use that on these, but this down light is gonna show anything that you have uneven uh, you know, when you're installing these tiles. So I really think that these make a big difference with making sure that all your tile is in line and you don't have to fuss around with it as much. You just pinch them together and they're ready to go. But you always wanna back butter your tiles to make sure you're getting good coverage on things, set them in place, and then boom, you just pinch them together and it's all in a nice line. So really we'll up the get level of your bathroom remodel even though it does take a little bit extra time 
and sometimes you get a little bit of thin set in between the joints, uh, a little bit more cleanup. But if you stay with your laser, use these leveling clips, you'll have a nice flat wall. And then no matter what angle you look at, it's gonna look great. All right, so we're gonna go one more row and then we're gonna cut in our niche. So, um, yeah, I think that'll be a good height. It's kind of, you know, when you're standing up, you'll be able to put your stuff here. Possibly when you're sitting down, you'll be able to be able to still reach that area. Um, so we're roughly gonna be, what, 24 inches off the tub deck? Yeah, 25, yeah, 24. it will be about 24 inches. So that's all personal preference. It's really what you want. Um, but I had already framed this. This was kind of planned ahead. So I already have my two by sixes that I have for these walls in the location. So all I'm gonna have to do is cut to those and then, you know, do the waterproofing, obviously. So on the niche, so we want to be cutting into this and, and the main reason that I'm not doing it on the back wall, which I typically do like to do, like right in the center, but this is an exterior wall and you really can't put a recessed niche on an exterior wall or you won't have any insulation behind the actual niche. And the problem with that is the expansion contraction will end up cracking the grout joints. Plus it'll feel really cold in the winter, really warm in the summer. So this was not an option, but I can put them in the coves because we basically framed walls on either side of the tub to enclose it so we can go ahead and put some niches in this way so what i'm going to be using is this uh what did they call this radius a radius bull nose so this will go into the niche slightly and this will wrap into the niche but i wanted to make sure that it goes in line with these jet grout joints so it looks like it was meant to be and the best way to make it be is to be able to cut in the niche after you get your tile set. It's always cumbersome to try to evaluate where your tile layer is going to be um, and to be perfect. So this is really gonna be the easiest way. So what we wanna do is allow this radius to overcome the corner. So really what this is, is about an inch and a quarter. And honestly, I wouldn't mind giving myself a little bit of extra room. I can always build up thin set underneath the bottom row of tile and the top row of tile. But if you're too high, then you're gonna have problems. So I would, have, I would recommend basically just coming an inch above your tile layer here and then cutting where you need to be. So let's go ahead and put my laser on this mark. And then uh, that's where we're gonna cut into. So let's go ahead and do that. It'll wrap around that corner nicely and basically go into the niche. So I'm gonna use my oscillating tool to do this. Let's go ahead and check what we're gonna be at the top here. So we'll put our leveling clips in here so that we're 100% accurate. Okay, so that's essentially where we're gonna be at the top here. Get our laser up onto that one. Let's drop this an inch. What I have to do is cut this out. Now, granted, this is not a load bearing wall. This was just basically to frame this in. So we won't have any concerns about really structurally. Um, it's just a matter of cutting that out so that we can allow this surface to go all the way into the niche. Okay, so what I had to do here was notch this down a half inch down below this, my finished edge here, because I need to put some backer board on here. So you need to have some kind of drywall or something because we're gonna re-flash this with the membrane. So basically this two by six had to be notched a half inch 
beyond this area. So that's why I had to use the, the oscillating tool for that. So we're gonna mix this down to a wetter ratio because we're gonna be putting the membranes on the back of the niche. So I don't need a whole lot, but I need enough to do those niches. Eight and three eighths wide, 16 tall. 16 actually works out really well. You know, make sure that if you have a, um, you know, a bigger, soap bottle or something you're going to be able to fit in it. So ultimately this is going to be about yeah, eight and three eighths by 16 tall. So really we need to cut this membrane down. Wide enough to go across the whole thing here. Again, ideally, if I would have had a wide enough piece, I could have just wrapped that around and that would have been a nicer way to go. But I only had so much membrane, so we'll just have to fold the corner around it. And you can put in your corners. Okay, then just for the top areas, because I don't think it's really completely necessary to go crazy on the... Okay, so all in all, this is going to give us a nice height here now. So now this mud cap will go over here pretty nicely, right up where we want it. But to be honest, it's definitely kind of, you know, when you're in a toweling mode, it kind of not exactly fun cutting this in and having to get back in the carpentry. It is a lot easier setting these niches um, during the framing stage. Uh, but this is going to get us more accurate. So it is definitely a positive way to go because now you'll have all your joints exactly where you want them. Okay, so next day, we didn't get very far because these niches held us back, but uh, yeah, just take a rubber mallet and just hit these clips with the joints and then you can clean them out. Got a scrubby pad and scrub any of that excess thin set off. And any, any clips that are still stuck in there, you can just cut them below the grout joint, just using the utility knife. Obviously being careful, you don't cut your membrane down below.
right, so here's an issue. I have a little bit of lippage on this back edge here because the membrane is pushing this tile out, kind of humping on a little bit from all the different layers of membrane. I'm just gonna take my grinder and grind down the back of the tile. So now we got now we got this all nice and beveled. Now we can just add some more thin set and put it in place. But this is one of the problems with membranes. Um, anytime you have a membrane and you have overlap, especially around a niche like this, it's going to cause some problems. So that's why you need one of these grinder wheels to be able to do things like this. So whatever it takes to be able to get this in, in line with one another is the way you want to go about it. So as you can see, I grinded this down quite a bit. Let's see if that fits now. Nice and even, so that's good. Take a margin trowel. Feather out the bottom so that you don't get excess thin set with your clips. Use a laser to align things so that everything's in a line and pay attention to that laser all the way through. So at the ceiling, you do want to provide a little bit of a gap because this will, just like the bottom of the tub, it'll make that caulking joint at the ceiling a lot stronger if you have a little gap for the thin or the uh, caulking to grab into. So we're going to be using a siliconized uh, caulking at the ceiling and then painting it the same color as the ceiling, which is just flat white. But if you provide a space, it'll last a lot longer and be able to grab better rather than just smearing it upon the surface in the drywall. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move on with our plumbing wall. Now that we already have our height established, we just have to set our laser. And one thing that we're gonna be doing here is installing this bull nose tile on the outside of the wall. So it'll be just six by six bull nose that will go all the way up. Um, now this is fairly straight for the most part, but the membrane ends up kind of making this an uneven corner. And it's really important to make sure that when you set your tiles here, that we have something to reference to. So I'm just gonna use a piece of trim board here. And I'm gonna screw this into the bottom, into the side here. And this will basically, allow me to butt my towel directly up here and I'll have a nice straight line. Otherwise, I'm trying to figure out where the edge of my corner is and I don't wanna have that kind of issue. I'd rather just have something I can butt this up to and I know exactly where I'm gonna be at. So this is um, an outside corner. I'm not really concerned about the waterproofing. I mean, I did obviously wrap it with the, the waterproofing, but it's not that big of a deal. I'm just gonna screw it right through here and this will be, my establishing my corner. All right, so we got our board here established now. So all we have to do is butt our tile straight up to the straight edge. And then when we put our bull nose tile onto the outside edge, we'll have a nice straight line to come across. So typically what I like to do is just start out with a full tile, half tile pattern from your outside edge, since this is gonna be the part that really matters, and then just scribe cut or cut whatever it takes to get into the corner. So we're gonna go with, um, and what I'm gonna be paying attention to too, is try to offset this so that it looks like the tile is folding in the corner. So the way that this pattern's working out right here is basically it's gonna be a half piece in the corner as well. 
So when we come across here, we'll have a half piece into the corner, which will look like a folded full corner in the corner. So it's just all personal preference on how you want that to look. But in my mind is if the towel folds in the corner, it looks kind of like the pattern continues. So we're gonna start out with a three inch piece here. Uh, we don't have any cutting to do since this is the lower side of the tub. So we're able to just space this up and make this work. So really simple pattern. It's just a matter of getting around all the piping and all of the different aspects on the plumbing wall. We're going to use this diamond bit made by Cleed Tools. So what this is is just a one inch hole saw bit. Plenty of diamonds around that. Okay, so to sharpen that up a little bit, we're going to use this cone too. This is a nice little tool to just get things a little bit wider around something like this. All right, so we're gonna put our radius bull nose here and we're gonna overhang it. So we've got plenty of room underneath it here, but what I'm gonna be concentrating on now is just getting this area framed up with this as I work my way up and then I'll worry about the niche. I might even do the niche tomorrow as far as the tiling in it. Um, Cause you can easily just build up the sides and the bottom to meet this. Uh, but at this point, I just wanna get the rest of the tile up So we'll just let these overhang the, the niche and then we'll fill that in later tomorrow because it'll actually be easier when this is all stable to do that. That'll look pretty slick. I mean, it's not a very big area. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take this board off. Okay, so same thing here. We're gonna put this ledger board up. So let's go ahead and get our laser down. Okay, and then let's just see what we're, we're gonna cut a little bit off of each one of these because of this side of the tub being a little less. Okay, then I don't, for some reason this is, needs to be built in. So I'm gonna put a piece of go board in here, five and a half. I always try to make these niches bigger than too small. Definitely, you can always shrink them down like I'm doing here. But if they're too small, and you're kind of screwed. But I don't know what I, how I mismeasured this one, but it doesn't really matter. 
just going to use some go board, then set that into place. In the old school bathrooms where they had the mud walls, these would come up and crawl over top of the mud bed that was behind it. Yeah, that'll work out just fine. And then what I'll do is I'll build up thin set and make this even with the inside. So I'm not gonna tile the inside until tomorrow after all this sets. And I'll make it a little bit easier and then I can just build up the thin set over top of that go board. Now, I went too high on this too for some reason. So I'm gonna have to build it down once I get up top here. And the reason I went with a niche on these back side walls is because this wall is an exterior wall and you don't wanna be doing putting a, uh, putting this in a exterior wall because you wouldn't have any insulation behind it. So that'll work. Okay, move it off. Like the whole bathroom, the, the tile here is about two grand. It's about a thousand dollars more than I wanted it to be, but you know, it's 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 basically all these. You know, the floor was about ten dollars a square foot. This stuff was about five, and then all the bull nose is kind of where they get you. I mean, it is, it is no doubt a little bit easier in a lot of ways to tile this without those leveling clips. It's just around the plumbing wall. And I was just really sensitive about this wall because that's the money shot. That's the shot when I scroll my camera up, you'd see any type of imperfection. So that's why I thought it was worth doing the leveling system on. I don't know, you, you could do it either way. It's just, these definitely kind of make sure that everything stays in line. I mean, it's definitely is kind of a, an overkill thing to do that, but the plumbing wall had all types of membranes that I was trying to overcome. So it just made it a little bit easier to use that because it just pinched everything tightly to where you needed it. I think I did, I forgot to subtract the inch, but I'm, I'm basically, I need a lot. I need a lot. I'm gonna have to double up a couple, honestly. Holy cow. I'm not sure how I did not get this at the right height, but more go board it is to build this niche in. So like seven and three quarter by five and a half. And by the way, I would use go board all day long versus any of this membrane brain crap. I mean, I, the membranes are great, but uh, I mean, and they do, they serve the purpose, but they're a pain in the ass compared to just using some foam board like this. It's a heck of a lot easier. I really have no idea how I miscut my opening here. But I'd rather be this way than the other way. The other way would be a lot more painful. So we'll go one more board. And I never really liked the niches that are just all the way on the back wall. I mean, it's all personal preference, but I thought these were, this is different. This is something I haven't done before with uh, the niches, having matching ones on either side. All right, so that should buffer me out now, or buffer me down, I should say. Okay, so next day, I really highly recommend that you definitely remove all these clips the next morning. It's definitely going to make it easier because once this thin set completely hardens, 
it gets a lot harder to scrape anything out of the joint. So with leveling clips, with any type of spacer, the punishment is the cleanup. <laughs> so there's no easy way out, even though it's really helping to keep the wall level. It takes a little bit more um, you know, effort to actually clean. So I would recommend a scrubby pad. And again, my favorite non-tile tool is this linoleum knife. So having a nice sharp tip like this allows you to scrape those joints easily. So we'll get started on it. Um, basically, I'm just gonna use a rubber mallet to hit these with the joints and just remove all of these clips. Okay, then any clip that actually kind of stuck in the tile, you just take a utility knife and cut it below the grout joint, as long as like a 16th inch behind it. That's all you really need. So some of these are gonna get stuck in there just because you had thin set around them. So obviously be careful not to cut the membrane behind the tile. Okay, so we're gonna finish off our outside edge, got everything cleaned, ready to move on to um, putting the tiles down the rest of the side of the tub here. So one thing you wanna do right at the corner here is be able to go with the concave of the actual tub. So just giving a little bit of a curve to it. So what I'm gonna do is just to continue with that little curve around the tub is use so as you can see, it's like a cone shape. That'll provide a nice curve on this. Okay, so now that we have this completely recessed down below, we can just fill this to fit our tile to meet up with our edging. So right now, I'm kind of at the max of where my, yeah, I'm about three quarters of an inch. So really you don't want to have your thin set much more than a half inch thick. This is quarter inch tile. So that's about where we're going to be. But you can also put additional tile underneath of here and build it up. Or if you had go board, uh, some kind of foam board, you can continue to build it up that way. Um, but in this instance, I'm just going to be able to use thin set to do that. Make sure that we're pitching this so that water doesn't sit in the back.
So first thing I'm going to do is I have my laser on my uh, edging piece here. So I'm just trying to basically match uh, what's existing that I have on my tub surround. And let's go ahead and get a center point. See that's 19 and 3 eighths? Yeah, 19 and 3 eighths. Let's just see what this gives us. It gives us about an inch. So you have an, one inch, four inches. See what, what we would do if we went this way. So that's like inch and three quarter. That inch and three quarter would look better. You know what? I think I'm just gonna go with my full, full half pattern here in the corner and then I'll have an inch and three quarter and then a four and three quarter piece going on here. So it's gonna feel like you're bringing the tile from outside from the shower and bringing it over and where it ends at the trim is where it ends. Um, really all personal preference point, but I don't want to see an inch on either side. I don't think that's going to, that's going to be too slender in the corners. I prefer having a good, um, almost a two inch piece would be ideal uh, on that. So, all right, so we got to scribe cut all of these bottom tiles because this is a little bit higher than our lowest point. So five and five eighths. Come off of that. So I meant to say, you should dampen down your drywall a little bit before you spread the thin set. That'll kind of keep it from absorbing out. But even on drywall though, I really wouldn't go more than two rows of tile or as far as spreading the thin set because you don't want this stuff to skin over. Otherwise you have to, you know, kind of scrape it off and start over. These are where these horseshoe shims are awesome. Very easy to install, much better than those um, rubber ones you get at the box stores. These little wedges here, these little red ones, these are nice because you can get a little bit more accurate and just kind of pinch them where you need to, or you know, shim them up where you need to. This joint's not exactly 100% even vertically. I'm always paying attention to my vertical joints too. So if I got to shim this up just slightly to make that happen, I'd you know rather do that than having it carried away. So pay, pay attention to the small, minute details. That's really what it takes. This is nice because these tiles are, this, this mosaic is thicker. So you can see how thick that is. That's not usually the case anymore. Most of the time now, these things are half this thick, but this is still thick enough where it's basically just as thick as the tile. So it works out great. If you just have the, the continuous thin set layer there, you should be able to just put that in place. Now, if you don't, I would recommend putting this on a membrane. So if this mosaic was not as thick as the actual tile, then I would go ahead and use something like this, a membrane. This is Schluter Curdy. And you can thin set this onto this like the night before, cut it off, and then you can embed it into um, your system. If, if it was thin and you just needed to do it right now and you don't have time to wait for that, then maybe something like this, the Schluter Ditra, cutting down strips of this, to get behind the tile to bump it out. Um, really it's just whatever it takes to get this even with the outside is what you want because there's nothing worse to me than looking at an indented tile layer uh, for something like this. So trying to keep it even um, is key. So let me grab my grout flute too.
Okay, so we're gonna grout our tubs around and we're gonna use a really user-friendly grout called Prism. This is considered a high-performance grout. It's very similar to Mape FA, uh, Permacolor Select, which would be uh, made by Laticrete, and a slew of different manufacturers that basically kind of make the same kind of grout, which uh, is considered a high-performance grout. And what I mean by that is that it's uh, basically can go down to 16th inch grout joints. It's a very smooth consistency and is stain resistant. So it's definitely a much better grout than your traditionals non-sanded or sanded grouts because it's kind of a mixture of both. Uh, but the big thing is, is that the molecules are so tight that they don't allow stains to come in and it can really last a really long time. So it's something that I highly recommend uh, for showers, tub surrounds, and bathroom floors. So first thing is, is you definitely have to get all of the thin set and anything off of your tile uh, prior to getting started. And you really want it to be dry. You don't want water running out of your joints in any way. Um, this type of grout is very sensitive to water. So if you have water in your joints, it's gonna wash out the joint and it's not gonna uh, basically form a good joint. Uh, I would recommend having some microfiber cloths on hand. This is for the cleanup later on, but it's a good idea to have some kind of dry cloth that you can remove the haze. Uh, using a good grout float really makes a difference. This is made by Trox. Uh, this is a kind of like a your thing grout float. It's very kind of rigid, but also very flexible at the same time. Uh, once you use one of these, you really kind of won't go back. So I use this basically for all of my grouting, whether it's epoxy, uh, sanded, or um, you know, high performance grouts like this or other pre-mixes, it's kind of fits all of those patterns. Uh, so the first thing you wanna do is obviously just mix your grout. Now this is gonna take a little bit of time because you need to mix it for five minutes and, or uh, mix it for a couple minutes and let it sit for five minutes and then remix it to, uh, to get it to the right consistency. But this box actually has two pounds and they each have them in separate bags. So it's kind of nice that you can mix half a bag and know exactly what you're getting rather than trying to evaluate what a half a bag is. Um, really, this is probably gonna definitely do this entire tub surround, just one pound of this. So I'm just gonna mix one. You always wanna measure your water. It's one quart per bag. And uh, that's the other thing I was gonna say, you should have a good sponge. These are probably one of the best sponges out there. I use on, these, on all my projects, the Ardex sponges. Uh, square edges, really tools the joints nice. And, um, you know, yeah, highly recommend a good sponge to be able to get that removing of the grout off of the surface. So let's go ahead and mix this. So I just wanted to make uh, one quick remark here. I did mix this first batch with a drill and I highly recommend, depending on your humidity level and your temperature of your home, that you just hand mix this stuff. Uh, using a drill is gonna speed up the process of it setting up and you'll see that I have some issues uh, when I'm demonstrating this first batch of installing it. So I highly recommend you hand mix it so you get the lo longest length of time out of it. Okay, so let that sit for about five minutes and then we'll mix it up again before we go ahead and apply it. Okay, so after that slacks, just mix it up a little bit before you go and apply it. But uh, what's nice about this is that it'll set up within about 20 minutes and then you can clean things up and move on with your project. But I always recommend doing your floor last at the end of the day so that you can uh, you know, make sure that everything stays nice and sound before you go finishing off the rest of the bathroom. Okay, so first step, just take your damp sponge, just a little bit of water on it, wipe it down. The area that you're gonna start with, this will help glide the grout over the tile. And then just work your way into the joints. This, at this point, this is just a matter of pay attention to filling the joints and not so concerned about the, the grout that's on the actual tile. Like 
Yeah, I can already tell this is grittier than the my pay. Does that make it harder? It does a little bit. You look like you're using more force than usually. Yeah, this is kind of feels more like epoxy with the, the thickness of it. Is that really the purpose or what you're really aiming for here is just making sure that those joints are filled. I'm not overly concerned about the excess because that'll, that'll easily come off. But if you don't fill the joints completely, then you have nothing to really tool. All right, so that's definitely been 20 minutes on the back wall here. So really, the best way to test this is just to touch it, make sure you can mold it. And if you can mold it without pulling a whole bunch off your finger, then you're good to go. And you can just test the spot by doing some circular motions on it. And if you're pulling too much grout out, then you have to wait. But I've been definitely more than 20 minutes there. So you just want to do circular motions, trying to be delicate with the, the joint, have a damp sponge, make sure you wring it out and then just tool the joint with the sponge, paying attention to the joints, making sure they're even with the tile. That's really about all there is to it. Don't worry about any haze. We'll be able to remove that later on here. So pay attention to those joints. And what I like to do is just take a microfiber cloth and just lightly go over this just to wipe off that residue. That'll kind of help keep some of that haze. I'm only doing this very lightly. I don't want to be pulling anything out of the joints. Most of these grouse these days really don't like water. That's one nice thing about regular epoxy though, is that you can have as much water as you want and it's not gonna make a difference. So I am a big fan of epoxy. It's just sometimes it's just not affordable for what you're doing. Uh, mainly because, you know, it's about $120 a pack for it. And, but if you, you know, Epoxy is no doubt the most, the longest lasting grout out there. I highly recommend it for like walk-in showers. For tub surrounds, I mean, this is gonna stay looking great for a really, really long time. But showers with the shower floors and stuff takes a little bit more abuse. Microfiber cloth, a new one. You're gonna need several of these to, cause you don't want it to be wet and you don't wanna be smearing it cause it's not gonna, help out the purpose of this. So if it's dry, then you can at least get some of this off of here so it doesn't haze so much.
And then when, you're, when you spin it with a mixer, I definitely found out it, it, it dries much quicker. So I'm just gonna use a, my uh, grout margin trowel and just basically mix this by hand. It'll take about five minutes to do. Uh, mixing it by hand definitely makes a nicer mixture. It's not as uh, stiff as uh, what the drill did. I think the drill just brings too much air into the mixture. So um, definitely a good idea just to hand mix this stuff. But I want to give you a couple tips on grouting. Uh, it's, you know, this is kind of like the finished end product <laughs> and you can definitely screw up uh, your finished look by grouting. So don't think that your precision and your um, you know really attention to detail is over at this point this is still really important area to make sure that you fill these grout joints nicely so that everything looks good with the tile job i see i hear a lot of contractors or a lot of people they just give it to their uh, laborer to do the grouting and they they can certainly screw it up I'm not saying that laborers can't do this stuff i'm just saying that you you, you have to take as much care with grouting as you do actually setting the tile because it's a really important part of the process and it's really what gives a really nice look as well. And then you just go ahead and fill these joints. So really it's the most important part of this step is not making sure that your tile is clean, but making sure that your joints are filled. It's really tough to go back later on uh, to fill anything that you missed. So I would not be overly concerned if you have a rough tile to not focus so much off on getting the grout off of the joints or off of the tile, but rather making sure that the grout joints are completely filled because this stuff is gonna be really easy to remove. So it's not a really difficult grout to remove, but if you don't have your joints filled, there's really not much you can do, you know, other than try to fill it in while you're doing uh, the cleanup. Now this stuff and most high performance grouts are going to set up in about 20 minutes. So you have about 20 minutes of work time, you know, give or take, depends on your humidity. If you're, if you have a high humidity like we are, which it's always humid here in Pittsburgh, you're going to have a bit more time. But if you're in a dry area, you have sunlight coming into your bathroom, it's not going to take long. So don't, don't take a phone call while you're doing this. You want to make sure that you, uh, you know, get this stuff off after about 20 minutes. And I'll show you what, after we get this all grouted, what it should feel like and what it should look like uh, before you remove it. So just fill all these joints. Be as, you know, as good as you can to remove the excess. It doesn't have to be perfect because like I said, it's going to be able to remove very easily, but you can't, you can't really fill the joints easily later on. Keep your grout uh, free of the corners because that's technically a movement joint and that's where you're gonna be uh, basically caulking that joint. So try to keep, keep it out of the corners. And then when you go move on to the next section, just wipe down your surface. Now, you can see that I have my floor completely covered here. And the main reason I did that was because I wanted to grout everything on the walls first, do the cleanup on the walls, and then do the floor before I leave for the day. Uh, if you put too much water, like when you're wiping this off, most likely you're gonna get slopping on the floor and you don't want to be continuously cleaning up all of that in the floor and then try to do the floor at the same time. If you have any water in your joints, it's going to end up, you know, creating a failure with that grout. So I think it's best to do all the walls first, let it set up, clean everything up and then do the floor. And, and if you have any water in your joints on your floor, you're going to want to make sure it completely dries before you go and um, start grouting it. So, Walls first, floors last. Um, and it really makes sense to do floors last because then, you know, at the end of the day, it has plenty of time to set up and you're not working over top of it and getting anything into those joints. 
But yeah, mixing that by hand, I was definitely struggling on that tub surround the other day. And, uh, you know, sometimes once I, I should have probably just mixed a whole new bucket and started over, but I can be pretty stubborn sometimes and, you know, and I just don't want to waste any material. So I went with it, but it was definitely a workout when it's too stiff and doing that mixing with the drill, I think had a big factor with it. When it's too thick, it can be really painful to fill these all in. And I definitely paid for it the other day. So, you know, and again, I mean, I, you know, most of these other grouts, you're able to mix with the drill and have no problem. And uh, I just, you know, negated that part of this prism process. So this is definitely a lot, lot easier than the mixture I was dealing with the other day. I'm gonna go to 45, try to get most of this off. But again, just paying attention to those joints, making sure that they're completely filled is the main goal of this process. Go ahead and fill them in. A quick grout float really does make a big difference. You know, if you ever got one of those cheap ones from the home stores, they definitely don't have the ability to pack it as well, a little bit more the handle's not usually not comfortable. I mean, this will definitely probably give you carpal tunnel over time. <laughs> okay, just scour over this, make sure that all of those joints are filled. And then we're gonna Test the other side, see where we're at with the time frame here. Okay, so then the top here, you can either caulk it or grout it. I'm actually just gonna grout it. Um, you know, if it's really a, you know, I have a little bit of a gap here just because of the unevenness of my wall here a little bit. So grouting, it's gonna probably be the best bet. If it's really nice and tight to the wall, you know, you can just caulk it with your painter's caulk and that would work well as good too. Now I usually do have the walls painted before I get to this point, but I haven't had the time in this particular project. So we're just going to have to cut it in when we do the wall paint. So just know that, you know, cutting in and painting toward on a grout joint is kind of can be troublesome or a little bit more difficult than because it really, if I had this wall painted, I could have just cleaned the grout off of it and be good to go. Uh, but sometimes the time frame doesn't work out that way. So as far as establishing when to remove this stuff, it should look a little bit dry and you should be able to take a, a finger and mold it without pulling any grout off. So I'm still pulling, I'm still pulling quite a bit of grout off my finger. So I'm gonna wait another five minutes and then test the spot. So you wanna just test the spot, but you wanna be able to mold it with your sponge um, and tool it, I should say, so that you know, you're not pulling any of the grout out of the joints. So you have to wait until you basically can touch it, mold it, and not pull all that grout off of your finger. Um, so we're gonna wait a couple more minutes. So it's been a good 25 minutes, and now it's kinda, the, the, the grout on the actual towels is a little bit crusty, and now I'm not getting anything but a, like a little bit of a powder on my finger. So at that point, we're ready to go. And like I said, I have two buckets of water, because once this gets too clouded with uh, you know, the, the, the grout, it's not gonna clean off very well. So my first step would be just to test an area, make sure that I'm not pulling the grout out of the joints. So just using circular motions is gonna be the best way to tool these joints. And then just make sure that you're not 
taking off any of the grout out of the joints. If you're seeing, seeing your, your grout being pulled out, then you, you're not ready. You gotta wait a couple more minutes, let it set up a little bit more. But this is looking pretty good to me. And so you're just gonna pay, really pay attention to those joints and just kind of ever so lightly toll them with the grout, uh, with the sponge. Now you're gonna want a damp, you know, just a damp sponge. You don't wanna be having water coming off your sponge and running down the wall. It needs to be just kind of damp because the water will definitely run out your joints. Too much water is usually an enemy for most of these grouts uh, because they just basically run out the joint and you don't want, you know, you'd have to fill that back in. And Now you can fill some of this stuff in that you're, if you, if you miss something, you can always take a little bit of the grout and you know, like if you have a pinhole or something like that and just fill that in. And you don't want to, you don't want to go over too much or you're going to end up having that water drip down the surface of the tile which again will run out those joints. So try to go it over just a couple of times, but if you overdo it, then you're gonna end up pulling too much grout out of it. One important thing about the grout is that you really kind of want to have it flush with the tile. You don't want it to be majorly recessed or you'll end up, it'll end up kind of showing up as, as lippage in a way. You kind of end up seeing like the, the recess of that grout joint and it kind of accents that tile, even if it's nice and even with one another, it kind of looks like there's something off and that's because the grout joint is recessed. So you want to really try to keep this flat and that's why I like these sponges. They're really nice. They have the square edges and they're, you know, it's just a quality sponge. That's all I could say. It's like, it really makes a big difference than having any of those cheap, uh, you know, Home Depot sponges. And I, I don't really like the round edges either. I like the square edges because you can just, it makes sure that everything stays flat. But they are like, I don't know, $7 a, a sponge. So they're not cheap, but they, they work really well. So you should be able to be somewhat aggressive with this and not pull that, that grout off. So my next big tip is to use a microfiber cloth uh, after that, to, so just lightly go over it to wipe any of that excess water off. And that will prevent a lot of extra haze, unnecessary haze off of this and make it a little bit easier to clean. So just take it over so lightly. You're not really trying to pull the joint with this. You're just trying to wipe off some of that excess water. But I find this to be really great for all types of premixes in this because that extra water that's kind of dripping off is really going to kind of you know it's not going to be difficult to remove but it's definitely going to um, be easier if you just wipe it down now and have the you know a reduction of haze because this will haze over it's going to kind of turn white but it's you know just another bit of water and uh, a light scrubbing a couple hours later it'd be good to go but the microfiber cloth definitely will keep your work cleaner and uh, a little bit easier to to get ready so all right so that was one bucket of water this is looking pretty milky now at this point so i'm going to switch over to my new bucket this is why it doesn't really matter how much you really have on the tile because you can see how easy that is to wipe off of there so the Removing the grout off of the tile is like kind of secondary to making sure that those joints are filled. There's another pinhole. Sometimes you do get pinholes, so you gotta fill those in because otherwise you're gonna have to mix some more grout the next day and that's not really fun. So this, Stuff is called bright white, and uh, I'm not really sh sure exactly who comes up with that because it's definitely somewhat of an off-white. It's not a white white, 
So if you want really white grout, you're gonna have to get the stuff, it's called Arctic in this brand. Seems like a lot of the bright whites are not exactly bright. They're kind of. All right, so another microfiber cloth. Lightly go over, just wipe off that excess water. Takes care of that. Now, about an hour and a half, two hours later, there'll be probably a white film haze that will come over this. And then you're gonna have to wipe it down again with just some water and a sponge, scrub it, and be able to remove that. that sit for about five minutes and then we'll mix it up again before we go ahead and apply it okay so after that slacks just mix it up a little bit before you go and apply it but uh, what's nice about this is that it'll set up within about 20 minutes and then you can clean things up and move on with your project but I always recommend doing your floor last at the end of the day so that you can uh, you know, make sure that everything stays nice and sound before you go finishing off the rest of the bathroom. Okay, so these mosaics definitely hog up a lot of grout, but you want to just take your damp sponge. You don't want to have too much water on it. That's one thing about floors. If you have any standing water in any of these seams, it's going to ruin the grout, cause pinhole leaks, or not pinhole leaks, but pinhole air bubbles. And you might have to go back later to address things. So. Try to make sure that all your dent set is out of your joints. I thought I had all of it. Okay, and then good grout float makes a world of difference. So you just want to pay attention, make sure you get all these joints filled. I wouldn't be too concerned about the leftover grout on the floor. It's more about making sure that everything's filled. Okay, so we'll put that set up. Probably a good solid 20 minutes before we can remove any of that. Okay, so about 20 minutes later, and eh, really 25 minutes later, you just want to have to see it feel kind of dry and you want to try to eliminate pulling anything off of your finger. So test the joint. You want to be able to mold it, but you don't want to be pulling the grout out of the, out of the joints. Um, I would always just test an area, do kind of some circular motions, see if you can just mold it without getting any of that grout out. So let's take a look here. And you really want to have the least amount of water on your sponge as possible. Water is just going to basically run out the joint. I would take some of the extra that you have left over, have that on hand to fill in some of the pinholes that you might have while you're removing this.
So this mosaic floor turned out really tremendous. If you have a nice flat floor, really makes this easy to install. Um, we obviously went with a white grout, which really gives a nice rich feel to this kind of modern retro bathroom. So hopefully some of the tips on how to install this tile will help you out. Just know this takes a little bit of patience and some time and uh, you'll be able to do this and make a, your bathroom look beautiful as well. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and put our trim on. This is actually a pretty simple process. And I have to say, I really love this little protector thing for my valves. It's definitely nice to have something like that. I don't know why they all don't do that. Definitely, especially when you're thin setting and doing all this stuff, it's nice to protect that. So first thing you wanna do, shut off the water. Not necessarily to the valve, but to, to the actual port. And we're gonna go ahead and take all our ports off. I like to have these all set flush everything out before we put the valve trim on. Okay. There we go. So let's just go ahead and check to see how this is gonna fit. That looks not too bad. So we, I just wanna make sure that we're gonna have enough room here. All right. So this port, same thing. Let's just go test it, see where we're at. So you can see on this, how I have all that tile work kind of a lot pretty exposed around here. So that actually kind of helps this because then this will thread even further into the wall and then that excussion plate is gonna cover it. So it's kind of nice that this has an excussion plate on it that is adjustable. So you could, you know, you almost have a good inch room here that you can go further into the wall. So this is actually a pretty nice um, adapter because a lot of them aren't flexible. Some of them just have, you know, the cover right to the edge and you have to make sure that this is correct. But this is nice. You've got almost a good uh, inch of fudge room here. We're we'll just do the same thing, address it with some Teflon tape clockwise, four to five revolutions, put a pipe sealant on it. I'm gonna hold this excussion plate back and we're gonna put a little bit of silicone behind there. Basically just using the 100% silicone that's for the corners. So we'll just put some in here. You could use clear silicone, just as long as it's silicone. Because a lot of water is gonna hit this part of the Plate and you don't want water getting behind it, even though that we do have some waterproofing behind there as well. Now we're warm. Go ahead and test this. Okay, that's good. Four to five revolutions. Clockwise. Teflon tape. Pipe sealant. So you'll be able to get this hand tighten to about two, well, maybe not, yeah, two o'clock. Oh, this one's one o'clock. So let's go ahead and flush this out. Make sure that rubber gasket's in here. We'll connect it to this. I don't know which way this is gonna go. Okay, shower head, as long as you got that little rubber gasket in there, you shouldn't need any Teflon tape for this. Just thread it on. Got really nice. 
nice pressure. That's really nice pressure. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing for 200 bucks, 250 bucks for this whole setup. I've seen $700 rain shower heads that don't have this kind of flow. So very, very impressive. That is an awesome rain shower head. Okay, so this little plastic sheathing, you can try to use a Tilly knife or you can use an oscillating tool. And I might actually just use the oscillating tool. You just want to cut this back flush with the tile. We'll put a little bit of silicone around the edge of this box too, even though that we're, we're pretty waterproof for sure, but it's not gonna hurt just to put a little bit between these little gaps here, just to ensure. But that's what's really nice about this little box. Everything's waterproof right up to it. So even if water gets behind that excussion plate, it's really not gonna harm anything and it doesn't really matter. So that's really nice. Because I, I always hated seeing people siliconing their escutcheon plates to the actual tile. It usually looks really bad. So this is a nice, you, know, you don't even have to worry about it. So this is all metal too, which is nice. Definitely has a nice feel to it. All right, we're just, basically this just kind of suctions on there. There's really nothing that other than those gaskets on there to hold it on there. So that's what I mean, even if there is a little bit of a movement on there, it's not, it's, you know, it's waterproof behind it. So it's not a big deal. All right, then we just got a simple handle with some set screws. So I have a problem. I had a little bit of a leak on my tub faucet. So if you ever purchased one of these Amazon faucets, they're pretty unforgiving with where the drop ear elbow needs to be. Uh, basically, there isn't really any fudge room on this uh, apparatus for the tub spout. It essentially just has an O-ring on it. So when you pull this out, you can see this just has a little O-ring on it. And so there isn't really any adjustment here. It has to be exactly where it's at. And I was off on what my membrane plus tile was gonna be. So right now I'm about three quarters of an inch sunken into it. And the problem is, is when I go to thread this in, I'm going to get one, two, and then really like two and a half turns and it's not enough to get those threads to uh, seal into my drop ear elbow. So unfortunately, what I'm gonna have to do is cut out some of this tile. So let me just go ahead and mark this because what's nice is that it at least does have an excussion plate that I can slide over top of this. So I have plenty of room to cover that, but I'm gonna have to cut this tile out so that I can get this further back in and get another rotation on my tub spout. So I'm gonna just mark this, and this is, we're just gonna have to cut this tile out. So how I'm gonna do that is using my Cali Dad diamond blade, diamond bit. So that pretty much fits this full area here. So you can see it's inch and three eighths, inch and three eighths. So I'm gonna have to be delicate with this because I do not want to penetrate my waterproofing. I just simply wanna cut the hole. It's like butter.
Almost. If I go a little bit more. That does cut knife pretty nicely, I have to say. I'm gonna get some Teflon tape on here. A little bit of pipe sealant. Yep. Guess I'm gonna have to take this off of here. Okay, now I got it nice and tight. Now I can go ahead. Much better. Now I have it all nice and tight there. That works out well. So not all of them are gonna be able to be as easy as this because some of them don't have excussion plates, but that is a solution. And my, my advice would be try to get that drop of your elbow here a half inch from your finished surface, which is sometimes very difficult to gauge what you need it to be. So for the ceiling joint, I like to use a siliconized acrylic caulking. So this is a quick dry. That's what the QD stands for. And I like using the siliconized so that I can paint it and paint it the same, see it at the same color as the ceiling. So going right around the, the top of the showers, use a siliconized caulking. And basically we're just gonna fill that joint all the way around. Use a little bit of Windex and that will keep it from smearing on the tile. All right, so a couple tips on caulking your tub surround. So number one, I would definitely always recommend using 100% silicone. Any of the acrylic stuff isn't gonna last as long as silicone. So uh, always make sure that all your tile is dry. Any water is gonna make this stuff not adhere very well. So make sure everything is dry. You can even use a little scraper to scrape out any thin set or grout that's in your corners. That's really helpful. One of these linoleum knives are really nice and sharp and can get into those corners. Um, but ideally, it's always nice to have a little bit of a gap in your corner so that the silicone has something to ooze into and have a good grip. So uh, the other thing is, is to just cut your top of your caulking gun. Just start out with about a quarter inch or so. You don't want it to be too, too wide. You just want to be able to fill the joint and not smear too much onto the tile. Uh, a good caulking gun makes a big difference. I know this doesn't look like much, but this is a newborn caulking gun and it's a drip free deal. So as soon as I let go of the handle, it's not gonna drip all over the place. So just try to be continuous with your joints, just filling that entire corner. Okay, and then use a little bit of Windex. I like to use in the clear stuff because I don't like the dye as in the other stuff. And then one of these little caulking tools are kind of nice. It's just kind of like a, a fake finger almost. <laughs> so this guy, you can just really just apply a lot of pressure 
and then remove the excess silicone. Where did I put those? Okay, so make sure you want to fill your tub before you caulk this joint. Main reason is, is because the weight of this water kind of in an acrylic tub will press down a little bit and it'll wear out that joint faster if you don't fill it up. So fill up your tub before you caulk. Make sure that everything's dry. Any, any water sitting around here is going to be a problem. It's, you know, anything that has water on it the silicone doesn't like the bond. So make sure that's all nice and dry. And then we can go ahead and apply our caulking. Okay, spray this down with Windex. Being tool. Okay, for our valves, we're going to use a compression fitting. Um, so these are really simple, just almost as simple as a shark bite. So let's first cut our pipe. And this up. Everything's deep burred. So just make sure that there isn't any burrs on that pipe. Okay, then we'll get our discussion plate on here. Primer fitting. Now 
All right, so that's all nice and flush on there. There's a lot of reasons why I use this toilet, the American Standard um, Cadets. This is, a, this is actually called an edge mirror, but I got this because it's a 12 inch rough end. But these kits come with everything included, except a couple things. And we'll get into one of the things that I usually don't use on this, and I, I just throw it out and, and use a better uh, deal. But I'll get to that in a minute. But basically, it has everything incorporated into this system. And there's a couple really great features that makes this really DIY friendly. So we'll get this taken out, put together, and then we'll set it into place. Okay. So I personally like putting everything together outside of installing the toilet. Um, you know, if it's a little too heavy for you, there's no pr problem. You can just install the base first and then connect your tank. So you just put your little gasket on here, make sure that it fits the shape of your fitting there. And then these already have the bolts in them. So you just place it on top. And you can see inside of here, there's rubber gaskets around those screws already. And while I'm here, I might as well mention one of the real nice things about American Standard toilets is they all use Fluid Master valves. So these are really easy to replace. And you know, it's a reputable company, so they, I've never had an issue with the flow valve. But have, being Fluid Master, being a name brand, uh, gut really makes a big difference. And then what's nice is they give you the tool to actually just crank this on. That's kind of a nice feature. You don't have to have any other tools. It already has the tool to connect it. So the one thing I don't really care for that it comes with are these little wax rings that to come with it. Um, well, this actually isn't a bad one. I've seen actually cheaper versions of this. All, you could, all intents and purposes, you can use this and just be fine. I would recommend though, that you go with a foam gasket. I like these for many different reasons, but one of them is the fact that I can take the toilet out. Uh, you know, if you're in a renovation project, you can keep using, reusing this foam gasket because it's not gonna compress like wax and you won't be able to use it again. The other thing is, is that it's a little bit more user friendly. If I don't place my toilet down accurately, this isn't gonna be affected. Whereas if you put your toilet over a wax wing incorrectly, you're gonna have to get a new wax ring. So I like the foam gaskets. I think they're worth the extra expense. Um, and again, if you're in a renovation project, you can just keep reinstalling the toilet each day. So in case you needed to put that in every day, it's a really great alternative to it. So, but I am going to use the bolts that it comes with because I like the little locking nuts that they have on them. That's a pretty nice feature. Yeah, it keeps your, your, uh, your studs from moving so that they don't flop around when you're trying to put the toilet on. So they just a little locking nut. And as you can see, my toilet flange is sitting on top of the tile. I did that intentionally. Uh, typically, if you have the flange a quarter inch above or flush with the tile, that is usually the best scenario. Um, if you're down below, you can be down about a quarter inch, but I would recommend you being either flush or above to ensure that you have a good seal. Now, if you are down below, you can use an extension ring. These are really easy to use and that can get you even with the tile. A lot of times when you do tile work, you're going around an existing flange and then you just need to bump it up that tile layer. So you can add as many of these as you need. You can do two, three of these if you needed to, to extend that flange up. Just be sure to silicone them into place. Now, if you have your existing uh, toilet flange that's all rotten, that's a whole nother scenario. You would have to basically cut out that old flange and possibly get a push-in type of flange for an easy repair or just completely replace the entire uh, flange elbow.
Okay, so you want to tighten these down. You want to measure to the wall too, kind of keep these straight. So nine inches, nine inches. You have a lead, you have a bit of lead room on that, but it's nice to measure that. And we'll just get our green gasket out here, and then we'll be ready to set this down. Okay, so this is where this is a really another nice feature. They make these little caps or these little tightener caps. And what's nice about this is that you don't have to cut the, the toilet bolts. You just basically hand tighten the, the toilet down into place. So you can see how this makes it a nice height. There really isn't any excess hose. One of the best things about this you don't have to cut those toilet bolts. You can just slide these right over those caps nice and easily, so no additional cutting needed. It says soft close too, which is nice. So pay attention to where this fills to. You kind of want it to be just down below the overflow. And this guy should be in here. Okay, so that's kind of going to uh, keep it from continually dripping. So you want to turn this counterclockwise. Basically, you want to lower the float. Yeah, that's good. That's about a half inch below the top of that overflow. That's good. But if you need to continue to adjust it, keep making it counterclockwise and it'll lower the water in the tank. Okay, so caulking the bottom of your toilet, it's not only gonna really make it secure, but it's gonna keep it sanitary as well. There's nothing worse than having something, water or whatever going underneath the toilet where you can't clean. So I highly advise for sanitary reasons to use silicone. It'll also really help adhere the tub to the toilet. So I would just leave the space out behind the toilet just in case something leaked and you can notice it, but then just caulk the rest all the way around. Okay, then the big tip is to use some Windex. Spray this so that you don't get it smeared on the actual tile surface. I did want to mention about this particular toilet install. Obviously I'm going up against tile and you can see my toilet tank is tight to the wall. So that nine and a quarter inches is about all you're going to get out of a toilet. But if this was drywall, this would not be a great scenario because the tank could sweat and then cause moisture to get into your drywall surface, possibly cause some mold. So you don't, you don't want to have your tank completely tight to the wall like this, but since we're over tile, it's not going to hurt anything and we would be good. But um, yeah, just pay attention to that. Uh, pay attention to those centers of that rough in. Now we were pretty tight all the way around in this scenario. Uh, so hopefully you don't have anything similar to that. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and install our mirror first because I basically wanna make sure that I get my side sconches perfectly with this mirror. I think we're just gonna go directly above that wainscoting. Does that look all right there? So maybe an inch above that wainscoting and we're gonna find the center. So these have these little basically hooks to hang them on. Um, I prefer those. I think those work out great, but that's where a laser really makes really makes it help or easy to install
here's these two. Yeah, I don't really, I don't think I drilled it through that stud over here. Uh, how much I can do about it. Oh, so you didn't push the wire over. It wasn't this far over. Go that far over. Yeah. Okay, so let me get my bigger drill bit. Okay, just got some five minute mud. This will allow me to patch this quickly. clips it's really nice because these are great for these braided lines you don't have to worry about the wire nuts being connected to them you can just slide this right into the Wago clip and you got a good connection just make sure you look back here make sure you could see all those tug on them can't tell you how many wire nuts came loose on braided lines like this. It's usually one of the biggest reasons there's any flickering of lights. Five minute mud, you can just wet sand. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and put our thermostat in now. All right, so we'll do one final test on our wire here. It's supposed to be between 22 and 48. So we've got 35, 33.2. So between 22 and 48, we're good there. So on the back of here, we got line so there's the inner one is where you connect it to your power supply the load is the heated cable line so the inner ones go to my to my power supply
Okay, so since this is a metal box, I'll make sure you get a ground screw in the back of the box. Okay, so show it again. So this ends up getting kind of a tangled mess just because there's such a long line for this. But that's why we got the four by four box in there. So again, your main power supply goes on the two lines on the inside of the thing, on the uh, thermostat, it says line, and then your load are, are your actual cables. So make sure you have good connections, pull on them and tuck it into the box. Vanity installation, usually a really straightforward project to install. And what's really great, it's usually the last thing to be done on your bathroom renovation. But I want to go over some tips that will help you out installing vanities and also some mistakes to avoid. So let's get into it. So the first thing that I really see most people having mistakes with is actually choosing the vanity for their space, making sure that it's not too big for the space. A lot of the things when you're shopping online, end up looking a lot smaller than they are in reality. So one thing you wanna pay attention to is your distances from your other plumbing fixtures. So for instance, a toilet, you wanna to be a minimum from the center of your toilet, 15 inches to the edge of your vanity. So if you're gonna be crowding that, you wanna go with a smaller vanity. Um, and mainly that's primarily for elbow room and using that fixture. So. You wanna be a minimum of 15 inches, anything more than that is just even better. Uh, the second thing that I see with ordering vanities is a lot of them online are all freestanding type of vanities. So you can see how the legs of this kind of curve out and create like a furniture looking type of aspect to this. One big problem with that though, is if you're gonna to try to place this into the corner, it's gonna leave a big gap right against your wall. So some people can deal with that. Others think that that doesn't look right. So pay attention to the type of vanity you're installing. If you're going into the corner of a room, you might want to get a cabinet that has straight legs or something that can go all the way straight to the corner. So when it comes to ordering, a lot of times it's usually more cost effective to get one that already has a top with it. So pay attention to the center holes for your vanity. Most of them that come in a prepackaged deal like this usually are eight inch centers, meaning eight inches from one handle to the other. So you wanna pay attention and make sure you get a faucet that is gonna have an eight inch center spread on it. Now that all depends on the top, top that you actually purchase. Some of them come with just single holes. Some of them are four inch centers. So pay attention to that so that you can order the right materials. All right, so this vanity, again, is really simple because of the opening that it has for my sink, but also there's no backing on it. If you have some backing on the back of your cabinet, I would advise making sure that everything sits level and then marking the back of the cabinet with some paint so that you can establish where your pipes are coming out and cut some nice holes. Now, when you're cutting those holes, you wanna make sure that you're only pilot drilling through the back and then doing the finish cut from the inside of the cabinet so you don't splinter the back panel of your cabinet. All right, so in this particular situation, we have, so our mirror is 24. So we wanna center things with the mirror, centering off of that. Now we're gonna be just drilling right into the tile, a quarter inch bit. So if you didn't have tile like this to just use plug anchors, you can use a stud finder on your drywall and find the studs and actually pre-drill this and install it. So something else that really helps out 
is to install this before we actually adhere our top to the base rather than having to crawl underneath and connect everything it's easier to do it above the faucet that we're installing here is called yusuf it's a pretty nice faucet it has the brushed gold which is very popular these days pop-up drain so pretty simple to install i like the pop-up drains a lot because you don't have the mechanism that you know the trip lever that is always kind of problematic you know, a lot of times you see them leaking and um, this is just a, a single step type of process so it makes it a lot easier got our brushed gold faucet and then most of these are now coming with their own supply lines which is also nice just one less thing that you have to buy and our hand our handles are already attached to our supply lines which is nice and obviously they have cold and hot hot on your left cold on your right before we tighten these all the way. Basically, just wanna make sure that the handles, when they turn off. Okay, so the screw adapters here, these are nice because they really tighten it. You don't have to be relying completely on the, the threading of your nut here. You can just tighten it with the screw. Really secures it a lot better. faucet okay, before we tighten that just make sure that this is where we want it okay. pop-up drain this is nice because it has a little rubber gasket already incorporated on it so you just have to slide it in and connect the drain rubber gasket Beveled edge goes towards the sink. Let's hand tighten this guy. He's just clip right in. So you'll hear a little snap. This connects all of our water supplies. Really? Nothing to it, pretty easy. Now I can just connect this straight to our valve once I get this installed. So let's just dry fit this, make sure this looks right before we put some silicone on the vanity. Oh, it swivels, that's nice. Yeah, I kind of like that. All right, so just to adhere the top, we're just gonna use some clear silicone and that'll adhere well to the bottom of the sink. Connect our supply lines here. I have a feeling I might be a little bit off on where my plumbing has to be. So let's just test this to see if they're just gonna work with our trap. It will work, okay, great. I always had a, a plan B, which was using a 22 and a half degree elbow, just in case I had a feeling I was a little bit off. So I wanted to make sure that I could get it over there. So if you had that problem, you could just angle it over a little bit so that you can connect this. But this is gonna work. It'll line up here without any stress on my piping. That's the biggest thing. You don't wanna be putting a lot of pressure one way or the other. It needs to be centered. So if you need to bring something over to take the stress off of your plumbing, then that's, that'd be the way to do it. with your P-trap. So with this connected, slide this into your adapter, mark this, 
and then it's going to be fine in this adapter, but you really only want to bring this in about two couple inches into your actual fitting because the main reason is you don't want the main back of the drain closing up and causing clogs. So mark it where it goes into your adapter and just cut a couple inches back from there. This is a nice tool for that. This is a rigid cutter, but it's just a tubing cutter. It makes nice, you know, cuts like that. So this wedge is facing down and you're fitting. filling this up and allowing that to fill up and then drain it. Now you got that filled up, drain it, make sure that everything is leak free and we're good to go. What did you do? It's gonna hit that. It's gonna hit that, isn't it? You son of a gun. 21 inches is a better way to go here. It will. Dang it, there's nothing I can do about that. I just made the common mistake. <laughs> now I'm trying to help you avoid. So we gotta cut this out here. I'm gonna try to make this look like it was meant to be. Okay, so I made one of the mistakes that I was hoping for you to avoid, but that's what happens with these cabinet type of drawer based type of vanities. You really have to be particular of where your um, plumbing is. And if you don't have this ordered or spec ahead of time, it's something like that's gonna happen. So what I should have done is made the port or my adapter at 21 inches and I would have cleared that bottom shelf. Okay, so as far as caulking goes, we're gonna use the matching caulking as our tile. So 100% silicone is usually the best way to go. Okay, then a little Windex. And I'll prevent it from smearing on the tile and the vanity. I think it's time. You need a new bathroom. It's gonna transform your life, I tell you. Every day that you go into that bathroom and it's all nice and sparkling new like this, it's just definitely gonna give you a much better attitude in life. So try to tackle your bathroom remodel. I'm here to help. I have a bathroom remodeling course that steps you through the entire process with the plumbing, electrical, drywall, uh, structure, you name it, everything. We basically got this entire bathroom down to the studs and we start from new. So this is gonna really help you out, be able to plan, learn, and build your own custom bathroom. So sign up today.